In 1095, Pope Urban II preached before a great council at Clermont, France. There he presented a call to action to the knights and warriors of the Latin Christian world. Pope Urban called on these men to launch a military campaign in the East to bring aid to the Eastern Christian Empire of Constantinople and to take control of Jerusalem and the Holy Land in Syria, Palestine. Thus began that monumental period of history known as the Crusades, which spanned several centuries and deeply impacted the Mediterranean world. The Crusades were a series of military campaigns sanctioned by the Pope and conducted by knights and rulers from the Latin West with the purpose of retaking or expanding Christian territory, especially in the Holy Land, Spain and Portugal, and later the Baltic. It all began with the First Crusade, which saw a Latin Christian army composed of warriors from France, England, Germany, Italy, and other regions, capturing Jerusalem itself and establishing new Latin Christian kingdoms in the Holy Land and the surrounding territories. But how did the Crusades begin, and why did they begin when they did? Many people are intrigued by the fact that the Crusades began in the late 11th century, some four centuries after the great expansion of the early Islamic caliphates in the mid-7th century. The early Arab conquests were among the most important events of the early Middle Ages. Within a century, the Rashidun and Umayyad caliphates conquered much of the old Roman Empire, including Mesopotamia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, western North Africa, and even Spain. This rapid and spectacular series of conquests transformed the Mediterranean world, greatly reducing the size of the most powerful Christian state at the time, the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantine Empire, as it's sometimes called. Much of the early Christian world had been centered on these eastern regions, which had been the wealthiest and oldest parts of the old Roman Empire. Jerusalem, located in Judea in the Roman province of Palestine, had been an important holy site in the early Christian era, prized as the location of Christ's death and resurrection. Pilgrims had flocked to this region throughout the early Christian centuries. In 638, Jerusalem was taken by the Rashidun Caliphate during the Arab conquest of Syria-Palestine. And yet, it wasn't until 1095, some four centuries later, that a pope called for a crusade to recapture Jerusalem. At the time of the early Arab conquests, the Latin Christian world was poor, fragmented, and still in its formative stages. It's impossible to even conceive of a ruler in the Latin West at that time launching any sort of transcontinental expedition, especially to faraway Jerusalem. The pope was busy just trying to maintain some sort of coherent order in central Italy. During the early Middle Ages, the Mediterranean world was dominated by the sprawling, wealthy Umayyad and Abbasid caliphates, as well as the Byzantine Empire. At this time, the Latin West had scarcely emerged as a significant player. The defining moment came with the rise of Charlemagne, who united much of the old Western Roman Empire into a new Carolingian Empire, a distinctively Frankish entity that would leave its mark on the Latin world. From then on, the Western world would be largely a Frankish world, with markedly Frankish institutions. But still, the Latin West remained far poorer and less powerful than Byzantium or the great Islamic empires. And after the death of Charlemagne, the Carolingian Empire collapsed and fragmented. It was during this period, the 9th and 10th centuries, that Latin Christendom experienced what historian Geoffrey Baraclo called the Crucible of Europe. The old order of Charlemagne's empire broke down, and Europe seemed to experience attacks from all sides. The fierce Norsemen of Scandinavia, the Vikings, ravaged Ireland, England, and France, while the Magyar horsemen invaded from the east and from the south. The Arabs expanded in Spain, captured Sicily, and assailed the Italian coasts. This was a formative period for the Latin West, when a knightly elite capable of providing defense emerged as the rulers of a new feudal Europe. Ultimately, Latin Christendom would repel or even assimilate many of these invading forces. The Vikings converted, some of them becoming the Normans who gave their name to Normandy. 
The Magyars became the Hungarians, and Hungary became the easternmost kingdom of the Latin West. Meanwhile, in Spain, the Christian kings of Asturias began to make small gains at the expense of the powerful Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba. By the early 11th century, Latin Christendom was emerging as more politically organized, more militarily powerful, and increasingly prosperous with a growing population. The Italian coastal powers were launching fleets capable of defeating the Arab naval forces of Sicily and North Africa and securing valuable trade routes. By the late 11th century, the Normans, closely allied to the Pope in Rome, had even conquered Sicily with its wealthy, beautiful capital of Palermo. Many people don't know that Palermo was one of the most important Muslim cities during the early Middle Ages. The capture of Sicily by the Normans represented a major shift in the strategic realities of the Mediterranean world. Another important milestone came when the Christian king of Leon Castile in Spain, Alfonso VI, conquered Toledo in 1085, one of Arab Spain's lavish cultural and military hubs. The famous Muslim chronicler Ibn al-Athir made note of these signs of the emerging power of the Latin Christians, or the Franks as he called them, when he wrote his grand history centuries later. Ibn al-Athir wrote, the power of the Franks and their increased importance were first manifested by their invasion of the lands of Islam and their conquest of part of them in the year 478, that's 1085 through 1086. For that was when they took the city of Toledo and other cities of Spain, as we have already mentioned. Then, in the year 484, that's 1091 through 1092, they attacked and conquered the island of Sicily, as we have also mentioned. They descended on the coasts of Africa and seized some part, which was then taken back from them. Later, they took other parts, as you shall see. This passage in Ibn al-Athir's chronicle comes just before his discussion of the First Crusade, which helps us understand why the Crusades began when they did. By the mid-11th century, Latin Christendom, a region composed of many differing kingdoms and powers, nevertheless shared a common religious allegiance and a common Latin heritage derived from the legacy of the Western Roman Empire, as well, in many circumstances, as a Frankish legacy. The Latin Christian world was increasingly powerful and wealthy, more and more competing on equal terms with the Byzantine East and the various Muslim caliphates and empires. During the 11th century, the Latin Christian Church consolidated its authority across the Western world and, more importantly, consolidated its ideas. The Reformed Popes, such as Leo IX, Alexander II, and Gregory VII, began to articulate a vision of Christian society with the Pope at the head and the knights and the warrior elite acting to defend and expand Christendom's frontiers. The popes condemned the petty wars among nobles in France, urging them to instead join together and travel to places like Spain and Sicily. Pope Alexander II granted a papal banner to Roger of Outville, the Norman prince who succeeded in overturning Arab rule in Sicily. Roger's war, according to the pope, had spiritual merit. Men who joined Roger could gain the church's blessing and spiritual benefits. The popes were also giving their blessing to the Christian kings of Spain as they battled the Umayyads and the Taifa kingdoms of Moorish Spain. Here lay the roots of the ideas of the Crusade, just as Charlemagne's heirs had battled the Vikings and the Magyars. So now, the knights of Latin Christendom were called on by the church to battle Saracens and Moors, both terms used by the Latins for various Muslim kingdoms and powers. In 1071, an event took place which sent shockwaves throughout the Christian world. That year, the Eastern Byzantine Emperor, Romanus IV, lost a critical battle against the Seljuk Turks at Manzikert in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. The Seljuk Turks were also an emerging power during the mid to late 11th century. They'd converted to Sunni Islam and come to dominate much of the Arab East. Swift horse archers, their armies proved devastating to both their Muslim and Eastern Christian opponents. They captured considerable territories from the powerful Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, a prominent Shiite power during this period, including the Syria-Palestine region. 
By their victory at Manzikert, the Seljuk Turks captured almost the whole of Asia Minor, one of the last important territories held by the Byzantine emperors. The power of the Byzantine emperors nearly collapsed. They now relied heavily on Western mercenaries to maintain their shrinking empire. From Constantinople, the Byzantine Emperor Alexius I Comnenus dispatched messengers to the Pope in Rome, hoping to acquire Western military assistance in driving the Seljuk Turks from Asia Minor. These events would lead to that monumental expedition known to history as the First Crusade. In March of 1095, Pope Urban II completed a tour of France and Italy by holding council in Piacenza in Lombardy. Here, ambassadors from the Byzantine Emperor Alexius Comnenus appealed to the Pope for Western military aid. The Seljuk Turks had seized control of most of Anatolia and were on the doorstep of Constantinople. It's hard to discern precisely what Alexius hoped to gain from his appeal to the Pope. Alexius' daughter, Anna Comnena, in her chronicle, The Alexiad, says nothing about her father requesting aid from the West, and instead treats the First Crusade as a spontaneous movement initiated by the Latins. However, Anna wrote in the mid-12th century, and she may have purposely tried to distance her father from Latin policy. It's possible that the delegation at Piacenza was there more on routine as part of the emperor's ongoing efforts to recruit Latin warriors into his service. But it's also possible that Alexius meant to take advantage of Western military resources in a large and serious push against the Seljuks. The Council of Piacenza is often viewed as the moment when Pope Urban decided to launch the First Crusade. However, Jonathan Riley Smith points out that the idea of a military expedition sent to aid Byzantium had likely been developing in the Pope's mind for years. A highly learned, broad-minded individual, Pope Urban recognized the historical ties binding Rome and Constantinople, and throughout his papacy, strove to bring the two closer together. One of his first acts as Pope was to lift the Latin Church's excommunication on Alexius at the Council of Melfi in 1089. He established friendly correspondence with both the Byzantine Emperor and the Patriarch of Constantinople. Relations between the Latin and Greek churches warmed. Piacenza also was not the first time the Byzantine Emperor had appealed to Latin Christendom for martial support. Only a few years earlier, Alexius had asked the Pope to send troops to fight the Pechenegs in the Balkans. As mentioned earlier, Alexius himself was no stranger to working with Latin Christians. In 1086, Alexius had met with Robert I, Count of Flanders, who was coming back from pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Alexius had shown Robert much hospitality, and the two even embarked together on a campaign against the Seljuks. Constantinople had a sizable population of Western Europeans, with the emperor's own bodyguard, the Varangians, made up of elite Scandinavian warriors. Pope Urban II recognized how a serious response to this appeal was the natural next step in the papacy's drive to assert its spiritual authority in the wake of the investiture controversy. Following Pope Gregory VII's expulsion from Rome in 1084 as a result of his conflict with the Holy Roman Emperor, the papacy had been in a weakened state. Now, at Piacenza, Urban vividly exercised papal power, as historian Christopher Tyreman says, sitting in judgment on the state of the church and the morals of the clergy, and debating the sins of emperors and kings, specifically the conduct of Henry IV of Germany and the adultery of Philip I of France. A call to aid the Greeks against the Seljuk Turks would be yet another confident demonstration of papal strength. After the Council of Piacenza in March 1095, Pope Urban II began planning the expedition that would be known to history as the First Crusade. He made an elaborate tour of France, the first pope to do so in half a century, which was to culminate in the Council of Clermont in November, to be attended by 13 archbishops, 82 bishops, and a large number of abbots and other clergymen. 
These church leaders would hail from the Anglo-Norman realms in the north, to northern Austria in the east, to Italy in the south. The Pope's tour covered the bulk of southern, central, western, and southeastern France. Each stop featured mass, assemblies, and preaching, all designed to convey the gravity of the event. Urban avoided areas under the direct control of the King of France, who was to be excommunicated at Clermont for adultery. Everywhere the Pope went, there was great excitement over his presence. There is strong evidence to indicate that prior to the Council of Clermont, the Pope met with Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, one of the wealthiest lords in all of Europe. Raymond had campaigned in the Iberian Peninsula alongside Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile, who had granted Raymond his daughter Elvira in marriage. Deeply pious and experienced in the wars against the Moors in Spain, Raymond was a natural ally to the Pope in his plans for a military campaign against the Seljuks in the east. Raymond himself likely knew the details of Urban's plan before Clermont, and probably also committed to involve himself in the cause during his private talks with the Pope. The Pope also met with an important bishop of Raymond's domains, Adamor of Lepuy, who was designated spiritual head of the crusade. Additionally, the Pope consulted the Bishop of Cahor, the Archbishop of Leon, and the Abbot of Cluny, as well as the Cardinals and Italian clergymen traveling with him, one of whom was Dambert, Archbishop of Pisa, destined to be elected Patriarch of Jerusalem in 1099. Clergymen were asked to encourage the local knights and nobility to travel to Clermont for the council in November. There is even a long-running legend that the first Crusader vows were made in October at a meeting in Burgundy. In examining Pope Urban's planning and travels throughout 1095, leading up to the Council of Clermont, it's clear that the Pope had a meticulous plan in mind that had been in development for much of his papacy. In some ways, the idea was forming long before Urban's election as Pope. The Popes had been concerned about the disintegration of Christendom's eastern frontier for some time. In 1074, news of westward Turkish incursions had caused Pope Gregory VII to propose leading personally an army of some 50,000 Christians to, quote, liberate their brothers in the east. Urban's goal was far more ambitious, to mobilize the resources of Christendom's military class under the command of important rulers like Raymond IV of Toulouse, with the intent of bringing support to the Byzantines and liberating Jerusalem. Even before 1095, many of Europe's major noblemen and clergymen were already aware of the plan. Now, all that was left was to make the major announcement in the fall at Clermont. Pope Urban II's tour of France in 1095 culminated with the Council of Clermont, which began on November 18. Most of the high-ranking attendees were churchmen, abbots, and bishops. The council dealt with an array of ecclesiastical issues, church organization, simony, celibacy, lay investiture, as well as the excommunication of King Philip I of France for refusing to maintain his relationship with his queen and openly keeping a mistress in her place. Finally, it was announced that on Tuesday, November 27, the Pope would address the public to make a great announcement. A crowd gathered in response so large that it could not be hosted within the cathedral. A platform was raised on the field before the city gate. Here, Urban made his speech. Five versions of the Pope's speech survive to this day. While they are not identical, they agree for the most part on the ideas expressed by the Pope. In essence, he called on the Knights of Europe to engage in a war of liberation. Eastern Christians were abused and humiliated by the Seljuk Turks, and it was the Christian duty of their Western brethren to help them, regardless of the costs involved. Constantinople was emphasized as the rallying point for the Western forces, with the idea that the Crusade would join forces with the Emperor Alexius and aid him in repulsing the Turks and winning back his territory. But Alexius was not the only lord Urban encouraged the knights to help. Christ himself was to be given aid by this expedition. The Pope highlighted Jerusalem and the Holy Land as the inheritance of Christ on earth and urged Western Christians to win back territory that lawfully belonged to him. In this way, Urban, born of the knightly class himself, spoke to the European nobility in terms that were deeply meaningful to them. As soldiers of Christ, it was their duty to fight for his lands, just as a vassal must fight to defend the lands of his feudal lord. Jerusalem had long been an object of veneration and pilgrimage for Western Christians. 
In a society that prized relics, the Holy Sepulchre, the site of Christ's death and resurrection, was the ultimate relic. For medieval Latins, contact with the Holy Sepulchre provided a means of powerful connectedness to Christ. The most sacred site on earth, the Pope proclaimed, must not remain in the hands of infidels. It must be procured by Christians so that it could receive due honor. Pope Urban must have been a remarkable speaker. His words moved the masses gathered at Clermont, and soon the air was filled with men shouting, Deus volt, God wills it. Adamar, the bishop of La Puy, came forward and became the first man to receive the cross, that is, take the pledge to go on crusade, and many others followed his example. One of our most important eyewitness accounts of the First Crusade is the Gesta Francorum, written anonymously by a follower of Beaumont of Taranto, possibly a knight. The author of the Gesta was not present at the Council of Clermont, but he opens his chronicle with an account of the Pope's speech, which he must have compiled from the oral accounts of other crusaders who had heard the Pope's words. This version of Urban's speech is quite interesting, because it gives us an idea of how the Pope's call to crusade was perceived by a fairly ordinary participant. The Gesta records the Pope's words as follows. Whoever wishes to save his soul should not hesitate humbly to take up the way of the Lord, and if he lacks sufficient money, divine mercy will give him enough. Brethren, we ought to endure much suffering for the name of Christ, misery, poverty, nakedness, persecution, want, illness, hunger, thirst, and other ills of this kind. Just as the Lord saith to his disciples, Ye must suffer much in my name, and be not ashamed to confess me before the faces of men. Verily, I will give you mouth and wisdom, and finally, great is your reward in heaven. The Gesta version emphasizes the sacrificial aspect of the crusade, the idea that it was a great trial undertaken out of devotion to Christ and a desire to gain heaven. This flies in the face of the incorrect idea held by some that most crusaders were motivated out of material greed and not out of spirituality. In fact, the deep spiritual motivations behind the First Crusade are evident everywhere in the primary sources we possess. If the Gesta was indeed written by an ordinary soldier or knight, it's a fascinating glimpse into the religious convictions of such a person. Another important eyewitness chronicler of the First Crusade was Fulker of Chartres, a priest who served as chaplain to Baldwin of Bologna and lived out his days in the early Crusader kingdom of Jerusalem. Fulcare, who also offers an account of Pope Urban's speech, emphasizes the crusade as an act of love performed by Westerners to aid Eastern Christians suffering under Seljuk rule. For your brethren who live in the East are in urgent need of your help, and you must hasten to give them aid which has often been promised them. For, as most of you have heard, the Turks and Arabs have attacked them and have conquered the territory of Romania, as far west as the shore of the Mediterranean and the Hellespont, which is called the Arm of St. George. They have occupied more and more of the lands of those Christians, and have overcome them in seven battles. They have killed and captured many, and have destroyed the churches, and devastated the empire. If you permit them to continue, the faithful of God will be much more widely attacked by them. On this account, I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's heralds to publish this everywhere and to persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldiers and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians. I say this to those who are present. It is meant also for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. Fulcare's account also includes the plenary indulgence promised by the Pope to crusaders. All who die by the way, whether by land or by sea or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. Pope Urban II's crusade was carefully organized, and he expected participants to adhere to his instructions. Potential crusaders were to get approval from their local clergy, and they were to join one of the armies led by a great lord, such as Raymond IV of Toulouse or Godfrey of Bouillon, who had received the cross from Urban's preachers. But not everyone obeyed the Pope's commands. Some bands of renegade crusaders, mostly made up of the desperately poor, struck out on their own wild, lawless excursions. In the spring and summer of 1096, armies from northern France 
southern France, Italy, and the Holy Roman Empire were busy preparing to depart for the East in response to Pope Urban's appeal. But some of Europe's poor rejected the idea of following a great lord or submitting to the Pope's terms and schedule. Thomas Madden summarizes it well. To many, the extensive preparations of the church and the nobility for the crusade seem not only superfluous, but also faithless. If Christ's soldiers marched to the Holy Land, would he not scatter the infidel Turks as he had the Philistines long ago? One man in particular advocated this view, Peter the Hermit, a ragged holy man who rode from town to town on a donkey, mesmerizing crowds with his fiery preaching. Contrary to popular belief, Peter the Hermit was most likely not asked to preach the crusade by Pope Urban. Thomas Asbridge states that Peter was, quote, most likely not endorsed by the papacy. Peter's preaching seemed to have something divine about it, though Gibert of Nogent, a chronicler of the First Crusade, would, quote, not report this as true, and attributed this reputation to, quote, the common people who love novelties. Although Peter attracted large throngs of peasants into his company, Jonathan Riley Smith points out that we should not believe that these forces consisted only of peasants. There were some knights among them, some of whom ended up eventually joining the military elite of the Crusader states. But nevertheless, Thomas Asbridge says that the People's Crusade was a, quote, largely uncontrollable ramshackle horde. By the time he left France in April, 1096, and headed to Cologne, a considerable train of disciples trailed Peter, and in Germany as well he attracted even more. While the real crusade still prepared, Peter's horde drifted eastward. Poorly provisioned and short on cash, the crusaders quickly turned hungry. Pillaging was common as they crossed into the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Emperor, Alexius Comnenus, was shocked when he heard reports of this mob descending upon his lands. At once, he arranged for them to be supplied with provisions to put an end to their thieving. When Peter arrived in Constantinople, he met another Westerner who had traveled east with a motley following, Walter Sansavoir, a minor but experienced knight. Like Peter's group, Walter's throngs, which included only eight knights, had plundered on their way, coming to blows with the forces of King Coleman of Hungary. Both were interviewed by Alexius, who was, according to Thomas Madden, impressed by Peter's abilities as an orator. Alexius convinced Peter and Walter that they should await the arrival of the papally sanctioned crusader forces. But the peasant armies were not convinced. Despite the protests of Peter and Walter, the people's army crossed the Bosporus on August 6. Entering Turkish territory, the people's army was without a plan and without means of fighting. Peter returned to Constantinople to try to gain additional aid from Alexius. Meanwhile, in Asia Minor, Kili Arslan, the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, dispatched forces to intercept the peasants' army. Walter himself fell in the slaughter. Back in Constantinople, Peter received word of what had happened and settled in to await the arrival of the true Crusader armies. The People's Crusade is a bizarre and tragic incident. It cannot be considered a part of the First Crusade proper, since it was conducted outside of the papally sanctioned expedition. In his speech at Clermont, Pope Urban had emphasized that the poor and inexperienced should not be participating in his crusade. In essence, the People's Crusade was everything Pope Urban had sought to avoid. Fortunately, his careful planning did ensure that the crusade proper was free of the chaos surrounding the People's Crusade. The main armies of the First Crusade mobilized between December 1095 and August of 1096, adhering to the schedule laid out by Pope Urban II. The Pope's directives called for the Crusaders to make their way toward the Byzantine capital of Constantinople, where they would unite under the leadership of Emperor Alexius Comnenus, who would then guide them in a campaign of reconquest against the Seljuk Turkish rulers of the Levant. First to depart in August was the brother of King Philip I of France, Hugh I, Count of Vermandois, leading a small army provided both by himself and by his brother the king. Sailing from Italy, Hugh's fleet foundered on the Dalmatian coast and the count had to be rescued by Byzantine officials who brought him to Constantinople to meet Emperor Alexius. Toward the end of August departed Godfrey of Bouillon, Duke of Lower Lorraine. 
In later centuries, Godfrey would become the central figure in the mythology of the First Crusade, idealized as the perfect Christian knight. However, prior to taking the cross, he had been at odds with the papacy, a vassal to Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV. He'd even participated in the Siege of Rome, which drove out Pope Gregory VII in 1084. The fact that Godfrey answered the call to the cross demonstrates the power of Pope Urban's message, but also alludes to the complexity of late 11th century politics. Was Godfrey's opposition to the Pope at any time any deeper than loyalty to his own lord? William of Tyre tells us that Godfrey was tall, powerful in build, with a beard and hair of blonde. In a charter struck before his departure, Godfrey's mother said he was, quote, preparing to fight for God in Jerusalem. Godfrey was joined on the crusade by his older brother, Eustace III, Count of Bologna, and their younger brother, Baldwin of Bologna. Dark-haired and taller than his brothers, Baldwin had originally been destined for the church, but his love of the knightly lifestyle prompted him to change careers before ordination. However, he'd received the literary education common to clerics at the time, and all his life had an intellectual bent to his personality. Jonathan Riley Smith says he was an intelligent, calculating, and ruthless man. He was not pleasant, but his strength of personality and quickness of mind were to be of great value to the Crusaders. Without any lands or wealth of his own, Baldwin took service as one of Godfrey's high-ranking knights, but he had his heart set on winning a lordship of his own. With a considerable army of Walloon and Lotharingian knights behind him, Godfrey marched through Germany. His men passed in perfect peace and order through Hungary, where King Kolman was understandably nervous after the antics of the People's Crusade. By December, Godfrey came within sight of Constantinople and laid down camp outside the city near the head of the Golden Horn. Bowman of Taranto was the most experienced military commander of the First Crusade. His martial skills had been honed in the Norman wars against the Byzantines. A hugely tall, powerfully built man, Bowman is described by Anna Comnena as perfectly proportioned, with a hard, savage quality to his whole aspect, and that even his laugh sounded like a threat. In 1097, Bowman was in the process of besieging Amalfi, which had rebelled against his uncle, Count Roger I of Sicily, when he encountered crusaders on their way to the east. Bowman, whose family was closely allied to Pope Urban II, was so impressed by these men that he at once took the cross himself, gathering around him a small but powerful force of Norman warriors, and set out for Constantinople. Meanwhile, Godfrey of Bouillon was camped outside of the Byzantine capital with his men. Although Pope Urban had insisted that the Crusaders would find in Emperor Alexius a trustworthy ally eager to join them in the fight against the Turks, Godfrey knew that Hugh of Vermandois was being held a virtual prisoner inside of Constantinople and was hesitant to put himself in the Emperor's power by entering the royal palace. But Alexius refused to allow Godfrey to cross the Bosporus until he'd come before him to swear loyalty. There were a few tense moments, but Alexius finally agreed to provide hostages to the Crusaders while Godfrey entered the palace. Godfrey's chronicler, Albert of Aachen, says that Alexius declared Godfrey, quote, an adopted son. Godfrey swore loyalty to the emperor, and the emperor promised to provide aid to the Crusaders. By January 20 of 1097, Godfrey's army crossed the Bosporus. Bowman showed up at Constantinople in April. Anna Kamnina tells us that Alexius was deeply anxious about Bowman's presence, since in the past the Italian Normans had invaded Byzantine lands. But Bowman, conducting himself with perfect courtly decorum, presented himself as utterly loyal to Alexius, gladly swearing fealty to him, an oath which Alexius did not believe the Norman intended to keep. The emperor was convinced that Bowman meant to use the Crusades as some kind of opportunity to conquer Byzantine lands. About the same time that Bowman appeared at Constantinople, Robert II, Count of Flanders, a man of considerable military prowess and piety, arrived with his army. A charter of Count Robert states that he was, quote, going to Jerusalem on the authority of the Apostolic See to liberate the Church of God, which had been trampled underfoot by savage peoples for a long time. His Flemish warriors would prove to be a valuable asset in the course of the Crusade. Next to arrive in Constantinople was Raymond IV, Count of Toulouse, with his large, splendidly equipped southern French army, as well as the papal legate, Bishop Adamer of Lepuy. Raymond met with Alexius in April. According to Anna Comnena, the emperor had a deep affection for Raymond and was impressed by the count's superior intellect, his untarnished reputation, the purity of his life. 
Anna says that Alexius and Raymond engaged in long discussion with one another, and that the emperor, quote, unreservedly opened the doors of his soul to the count. Already enormously wealthy, Thomas Madden says that Raymond had decided to finish his life in the service of God. Having personally discussed the crusade with Pope Urban, Raymond was keen to see Alexius commit himself as fully to the cause as the Western princes. Raymond's chronicler and chaplain says that when Alexius asked Raymond to take an oath of loyalty to him, Raymond responded that he would gladly do so if Alexius would also take the cross and lead his army to the liberation of the Holy Land. Alexius insisted that he wanted very much to do so, but that he could not leave Constantinople at this time. Pope Urban's entire project had been predicated on the idea that Eastern and Western Christianity would be gloriously united in brotherly bonds against the Saracens. Anna Kamnena says her father would have loved to join in the war against the Turks, but that he feared the Latins would betray him. To compensate, Alexius promised to supply the Crusaders with provisions, troops, and guides. Raymond, unwilling to bend on this issue, would not swear an oath of loyalty to Alexius, but instead took an oath simply to respect Alexius's territories. The emperor was satisfied with this and permitted Raymond to cross the Bosporus and join Godfrey and Bowman for the advance on Nicaea. The final Latin army to arrive in Constantinople was that of the Northern French, led by William the Conqueror's eldest son, Robert Curthose, Duke of Normandy, and his brother-in-law, Stephen II, Count of Blois. Curthose and Stephen were warmly received by Alexius and were much impressed by his wealth and generosity. They eagerly swore loyalty to him, then continued on their way to complete the Crusader army besieging Nicaea. On May 6, 1097, the armies of the First Crusade reached Nicaea, an ancient city on the northwestern edge of Asia Minor, situated on the eastern shore of the Ashkanian Lake. It's only a short journey from Constantinople, opposite the Bosporus, and is the gateway to Anatolia from the west. Currently, Nicaea was in the hands of the Seljuk Turks, acting as the capital of the Sultanate of Rum. The reduction of Nicaea would open the way for the Crusaders' long journey to the Holy Sepulchre and allow the Byzantines to establish a base in Asia Minor from which further reconquests could be made in the region. The Gesta Francorum, written by one of Bowman's men, says that on the day of the ascension of the Lord, we began to attack the city on all sides and to construct machines of wood and wooden towers with which we might be able to destroy towers on the walls. Kili Arslan, the Sultan of Rum, was campaigning on his eastern frontier when he heard reports of the Crusader army besieging his capital. Assembling his forces, he marched on Nicaea. On May 21, Arslan moved up from the south and immediately launched an attack meant to break the siege. The army of Raymond of Toulouse bore the brunt of the assault, but the Crusaders handled the situation well, maintaining their blockade of the city while also dispatching troops to engage the Turks. A decisive cavalry charge led by Godfrey and Bowman smashed the Turkish forces, sending Kili Arslan into full retreat. So the Celts won a glorious victory, wrote Emperor Alexius' daughter, Princess Anna, using her favorite term for Westerners, Celts. The Gesta says, Our men hurled the heads of the killed far into the city, that the Turks might be more terrified thereat. Abandoned by Kili Arslan, the Turks of Nicaea sent messengers to Alexius, offering to surrender. The emperor sent his agents into Nicaea to negotiate the transfer of the city to Byzantine power on June 18. Alexius excluded the crusaders from this process, but afterwards, according to Fulker of Chartres, the emperor, quote, ordered gifts to be presented to our leaders, gifts of gold and silver and raiment, and to the foot soldiers he distributed copper coins. Historian Thomas Asbridge says that the Siege of Nicaea was a largely collaborative venture in which Latins and Greeks cooperated effectively and the Crusaders willingly fought for the Byzantine Empire. Nicaea restored to Christian rule, the way was open for the Crusaders to make the long march east across Asia Minor. To act as advisors to the Franks, Alexius assigned a small Byzantine contingent led by Titikios, an experienced half-Arab, half-Greek general who had lost his nose in an earlier battle and wore a gold prosthetic in its place. Although this was not the large-scale support the Franks had wanted from Alexius, they were undeterred and by June 29 were on the move. Having captured Nicaea, the Crusaders began a long march eastward across the vast sun-scorched territory of Anatolia. 
It was summer in Asia Minor, and the heat was brutal and unrelenting. Worse still, the Sultan Kili Arslan had ravaged the territory, burning crops and despoiling water sources in hopes of halting the Crusaders' advance. To reduce supply problems, the Latin princes divided their armies, with the first body led by the Normans Bohemond and Robert Curthos, and the second marching a day behind under Raymond of Toulouse and Godfrey of Bouillon. During the march, Bohemond's spies informed him that Kiliar Slan lay ahead with his army, preparing an ambush. On the evening of June 30, as his forces approached the ruined Byzantine town of Dorylaeum, Bowman ordered the infantry to pitch a defensive camp at a stream and organized his cavalry for battle. On the morning of July 1st, Kili Arslan struck, but Bowman was ready. Swarms of Turkish horsemen descended upon the Christian camp. Bowman and Robert Curthos made several charges, but the light, swift Turkish cavalry eluded them, wheeling away when attacked, then sweeping back in to harass the crusaders with arrows. Things quickly went bad for the Christians. They were losing men and horses, and even the unarmed pilgrims hunkered down in the camp were being killed. A lesser commander might have panicked, but Bowman reacted instantly and effectively. He immediately changed tactics, ordering his knights to dismount and stand with the infantry in a tight shield wall encircling the camp, allowing them to protect the horses, supplies, and pilgrims inside. This worked. Suddenly, the Turks had to move in nearer to harass the Crusaders, who held their ground and began to kill Turks venturing too close. For several hours, the Crusader knights and foot soldiers stood side by side in this cramped formation, unbreakable before the increasingly desperate Turkish assaults. The heat was intense, the air choked with dust. Women in the camp trudged back and forth from the stream, carrying buckets of water to the men on the lines. This deadlock was broken with the arrival of the second Crusader army. Caught unawares, Kili Arslan had no time to react. Godfrey and Raymond led their cavalries in a charge that scattered the Turks. Kili Arslan's army retreated. The Crusaders had won a great victory, though narrowly. The Battle of Dorylaeum demonstrated Bowman's top-notch capabilities as a general. For one, he'd known that the enemy attack was coming and chose a well-watered site for camp. Finally, at a desperate moment, he had organized his troops in such a way that allowed them to hold until reinforcements arrived. The victory also demonstrated the effectiveness of the Frankish cavalry charge, well executed by Raymond and Godfrey. But the Seljuk Turks had also performed quite well, and their swift harassing tactics had proven very effective, despite the ultimate results of the battle. The Turks left behind the whole of their camp, filled with gold and silks, horses and weapons, which the Crusaders immediately seized. Kili Arslan abandoned his city of Iconium and retreated deep into the interior of Anatolia, hoping now to avoid the Christians as they moved across Asia Minor. After they subdued the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, the armies of the First Crusade spent four months journeying across the rest of Anatolia. They dispatched two small reconnaissance forces ahead of them one under Godfrey of Bouillon's younger brother, Baldwin of Bologna, and another under Bohemond's nephew, Tancred. Baldwin and Tancred established contacts in Cilicia with the local Armenians. This helped to secure a safe route through the mountainous territory on the northern approach to Syria. Baldwin of Bologna rejoined the main army in Marash in October 1097. He found his wife, Godvra, seriously ill. She died before the month's end. Whether or not Baldwin grieved, he was composed enough to approach his brother, Godfrey, about a new project. Baldwin had learned from his Armenian contacts that there were Christian cities in Mesopotamia eager for a strong lord to protect them from the Turks. Godfrey agreed with his brother's plan to establish a Frankish state in Mesopotamia, which would provide a reliable source of supplies for the Crusaders during their coming campaign in Syria. With Godfrey's blessing, Baldwin departed the main army with a small battalion of knights. Since he had given up his studies for the priesthood, Baldwin had served as his brother's knight, but he had larger ambitions and now seemed poised to achieve them. On entering Mesopotamia, he quickly captured the Turkish-held towns of Ravendel and Turbasil. Baldwin's success attracted the notice of Thoros, Armenian lord of Edessa, who feared a coup from his subjects, since he could not protect the city from raids by his Turkish neighbor, Baldric of Samosata. 
Thoros offered Baldwin an alliance, and Baldwin gladly accepted. In February 1098, Baldwin crossed the Euphrates and entered Edessa to cheering crowds of Armenians. By now, Baldwin was reputed as a victorious leader, and the locals were eager for a champion. So enthusiastically was Baldwin welcomed that Thoros decided to make him his adopted son. In a strange ritual, Baldwin and Thoros stripped to the waist and embraced one another publicly, while a long shirt was placed over them both to seal their new status as father and son. Baldwin next set out with his men to neutralize the threat of Baldric of Samosata. He established a castle near to Samosata, which could check any Turkish raids. On his return to Edessa, Baldwin discovered that a group of Armenian noblemen were plotting to kill Thoros and elevate Baldwin as sole ruler. Baldwin appears to have been unwilling to prevent this plot from going through, and was very likely at least passively complicit in it. Thoros was seized by a mob of Edessans who stabbed him to death in the streets. Baldwin of Bologna now ruled a powerful state centered around Edessa. He had risen to power through martial prowess and ruthless political intrigue, but he would prove to be the strong leader the Edessans desired, making their city powerful again and neutralizing the threat of neighboring Turks. Soon he captured Samosata, and his new state, the county of Edessa, would straddle the Euphrates for half a century. Baldwin established close bonds with the Armenians, marrying an Armenian woman, and employing Armenians as knights, governors, and advisors. In the late summer of 1097, the Crusaders entered northern Syria, making their way toward the ancient city of Antioch. Secured by massive curtain walls set with 400 towers, Antioch was considered impregnable. Overwhelmingly, Antioch was populated by Christians, Armenians, Greeks, and Syrians. The Arab chronicler Ibn al-Athir says that Yagi Siyan, the city's Turkish governor, worried when he heard of the approaching Frankish army that Antioch's Christians would side with their co-religionists. So he sent the Christian men outside of the city wall to dig a moat. They labored on until the evening, but when they wished to enter the city, Yagi Siyan prevented them and said, You can leave me Antioch until I see how things will be with us and the Franks. It was October 1097 when the vanguard of the Crusader army arrived before Antioch. The anonymous author of the Gesta Francorum, who was a follower of Bohemond, writes that we established a strict blockade on three gates of the city, for we could not besiege it from the other side because a mountain, high and very steep, stood in our way. Indeed, the Crusaders concentrated their efforts on the northwestern quarter of the city, which gave them access to the Iron Bridge and the river. Bohemond placed his army before the St. Paul Gate. The northern French, under Robert Curthose, Robert of Flanders, Hugh of Vermandois, and Stephen of Blois, cover the section of wall just anti-clockwise of Bowman's. Raymond of Toulouse and the southern French blockaded the Dog Gate, while Godfrey of Bouillon's Lotharingians and Germans covered the Gate of the Duke. Tatikios and the Byzantines camped some distance away from the walls, presumably to act in support of the Franks. You can see from this diagram how much of Antioch could not be blockaded, including the wall running up into the forested Mount Silpius to the east, and the portion of the wall that hugged the river on the southern end. In the opening months of the siege, the Crusaders sparred with the Turks on the walls. Fulcare of Chartres says that the Crusaders found a number of boats in the aforesaid river. These they took and fashioned into a pontoon bridge over which they crossed to carry out their plans. This bridge of boats was strategically crucial since it allowed the Crusaders to quickly access the plain southwest of Antioch, which the Turks initially used as a staging ground for armed sorties from the city. The Frankish leaders also dispatched squadrons into the surrounding countryside to take control of the nearby castles, such as Harim, for the purpose of denying Yagisian control of Antioch's territory. By mid-November, Winter cold was setting in, and the Crusaders had to send foraging expeditions farther and farther from the city in search of food. Now grain and all food began to be excessively dear before the birthday of the Lord, says the guest of Francorum. Cold and hungry, the Crusaders celebrated Christmas in their damp, ramshackle camp, seeking sustenance in their faith and in the thought that beyond Antioch lay the object of their longing, the holy city of Jerusalem. 
Three days after Christmas, Bowman himself, along with Count Robert of Flanders, led a small force of knights into Antioch's hinterland in search of provisions. During their journey, the foragers were surprised by a Turkish army sent from Damascus to relieve Antioch. The Turks instantly fell upon the Crusaders, but Bowman and the Count of Flanders quickly organized their men into a solid defensive formation. While the Count of Flanders led a direct attack on the Turkish cavalry, Bowman moved his Normans into a flanking position that prevented the Turks from surrounding Count Robert's knights. In the confusion of the battle, the Turks retreated. Although Bowman lost a sizable amount of men, he did manage to prevent the Turkish force from bringing aid to Antioch. Unfortunately for the Crusaders, Bowman and his foragers managed to secure only modest provisions. As the year came to a close, the Crusaders had made little progress in the Siege of Antioch and remained huddled outside the massive city walls, with little hope of ever breaking through them. The first months of 1098 were cold and miserable in the Crusader camp before the walls of Antioch. Food was scarce, illness common, and little progress had been made in reducing the enormous ancient city on the Arantas. Desertions from the army's rank and file became a problem. Even Peter the Hermit and William the Carpenter, the former leaders of the People's Crusade, snuck away and tried to flee in the night, but they were caught by Bohemond's nephew, Tancred, who dragged them back to his uncle's tent to face the wrath of the giant Norman. O most evil of all whom the earth endures, why did you so vilely flee? Was it perchance for the reason that you wished to betray these knights and the host of Christ? Peter and William begged Bohemond to be merciful, and ultimately he did pardon them. But a far more serious desertion occurred by the end of January, when the Byzantine general Tatikios departed with the Greek contingent. Tatikios insisted that he only meant to retrieve supplies, after which he would return to Antioch. Few crusaders believed him. In February, a Turkish army, led by Ridwan of Aleppo, moved toward Antioch via the Iron Bridge. Bowman led a contingent against them, and through a brilliantly timed cavalry charge, defeated them. The victory boosted Crusader morale, and with the arrival of spring warmth, an English fleet appeared off the coast of St. Simeon, carrying much-needed provisions and supplies. Also, lavish gifts of horses and weapons arrived from Edessa, now a Latin state under Godfrey's brother, Baldwin. Throughout the siege, Bowman, who spoke fluent Greek, had made it a point to personally patrol the walls of Antioch. He often conversed with guards on the towers, and by April, he had established contact with one Feruz, an Armenian convert to Islam. According to the Muslim chronicler Ibn al-Kalanisi, Feruz nurtured a grudge against Yagi Sihin, the Turkish governor of Antioch, because of some ill usage and confiscations which he had suffered at his hands. Bohemond cultivated his relationship with Feruz, exploiting the Armenian's anger toward Yagi Sihin, promising him rich rewards. Eventually, Firuz agreed to betray his tower to the Crusaders, and he and Bowman began to secretly arrange a plan. Meanwhile, reports began to reach the Christian camp of an enormous Turkish army led by one Kerbuka, the Atabeg of Mosul, advancing now to relieve Antioch. News of Kerbuka's approach spread dread among the Crusader forces. Finally, after languishing all winter outside Antioch, were they to be smashed against the walls by Kerbuka's army? Full care of Chartres recounts how one of the Christian army's primary Latin leaders was so disturbed that he withdrew from the siege. Then Stephen, Count of Blois, left the siege and went home to France by sea. We all grieved on his account because he was a very noble man. Although Stephen was among the wealthiest of the crusade's leaders, he had little talent for military matters. His flight from Antioch would in time prove to be an unbearable disgrace on his name. As pressure mounted in the Latin camp, Bowman prepared to set his trap. Ever driven by personal ambition, he kept his alliance with Farouz secret and sought to arrange things so that Antioch would be his and his alone. Bowman came to all the leaders, bearing joyful words to them in this wise, Men, most illustrious knights, see how all of us, whether of greater or lesser degree, are in exceeding poverty and misery, and how utterly ignorant we are, from what side we will fare better. Therefore, if it seems good and honorable to you, let one of us put himself ahead of the rest, and if he can acquire or contrive the capture of the city by any plan or scheme, by himself or through the help of others, let us with one voice grant him the city as a gift. 
The grim old Count Raymond of Toulouse immediately objected to this, insisting that Antioch belonged to Alexius Comnenus and no other. Bowman, in his characteristic loud bravado, reminded the council that Alexius' troops had abandoned them, and there was no sign that the emperor intended to help them further in any way. By now, the other leaders had come to trust Bowman, and with good reason. Although the least wealthy of the princes, the Norman's talents had carried the day when all had seemed lost, and thus he had essentially become the leading figure in the Council of Lords. And by now everyone understood that Bowman's personal ambition could always be trusted. Raymond, despite being the richest of the leaders, was outvoted. The other lords agreed to Bowman's plan. Bowman dramatically announced that very shortly Antioch would be Christian again, and with that departed the council. It's safe to assume that probably all the lords, even Raymond, believed him. Having secured the loyalty of the Armenian guard Firuz on one of Antioch's towers, Bowman organized the whole of the Christian army in a ruse to fool the Turkish garrison and gain control of the city. On the afternoon of June 2nd, a large detachment of Crusader infantry and cavalry marched away from Antioch in plain view of the garrison. The Muslim troops on the walls were meant to believe that the Crusaders were sending off a substantial foraging expedition, and thus they should not expect any major offensives anytime soon. However, under cover of darkness, on the night of June 3rd, the Crusaders snuck back toward the city and took up positions in hiding just beyond the walls, awaiting Bowman's signal. Byzantine Princess Anna Kamnena explains how Bowman, by sneaking up to the wall below Firuza's tower, sprung his trap. Bowman immediately went off to the tower. The Armenian, according to his agreement, opened the gates. Bowman climbed at once with his followers to the top of the tower as fast as he could. Within minutes, Bowman and his troops had complete control of Firuza's tower. This allowed Bowman to dispatch squadrons throughout the city to kill more patrolling guards and open the main city gates. On signal of a trumpet blast from one of Bowman's knights on Firuza's tower, Godfrey of Bouillon and Robert of Flanders rushed into the city with their troops. There followed a brutal sack in which crusaders and native Greek and Armenian Christians spread throughout the city, killing the Seljuks and capturing booty. For the Greeks and Armenians, this was a moment of vengeance, in which they vented years of restrained anger at Antioch's occupiers. Thomas Asbridge explains that, in those crucial first few minutes, the combination of surprise, the confusion of darkness, and fear of the Crusaders' unrestrained brutality paralyzed the defenders. Yagi Sian himself, in a panic, fled the city via the Iron Gate, but was thrown from his horse and left for dead by his companions. There, lying bleeding on the ground, the Turkish emir was discovered by some Armenians. Decapitating the city's fallen governor, the Armenians took the head to Bowman, who promptly rewarded them. Bowman had already raised up his blood-red banner over the city walls, and Raymond of Toulouse occupied the city's lavish Greek palace. By the morning of June 4th, it was over. The Crusaders had control of the city, with each of the major leaders holding various portions of the walls. Only the citadel on the top of the mountain remained in Muslim hands, barricaded by the last survivors of the garrison in a desperate last attempt to escape death. Bowman, however, had taken a position with his troops just outside the citadel and was intent on wresting it from the last Turkish defenders. Thus ended the siege of Antioch after eight grueling months. The Crusaders had captured the most important city in Syria, and they had done it completely without Byzantine help. Indeed, the Byzantines had withdrawn from the siege. Instead, it was Bowman's abilities which had delivered Antioch into Christian hands. Baldwin of Bologna's capture of Edessa proved helpful to the Crusaders in another way as well. On his way to Antioch, the Turkish Atabeg of Mosul, Kerbaka, stopped for three days to besiege Edessa, delaying his progress. When he failed at this task, the Turk continued on, intent on destroying the Crusader army camped outside of Antioch. The Crusaders had already captured Antioch, and by the time Kerbaka's forces began to arrive before Antioch's walls on June 5th, the Crusaders had already firmly established themselves within the city. 
Only the citadel on Mount Silpius remained in Turkish hands, and this Kerboka bolstered with a garrison of his own. The army Kerboka commanded was awesome to behold, so large in fact that it could fully blockade the city. Antioch had just been through a month's long siege, and so food was scarce within her powerful walls. Penned in by Kerboka's troops, the crusaders once again faced the very real prospect of starvation. Meanwhile, far away in Anatolia, another sizable army was on its way to Antioch. This one, Byzantine, and headed by Emperor Alexius Comnenus, who had finally elected to bring aid to his beleaguered Latin allies. However, at Philomelian, the emperor encountered one Stephen, Count of Blois, who had fled Antioch just before its fall. Stephen, eager to justify his premature departure from the fight, assured Alexius that the whole Christian army had already been destroyed, and thus the cause of the crusade completely lost. Alexius was perhaps a little too eager to trust Stephen's word, and quickly elected to abandon his mission. Together, the Byzantine emperor and the Count of Blois picked up and headed back for the safety of Constantinople. Meanwhile, from the walls of Antioch, the Crusaders, under the de facto leadership of Bohemond, were gazing down at the enormous army of Kerboka, enfolding them like the coils of a serpent. It seemed incredible that after their astounding capture of the powerfully fortified city, Christ's warriors should perish all the same within their prize. Naturally, everyone in the army was looking toward Bohemond, the man who time and time again had carried the day for a solution. The Norman giant was weighing his options carefully, and already formulating a plan to defeat the mighty Kerboka. Meanwhile, the desperation of the situation caused many crusaders to pray for a miracle. One southern French priest called Peter Bartholomew approached Count Raymond of Toulouse with tales of a vision from St. Andrew. The saint, Peter insisted, had assured him that buried somewhere beneath Antioch's magnificent cathedral of St. Peter was the lance that had been used at Calvary to pierce the side of Christ. If the crusaders found this relic and carried it into battle against Kerboka, God would grant them victory. Although many were skeptical of Peter's story, others were convinced by it, among them the pious old Count Raymond, who on June 15 began an excavation beneath the altar of St. Peter's Cathedral. Peter himself was among those digging in the dirt. At one point, Peter cried out and scrambled out of the hole, holding an old iron shard and shouting that he'd discovered the precious relic. News of Peter's discovery exploded throughout the city. A few skeptics remained, such as Bishop Adamar of Lapuy, but for the average rank-and-file soldier, this could be nothing but a sign from God. Considering the gravity of the situation, it was exactly what the Crusaders needed. Morale was boosted, and the weary, hungry Christian soldiers were convinced now that they would indeed triumph over Kerboka's hordes. Whatever Peter Bartholomew pulled out of the hole in St. Peter's that day, there can be no doubt of the spiritual impact on the Christian soldiers. It came at the right time as well, for the leaders of the army had decided on a very daring and dangerous strategy, a full-on battle with Kerboka. Kerpoka's troops were numerous and his position strong, but within the Turkish forces there were internal divisions between jealous emirs, says historian Thomas Madden, citing the potential fractiousness of Kerpoka's vast coalition army. Nevertheless, the Turkish Atabeg seemed poised to capture Antioch and destroy the Christian forces inside. By late June, Count Raymond of Toulouse was ill, and thus it fell to Bowman alone to lead the upcoming counterattack against Kerpoka. In choosing to confront Kerboka head-on, the Crusaders faced several enormous challenges. For one, Kerboka's army greatly outnumbered them. Also, the Turks had plenty of horses, while the Crusaders by now had no more than 200 horses of military quality remaining. The majority of their troops would have to fight on foot. But Bowman also understood that the Crusaders who had survived up to this point had been hardened into a battle-tested, efficient fighting force. The trials of war had bound them with the brotherhood of soldiers, who have long fought shoulder to shoulder. Bowman's battle plan was astounding, writes historian Thomas Asbridge, its execution exceptional. Bowman chose the bridge gate for the sailing point, placing the Latins on the western bank of the Orontes, preventing the Turkish troops on the eastern bank from quickly engaging them. First to emerge from the city was a division of archers under Hugh of Vermandois, which hammered the Turks with arrows, driving back the first line of Muslim troops and opening a space for the remainder of the Crusader army to deploy. 
Bowman had divided the remainder of the army into five distinct divisions to provide cohesion in the midst of battle. Once the bridge gate had been cleared, the northern French under Robert of Flanders and Robert of Normandy emerged in column behind Hugh's archers and then maneuvered to his left. Next, Godfrey of Bouillon marched out with his Lotharingians and Germans, followed by Bishop Adamer leading the southern French. Each division fanned out leftwards in a semicircle, with Bowman commanding the largest and final contingent, allowing him to bring aid to any portion of the army that came under heavy attack. Thomas Asbridge calls this disposition of the troops the finest expression of Bowman's military genius. But despite this well-ordered deployment, had Kerpoga reacted differently, the Crusaders might have been crushed as they came out of Antioch. Once he realized that the Crusaders were sallying forth from the bridge gate, Kerboga had two options. Immediately attack with his main force, or wait and meet them in battle on grounds of his own choosing. In that, Kerboga chose the latter, probably because he did not judge the ragged Crusader army to be much of a threat. Had he launched an immediate attack, he could have inflicted heavy losses, but he also would have ended the battle before the Christians were fully deployed. No doubt the bulk of their numbers would have retreated, and many might not have even deployed at all. Instead, Kerboga chose to allow the Franks to bring the whole of their army out of Antioch, thus giving him the opportunity to crush them completely in one grand stroke. This would allow him to avoid a long siege, but this does not mean the Crusaders were able to march unmolested out of Antioch. While Kerbogah's main force held back, the Crusaders, as they struggled to get into position before the bridge gate, were attacked fiercely by the advanced Turkish troops. There was a vicious counterattack from the Turks, who had been guarding the bridge gate, followed almost instantly by an assault from the Turks sweeping down from positions before the gate of St. Paul and the gate of the Duke. Most pressing of all, Turks positioned before the gate of St. George quickly began crossing the river and coming up behind the Crusaders for an attack. The Christians were surrounded. Militarily, this was a near impossible situation to survive. A small infantry-based army, while attempting to deploy out of a narrow gate, was being heavily attacked from all sides by enemy cavalry. At this crucial moment, the Crusaders, by now tested in countless battles against the Turks, rose to the challenge. The knight Reinhard of Toul was dispatched with a contingent of French and Lotharingians, and they met the southeastern attack with such ferocity that the enemy broke in panic. Meanwhile, the main body of the Franks held formation against the onslaught of Turkish arrows, just as they had done at Dorylaeum. Unbroken by the Turkish onslaught, and united as a solid, impenetrable body of infantry, the Crusaders now marched forward, fighting with precision and ferocity. Before this powerful counterattack, the Turkish advance guard utterly broke, turning tail and fleeing. Kerboka, realizing what was going on, began a rushed, panicked advance and ran right into his own retreating troops. This caused more Turkish units to break off in retreat. Meanwhile, the Crusader infantry continued their advance, shattering the Turkish formations with brutal efficiency. It wasn't long before the entire Turkish coalition was in full flight, with Kerbaka himself barely escaping with his life. It was over. A tiny army of weary, hungry Christian soldiers had utterly shattered an enormous, well-equipped Turkish army. Within hours, the Turkish troops inside the citadel surrendered to Bowman, and now the whole of Antioch truly was securely in Christian hands. It was an astounding victory, probably the most important of the First Crusade. Now the way lay open for the march on the ultimate prize, Jerusalem. Following their defeat of Kerboka, the Crusaders controlled a wealthy stretch of territory from Edessa to Antioch and the important port city of St. Simeon. But since the army was, according to Fulcare of Chartres, wearied by many days of arduous labor, the Council of Leaders decided not to march on Jerusalem until November 1st. For the remainder of 1098, the Franks settled into Antioch, consecrating churches and dispatching parties of knights to subdue nearby fortresses. Bowman, who occupied the citadel, essentially acted as Antioch's prince in accordance with the Council's decision during the siege. There had been one stipulation to that agreement, however, that Bowman could only rule Antioch so long as Emperor Alexius did not come to claim her. 
Alexius had failed to bring aid to the Crusaders during their desperate standoff with Kerboga, despite his daughter Anna's claim that the Emperor was much concerned to bring help personally to the Celts. After Bowman's brilliant defeat of the enormous Turkish army, all the army's leaders were quite content for him to have the city. All, that is, except for Count Raymond. Raymond continued to insist that Alexius had not been given sufficient opportunity to claim Antioch. He convinced the council that one final attempt should be made to offer the city to the Byzantines. The army's leaders selected Hugh of Vermandois to lead an embassy to Constantinople to request that the emperor come and claim Antioch. Meanwhile, Bowman would continue to act as Antioch's prince. In August, the army suffered a devastating loss. Bishop Adamer, the spiritual father of the crusade, revered by all, fell ill and died. Ralph of Gaunt, a follower of Tancred's, describes Adamar as a man of great merit and a man worthy of honor in any place. Adamar was so respected by both Bowman and Raymond that he was often the only voice in the army that could mediate between the two. As the months wore on and the leaders began planning the march on Jerusalem, Bowman and Raymond's disagreements continued. There was still no word from Alexius, and Bowman was busily establishing his new state, the Principality of Antioch. It became clear that the Norman prince had no intention of joining in the march on Jerusalem. Raymond insisted that Bowman keep his vow to participate in Jerusalem's capture. Raymond even promised to accept Bowman's rule in Antioch if the Norman would swear to aid in the campaign for Jerusalem. Bowman agreed to this. November 1st came and went, and the army remained stalled in Antioch, with Bowman still unwilling to march on the holy city, regardless of his earlier promise. Raymond, for his part, hesitated to withdraw from Antioch, and thereby guarantee Bowman total control of the city. By now, the common soldiers, eager to fulfill their vows at Jerusalem, were quite impatient with their leader's delays. Everyone understood that Bowman would never move his forces out of Antioch, and so the ordinary soldiers began to press Raymond to lead them to Christ's city. Who else but he could guide them to Jerusalem, they asked. Raymond was an old man. At the time of his departure for the east, he had been one of the wealthiest lords in Europe. Perhaps only piety explains why such a man could forsake all that for the perils of crusade. Now, pressed by the common pilgrims of the Christian army, the aged count at last relented in his long struggle with Bowman. On January 13, 1099, Count Raymond of Toulouse, barefoot, unarmed, and carrying a pilgrim's staff, departed Antioch at the head of the army, adopting the guise of an ordinary pilgrim as a statement about the true purpose of the crusade. Following him was the whole of the Christian host, singing psalms, rejoicing that at last they journeyed to Jerusalem. Only Bowman and the bulk of his Normans remained behind in Antioch, though a small Norman contingent under Bowman's nephew Tancred did accompany Raymond. With Raymond of Toulouse in the lead, the Christian army traveled south through Syria. Along the way, they encountered Saracen fortresses, which sent out tribute payments and provisions in exchange for being left unmolested by the now famous destroyers of Kerboka. Many of these small Muslim statelets were in rebellion against the emir of Damascus and other Turkish princes, and thus were keen to remain neutral. Additionally, Palestine was now in the hands of the Fatimids, a Shiite Egyptian-based empire, so the Seljuks in Damascus had no interest in hindering the Frankish advance. Sworn enemies of the Sunni Seljuk Turks, the Fatimids had kept track of the Crusaders' progress and had even sent embassies to them, offering to collaborate against the Turks, so long as the Franks agreed not to attack Jerusalem. The Fatimids did not yet grasp that the Christian army would settle for nothing less than control of the Holy City. On May 19, 1099, the Crusaders entered Fatimid territory. They marched along the coast, passing the ports of Beirut, Sidon, Tyre, and Acre, all willing to offer supplies in trade for peace. The Crusaders obliged, and by June 3rd, they reached the inland road just north of Jaffa, which led to the Holy City. News arrived that a Fatimid army was now mobilizing in Egypt. The Christians were undeterred. They veered inland, confident that if they maintained faith, God would provide victory. By June 6, the Crusaders reached Bethlehem, an entirely Christian city which welcomed the army as liberators. The following day, the Franks climbed the famous hill of Mount Joy, the point on the road at which Jerusalem becomes visible. 
The Latin sources emphasize the elation of the pilgrims at this first sighting of the holy city. Tancred, riding ahead with a scouting party, was one of the first atop Mount Joy, and Ralph of Gaunt describes his reaction. Getting his first glimpse of Jerusalem from a distance, Tancred greeted her, placed his knees on the ground, his heart on heaven. The chaplain of Raymond of Toulouse describes how the Franks organized the siege. Duke Godfrey and the Count of Flanders and the Duke of Normandy besieged the city from the north side from the Church of St. Stephen, located in the center of the city, southward to the angular tower next to the Tower of David. Count Raymond and his army, however, settled down on the western side and besieged Jerusalem from the camp of the Duke to the foot of Mount Zion. The Crusaders didn't have the numbers for a full encirclement, and the city was strongly fortified amid rocky, harsh terrain. The Fatimid governor, Iftikhar, had expelled all of Jerusalem's Christian inhabitants, since the story of Antioch's betrayal was also well known. Local cisterns had been poisoned or spoiled, and water was scarce. Jerusalem's Christians joined the Crusaders in their camp, confirming the rumors of an Egyptian army on the way to relieve the holy city. Faced with little time, the Franks decided on a bold, all-out assault on the city. On June 13, the Christian troops stormed Jerusalem's walls, but they were quickly beaten back by the Fatimid defenders. Thomas Madden says that the Crusaders lacked sufficient scaling ladders and siege machinery to threaten seriously Jerusalem's towering walls. The city of Jerusalem is located in a mountainous region which is devoid of trees, wrote Fulcair of Chartres meaning the Crusader army had no timber for the building of siege engines. However, shortly after the failure of the first assault on the city, a fleet of Genoese and English ships loaded with building materials arrived at Jaffa, having responded to earlier pleas for aid sent back to the west. Seeing in this God's blessing, the Latins set to constructing catapults, ladders, and towers. It was hard labor in the Palestinian sun, but they worked briskly. For, as the chronicler Ibn al-Khalanisi wrote, news reached them that al-Afdal, the Fatimid vizier, was on his way from Egypt with a mighty army to engage in the jihad against them. By early July, the crusaders had completed their machinery and were ready for a proper assault on the city. But first, the leaders announced that they would invoke God's aid. On July 8, the army, barefoot and bearing relics, processed around the walls of Jerusalem, singing prayers. The Fatimids, watching from Jerusalem's ramparts, shouted jeers at the Christians and defiled crosses and icons taken from the city's churches. The Crusaders finally stopped at the Mount of Olives, the site of Christ's ascension to heaven. Here, they offered final prayers that God would grant them victory. At dawn on July 14, trumpets blasted through the Crusader camp, announcing the commencement of the assault. The Muslims inside the city immediately rushed to the walls for the defense, but as they gazed down over the ramparts, they realized that the Westerners had staged an ingenious ruse. For weeks, Godfrey of Bouillon's contingent had busily built siege equipment before Jerusalem's powerful quadrangular tower. The Saracens had responded by working just as hard to bolster the fortifications of that already strong section. But now, the Fatimids found that overnight, Godfrey's men had dismantled all their machinery, moved it one kilometer to a point just east of St. Stephen's Gate, and reassembled the siege engines there. This was an incredible feat of physical endurance for a single night. The Saracens were stunned and terrified, for the portion of the wall now swarming with Crusader siege equipment was the weakest point in Jerusalem's defenses. Fighting raged all of July 14, with Count Raymond's army managing to bring their siege tower close to the city, although fierce resistance from the Fatimids prevented Raymond's men from actually capturing the wall. However, on the morning of July 15, Godfrey's tower was successfully brought up against the city. Godfrey's knights, Ludolf and Engelbert, were the first to enter Jerusalem, followed quickly by Godfrey and more of his men. It was a crucial moment, with Godfrey fighting alongside his knights in a desperate battle to secure the wall. They captured the gate of the column, which Godfrey ordered opened, allowing the whole of the Crusader army to rush into the city. Fatimid resistance collapsed as the Christians spread throughout Jerusalem. Thomas Madden writes that, By the standards of the time adhered to by both Christians and Muslims, the Crusaders would have been justified in putting the entire population of Jerusalem to the sword. Despite later highly exaggerated reports, however, that is not what happened. It's true that many of the inhabitants, both Muslims and Jews, were killed in the initial fray, yet many were also allowed to purchase their freedom or were simply expelled from the city. 
Tancred and the Normans drove deep into the city's heart, where they plundered the Temple Mount. Iftikhar and the high-ranking Fatimid officers took refuge in the Tower of David, which they surrendered to Count Raymond, who protected their lives and later provided them with safe passage back to Egypt. The Crusaders had done it. Pope Urban's dream had come true. A Latin army had reclaimed Jerusalem for Christendom. The chaplain of Raymond of Toulouse writes, Now that the city was taken, it was well worth all our previous labors and hardships to see the devotion of the pilgrims at the Holy Sepulchre, how they rejoiced and exulted and sang a new song to the Lord. It was the crowning moment for the Crusaders to kneel in prayer before the tomb of Christ. But although they had captured Jerusalem, the Christian host still had to deal with a large Egyptian army on its way to reverse their victory. The Crusaders acted quickly to secure the newly conquered Jerusalem. On July 22, 1099, Godfrey of Bouillon was elected defender of the Holy Sepulchre, ruler of the nascent kingdom of Jerusalem. It is popularly believed that Count Raymond IV of Toulouse was unhappy with Godfrey's election, but historians John and Loretta Hill conclude that Raymond very likely concurred in Godfrey's appointment as defender of Jerusalem. Soon word arrived from Tancred, who was scouting the southern coast, that indeed a Fatimid army at Ashkelon was preparing to march on Jerusalem. Godfrey's response was to rally the Christian forces to the offensive, while the Latin and Greek clergy gathered together in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to pray for victory. Godfrey, along with the forces of Robert of Flanders, marched south, rendezvousing at Ramla with the armies of Raymond of Toulouse and Robert of Normandy, as well as Tancred, who had captured Nablus earlier that month. The newly elected Patriarch Arnulf carried the relic of the true cross at the head of the Christian host. Al-Afdal, the Egyptian vizier, had assembled a massive army made up of troops from all over the Fatimid Caliphate. He camped in the plain of Al-Majdal just outside of Ashkelon with the plan of next marching on Jerusalem to drive out the Franks. He was unaware that the Crusaders were already on the move. Godfrey and Raymond divided their forces into nine divisions, then rapidly advanced on the Fatimid position. On August 12, the Fatimids were caught unaware when the Crusaders attacked. Unlike the Turks, the Fatimids did not employ large numbers of mounted archers, and their lance-wielding Arab and Berber cavalry, which moved closely with their infantry, offered a solid target for the devastating Frankish cavalry charge. Historian R.C. Smale says that the charge alone secured a Latin victory, and the best sources agree that the duration of the battle was brief. Al-Afdal's troops scattered, and, as Fulker of Chartres writes, in the sweeping attack the Saracens perished on all sides. The entire Egyptian camp, filled with horses and provisions, was captured by the Christians. It's commonly believed that in the aftermath of their defeat, the Fatimids at Ashkelon offered to surrender the city to the Crusaders, but a quarrel erupted between Raimon and Godfrey over who would possess it. The Fatimids, hearing of this quarrel, broke off negotiations and Ashkelon was lost to the Crusaders. The source of this tale comes from Ralph of Conn and Albert of Aachen, neither of whom were present at the battle, and both of whom were biased against Count Raimon. Our best Saracen source, Ibn al-Kalanisi, offers a very different account. The Franks besieged Ashkelon until at length the townsmen agreed to pay them 20,000 dinars as protection money, and to deliver this sum to them forthwith. They therefore set about collecting this amount from the inhabitants of the town, but it befell that a quarrel broke out between the Frankish leaders and they retired without having received any of the money. Ibn al-Kalanisi, unimpacted by the various regional loyalties of the Latin chroniclers, is probably our best source for this incident. He says nothing about a specific quarrel between Godfrey and Raimond, just that some sort of disagreement resulted in a failure to collect tribute from Ashkelon, but not a missed opportunity to actually possess the city itself. An offer of total surrender of Ashkelon at this stage seems questionable at best, as the city was well fortified. The disagreement may have been, as John and Loretta Hill point out, that most crusaders considered their vows fulfilled and were not interested in aiding the leaders in a full-on siege of the Egyptian city. The crusader victory at Ashkelon meant that Jerusalem was secure as a Christian possession. With the holy city secured, Godfrey of Bouillon ruled a tiny Latin outpost surrounded by hostile Muslim neighbors. Over the next two decades, the Kingdom of Jerusalem would expand dramatically through relentless conquests of the surrounding territories. For now, Godfrey and only 300 knights committed themselves to the defense of Jerusalem, while the bulk of the army returned home to Europe. 
A similar process began in the north in the newly founded Principality of Antioch and County of Edessa. In December of 1099, the rulers of these two states, Prince Bowman and Count Baldwin, traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate Christmas with Godfrey and to worship at the Holy Sepulchre. Meanwhile, Robert of Flanders, Robert of Normandy, and Raymond IV of Toulouse returned to Constantinople, where Emperor Alexius I Comnenus received them as heroes and hosted lavish feasts in their honor. While the two Roberts returned to Europe, Raymond IV ultimately returned to Outremer to lay the groundwork for the Fourth Crusader state, the County of Tripoli, which would exist between the Principality of Antioch and the Kingdom of Jerusalem. News of Jerusalem's liberation spread across Europe. Throughout the Latin world, people celebrated the restoration of the Holy Sepulchre. Returning crusaders were welcomed as heroes, their stories immortalized in songs. In the coming decades, pilgrims from every corner of Europe would make the long journey to the now Christian-ruled Jerusalem, where they could worship safely at the Holy Sepulchre. The First Crusade's triumph solidified in the minds of Latins this new concept of the Crusade, a war waged with the blessing of the Church. Not for selfish, petty reasons, but in the cause of Christendom, to expand and defend the domain of Christ. For the Christians of the medieval West, only God's blessing explained this victory in the East, and therefore the concept of crusading must be pleasing to Him. For generations to come, many Latins would flock to the crusade in the Holy Land to fight for the Holy Sepulchre. On November 10, 1143, near the city of Acre, in the Crusader Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, King Falk and Queen Melisande were enjoying an afternoon hunt. As the royal party pursued a hare through the scenic countryside, the king held his lance and urged his horse to gallop faster. Suddenly, the king's horse stumbled and Falk was thrown from his steed and struck his head on the ground. The king's companions at once leapt from their horses to attend the injured folk. Queen Melisande, too, rushed to the king's side. As the queen held her husband's bloody body, it was clear to everyone the king was dead. Melisande was inconsolable. Although she and the king had butt heads early in their reign, they'd grown close over the years, and together they'd ruled the Crusader kingdom well for over a decade. Folk had been a wise ruler and a capable military commander. He'd done much to bolster the kingdom's defenses. Many important frontier castles, such as the famous Transjordan Castle of Karak, were constructed during Folk's reign. However, Queen Melisande was a capable ruler, and her eldest son, Baldwin, was a healthy youth of 13 who'd been educated to one day assume the throne. On Christmas Day, 1143, the nobles, knights, and clergy of the Kingdom of Jerusalem gathered in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to witness the crowning of Melisande and her son, Baldwin III. The queen was expected to wisely guide the kingdom until Baldwin III was old enough to rule alone. However, for the kingdom's greatest enemy, the death of Folk was a welcome event. The Atabeg Zengi, ruler of Mosul and Aleppo, had spent the past decade constructing a powerful state. Already he'd captured most of the Turkish-held regions in Syria. So rapidly and efficiently had Zengi expanded that the Emir Unar of Damascus forged an alliance with the Crusaders of Jerusalem to protect his own domains. Now, Zengi felt ready to mount a major offensive against the Crusaders. Zengi's reputation among his fellow Muslims was mixed. Ibn al-Kalanisi, a chronicler from Damascus, understandably held a mostly negative opinion of the great Atabeg. Famously, Ibn al-Kalanisi recorded Zengi's treacherous dealings with the garrison of Baalbek during the Atabeg's long war with Damascus. But when the fortress was in his hands, he violated his pledge and went back on his guarantee of security, owing to a personal grudge and irritation against its defenders, which he nursed in secret. He ordered all to be executed, and none of them escaped, except those whose destiny guarded them. 
The people were horrified at his action and at such an unheard of breach of oath on his part. But for many of the Turkish warrior elite, Zengi offered the best chance of driving the Crusaders from Syria and Palestine. As Zengi's conquests increased, he gained the loyalty of many Turkish emirs and commanders, along with their warriors. Zengi was undeniably the most powerful single opponent yet faced by the Crusaders. Meanwhile, the two northernmost Crusader states, the Principality of Antioch and the County of Edessa, were near to war. Raymond of Poitiers, Prince of Antioch, and Jocelyn II of Edessa had long feuded over territorial disagreements. And now, with no strong king in Jerusalem to impose an accord between them, the two seemed ready to settle their differences on the battlefield. The shrewd Zengi was keenly aware of this, In November 1144, Jocelyn II was in the western part of his county with his best troops. Zengi gathered a large army of Turkomans from the Jazeera between the upper Euphrates and the upper Tigris, a region that the chronicler Ibn al-Athir tells us had often been raided by Crusader forces. The Atabeg launched a surprise attack on the great city of Edessa itself. Edessa was strongly fortified with a large curtain wall and 45 towers, as well as a citadel defended by an internal wall. However, at the time, Edessa's garrison was lacking in troops, and the citizens had no leader around which to rally. The population was made up primarily of Armenian Christians. From Turbacel, Count Jocelyn II received news that his capital was under siege. At once he appealed for aid to his enemy, Raymond of Poitiers, Prince of Antioch. But Raymond refused to help. Meanwhile, in faraway Jerusalem, Queen Melisande organized a relief expedition to Edessa. However, Edessa was short of time. Zengi's catapults hammered at the city, and his miners dug tunnels. At last, a huge section of the wall collapsed, and Zengi's forces stormed into the city. What followed was a brutal sack. Thousands of the city's inhabitants tried to get into the citadel. Many of them trampled to death in the panicked crowd. Ibn al kalanisi says that the Atabeg's forces set to pillaging, slaying, capturing, ravishing, and looting, and their hands were filled with such quantities of money, furnishings, animals, booty, and captives, as rejoiced their spirits and gladdened their hearts. The chronicler Michael the Syrian describes the clergy gathering in the churches, clutching to sacred relics, and saying mass until they were cut down by the invading forces. At last, Zengi ordered an end to the sack. He issued a decree through the city, commanding his men to cease their plundering. All those who had survived the massacre were allowed to return to their homes. Two days later, Zengi promised the defenders of the citadel that their lives would be protected if they surrendered. The defenders agreed. It was December 23, 1144. Edessa, held by the Crusaders since 1098, was once more ruled by a Muslim prince. After the carnage had come to an end, Zengi found an old man who'd been stripped, beaten, and dragged through the streets. As it turned out, this was Basil Bar Surmana, the Jacobite bishop of the city. Zengi had the old man dressed and brought with honor into his tent. There, Zengi gave the Jacobite bishop some authority over the Christian population of the city. Zengi knew to prevent the Franks from retaking Edessa, he needed to win the goodwill of the Greek and Armenian Christians who made up the bulk of the population. Michael the Syrian tells us that after the sack, Zengi's forces protected the Armenians and Greeks of Edessa. However, any Franks found within the city were immediately put to death. 
News of the fall of Edessa soon reached Antioch and Jerusalem. Many blamed Prince Raymond for failing to carry aid to the Edessans. The force sent by Queen Melisande arrived at Antioch, where they joined with Prince Raymond in an expedition against the Turks. But Zengi drove them back in February or March of 1145. There would be no reversing Zengi's conquest of Edessa. The Atabeg quickly mopped up all of the Frankish-held castles on the eastern bank of the Euphrates. In little time, the county of Edessa was cut in half. Zengi's capture of Edessa was of vital strategic importance. Now the Crusader states in northern Syria were far more vulnerable, with Antioch itself more exposed. However, Zengi did not immediately press his advantage against the Crusaders. Instead, he renewed his most cherished project, the conquest of Damascus, besieging the great Syrian city again in 1145. But Zengi's siege failed. With Edessa lost, the Latins of the Crusader states dispatched urgent requests for aid to the Christian kingdoms of the West. News of Edessa's fall shocked the Latin world. Messengers arriving in Germany, France, and other regions reported that Jerusalem itself was in peril. What was needed was another crusade, and immediately. Not since the Crusade of 1101 had a major expedition been launched by the kingdoms of the West. But now, with Edessa fallen, Pope Eugenius III prioritized the calling of a new crusade. On December 1st, 1145. The Pope issued the bull Quantum Predecessoris. The bull recalled the victories of the First Crusade and called on the Knights of Christendom to emulate the deeds of their forefathers, to take the cross and lead a relief expedition for the reconquest of Edessa. The bishops and priests of the church spread the Pope's message across Christendom. The Second Crusade had begun. Pope Eugenius's Bull of Crusade recalled the First Crusade and the establishment of the Christian states in the Levant. It described the fall of Edessa as a threat to the Church of God and all of Christianity. The Pope insisted that the defense of the holy places in the East was the responsibility of Europe's knightly elite. Hailing from the austere order of the Cistercians, Pope Eugenius urged knights to shun finery, fur-lined garments, gilded armor, and hunting dogs and hawks. However, even for Pope Eugenius, political concerns at home slowed the mobilization of the crusade. The Pope wanted the crusade preached in France and Italy, but he was reluctant to see the ruler of Germany, Conrad III, take the cross, for the Pope needed the Germans to support him in his disagreements with the Norman Kingdom of Sicily. Meanwhile, in France, the 25-year-old King Louis VII expressed a desire to join the crusade, though his own nobles advised against it. Even the king's high counselor, Abbot Suger of St. Denis, advised Louis not to get involved in the risky overseas expedition. Jonathan Riley Smith calls Louis VII one of the most attractive of the medieval French monarchs and describes him as tender-hearted and courteous, pious and serious, a loyal son of the church, but not weak. However, his power was geographically limited and dependent both ideologically and politically on the church. Louis is said to have been unconcerned by his poverty in comparison to other kings. He once remarked, Here in France, we have nothing but bread, wine, and joy. Before he committed to the crusade, Louis wanted the opinion of Bernard of Clairvaux, whom the king was said to have often consulted as though he were an oracle. Revered throughout Europe as a living saint, Bernard of Clairvaux was the most influential churchman of the age. Pope Eugenius himself had been one of Bernard's monks and pupils. Bernard was instrumental in defining a new chivalry, a knighthood blended with spiritual vows in the form of military orders like the Knights Templar. A warrior's true calling, according to Bernard, was to renounce pride and wealth and commit himself to the defense of Christendom. For Bernard of Clairvaux, the crusade represented the manifestation of this ideal. 
St. Bernard and his Cistercians fanned across France, preaching the cross. Bernard's surviving letters from the period contain some of the most powerful examples of crusade ideology. Bernard's ideas would shape the church's approach to the crusades for centuries to come. This age is like no other that has gone before. A new abundance of divine mercy comes down from heaven. Blessed are those who are alive in this year, pleasing to the Lord, this year of remission, this year of veritable jubilee. I tell you, the Lord has not done this for any other generation before, nor has he lavished on your father's gifts so copious. Bernard cast the crusade as a gift from God, a showering of blessings upon the warriors of the age. He emphasized the idea that those participating were fortunate to be living in an era of unique blessings from God. Also, Bernard frequently referred to the Holy Land as Christ's lands, emphasizing the feudal obligation of a vassal to protect his Lord's domain. If Christ's domain was in peril, how could a Christian warrior neglect to defend it? Louis VII took to heart Bernard's ideals and lived more like a monk than a king, shunning finery and dressing in poor garments, praying frequently and fasting. At Vézelay on March 31st, 1147, in a field outside the town, St. Bernard preached the crusade much as Pope Urban had preached at Clermont half a century earlier. Attending were King Louis VII and his leading men. In a dramatic ceremony, Louis received the cross from Bernard. Most of the king's leading vassals took the cross as well. Soon, St. Bernard ran out of cloth crosses to affix to the cloaks of newly avowed crusaders. The charismatic abbot tore his own habit into strips to make more crosses. Even Louis's queen, the beautiful Eleanor of Aquitaine, took the pilgrim's vow to travel east with her husband. In terms of personality, King Louis and Queen Eleanor seemed rather mismatched. Unlike Louis, Eleanor was extravagant and worldly, a lover of poetry and song, rich garments, and the finer trappings of court life. However, their marriage had been a political win, for Eleanor was the heiress to the vast, wealthy Duchy of Aquitaine, and her territories greatly enhanced the Kingdom of France. Louis seems to have been deeply devoted to his bright, lovely queen, though the experience of the crusade would strain their relationship to the breaking point. By November, St. Bernard was preaching in Germany, territory ruled by Conrad III. Riley Smith describes Conrad as shrewd, sincere, intelligent, pious, courageous, and hardworking. In the past, Conrad had expressed interest in crusading. Although never formally crowned emperor, Conrad was nevertheless ruler of the Holy Roman Empire and styled himself King of the Romans. At Christmas Mass at Spire Cathedral, St. Bernard preached directly to Conrad, asking the ruler to imagine himself at the final judgment, approaching the throne of Christ. The Savior would name all the gifts he'd granted to Conrad, wealth, power, kingship, wisdom, courage, strength. Then, recalling that Conrad had refused the crusader's vow, Christ would ask, Son, what more should I have done for you? Conrad, the tall, brawny king of the Germans, wept openly. Kneeling, he proclaimed, I am ready to serve him. Bernard received the emperor's vow to crusade, along with many of the great men of the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the King of France and the Holy Roman Emperor, two of the most important rulers in Christendom, had agreed to lead the Second Crusade. Earlier, on March 13, 1147, a large group of Saxon nobles and knights approached the Cistercian abbot and asked him to extend the scope of the Crusade. They wanted to fulfill their crusader's vow by waging war against the pagan Wends, who dwelt east of the Elbe River. The Saxons explained to Bernard that these pagans were a threat to the local Christians, raiding their territories and carrying God's people into bondage. Were Christian knights not called to oppose God's enemies everywhere, not just in Palestine? Bernard needed little convincing. He agreed and at once asked Pope Eugenius to extend the crusade to Christendom's central European frontier in the Northeast. The Pope, who rarely refused one of Bernard's requests, approved the idea. 
Formally, the Second Crusade was extended to include a new northeastern front where dwelt the pagan winds. The Saxons who battled the winds would gain the same spiritual merits as the knights who would travel to Syria. As it happened, the territory of the winds was the most logical point of expansion for the Christian Saxons. However, St. Bernard insisted that the object of the Wendish Crusade must be spiritual. He forbade the Saxon Crusaders from making peace unless the winds agreed to be baptized. We utterly forbid that for any reason whatsoever a truce should be made with these people, either for the sake of money or for the sake of tribute, until such a time as, by God's help, they shall be either converted or wiped out. This is a striking condition imposed by St. Bernard. In effect, the Saxons were to offer their Wendish enemies the choice to convert or die. This was the first time crusading included such a ruthless maxim. Riley Smith points out that Bernard appears to be contradicting his own words here, for in the past, the abbot had stated that conversion must never be forced. Traditionally, crusaders in both the Holy Land and Spain had not insisted on the conversion of their Muslim opponents and had frequently made treaties with them. Indeed, the crusader states would have been unable to function had they not dealt diplomatically with neighboring Muslim states. This shows the divide between an uncompromising vision and the realities of war and politics as managed by those who actually lived and governed on Christendom's frontiers. The Templars themselves would be masters of diplomacy and would make many treaties with their Muslim neighbors. The Wendish Crusade represented the start of yet another thread in Crusades history, the Northern Crusades, and quickly, the Northern Crusaders would learn to deal diplomatically with their pagan opponents as often as did other Crusaders. But the Second Crusade would not be limited to two fronts. King Alfonso VII of Leon Castile sent a request to Pope Eugenius III asking that the Crusade Bull be extended to include Spain. Alfonso had his eye on Almeria, held by the Almoravid Empire of North Africa, and the King of Portugal, Alfonso I, was interested in crusading to conquer Lisbon, held by the Muslim Taifa of Badajoz. For years now, popes had been issuing Crusade Bulls for the wars against the Moors in Spain. In keeping with the tradition, Pope Eugenius extended the Second Crusade to include the Iberian Front. The Pope went so far as to issue a separate Crusade bull for Spain and Portugal specifically. Many Genoese sailors and men from southern France opted to join the Crusade of King Alfonso VII. Those taking the cross in 1147 had their choice, Spain, Central Europe, or the Holy Land. The Second Crusade was, in effect, the first international project of the Crusades, but would this stretch the forces of Latin Christendom too thin? As the Pope's call to crusade spread across Western Christendom, events began to trend more favorably for the Crusader states in the Eastern Levant. In September 1146, Zengi, while sleeping, was stabbed to death by one of his own slaves. News of Zengi's death was welcome among the Franks of the Latin East. Inevitably, a period of instability arose within Zengi's domains as his two sons, Saif ad-Din Ghassi and Nur ad-Din Mahmud, clashed over their father's empire. Saif ad-Din established a power base in Mosul, while Nur ad-Din secured his hold over Aleppo. Hoping to take advantage of the situation, Count Jocelyn II assembled his troops and marched on Edessa. Briefly, the Count managed to reoccupy the city, though the citadel itself held out. However, when Nur ad-Din arrived with a large Turkish army, prospects for the Christians securing Edessa evaporated. Nur ad-Din's forces overwhelmed Count Jocelyn and his Franks, who retreated, suffering heavy losses. Nur ad-Din then massacred Edessa's population and razed the city to the ground, leaving behind a useless husk of the once splendid town. It was a tragic end to the city's life. No doubt, Nur ad-Din wanted to eliminate the possibility of the Franks retaking Edessa while he dealt with the conflict with his brother. 
This first and decisive act of Nur ad-Din foreshadowed his profound significance in the history of the 12th century East. Nur ad-Din would, in time, become the most important enemy of the Frankish Crusader states. In the Iberian Peninsula, the crusade was underway by early 1147, led by local rulers long accustomed to crusading. After the proclamation of Pope Eugenius' crusade bull, King Afonso I of Portugal had sent his brother, Pedro, to meet with Bernard of Clairvaux personally to discuss the recruitment of troops for the crusade in Portugal. Afonso of Portugal was one of medieval Europe's truly remarkable rulers. It was Afonso who established Portugal as an independent kingdom. Indeed, he was the first named king of Portugal. Early in his reign, Afonso had allied himself closely with the Knights Templar. The king even described himself as a brother in the fraternity of the Templars, indicating that he himself had become an associate of the order. Afonso granted the Templars important frontier castles in his kingdom, and from then on, the Templars would be key participants in the ongoing Portuguese crusade. In March of 1147, King Afonso assembled his troops at Coimbra and made a rapid thrust south, surprising and capturing the Muslim town of Santarém. With this rapid victory, Afonso now controlled the passage of the Tagus River. The great city of Lisbon was now isolated. Afonso was poised to launch the greatest campaign of his reign. Meanwhile, in April 1147, a fleet of crusaders departed Cologne. As they passed through the North Sea and the English Channel, they were joined by crusader ships from Flanders and England. This coalition was no small force, but altogether contained around 164 ships and 13,000 men. Cruising past northern France and along the western coast of the Iberian Peninsula, the Crusaders dropped anchor at Porto, where they met the local bishop, Pedro. The bishop had been expecting them. Indeed, some men in this fleet had already made arrangements to crusade in Portugal with Bernard of Clairvaux when the great abbot had toured the Low Countries. Bishop Pedro urged the Crusaders to join with his king, Afonso, in the crusade to conquer Lisbon. The bishop emphasized the meritorious nature of the war. Act like good soldiers, he told them, for the sin is not in fighting, but in fighting for the sake of booty. Though the fleet set out for Lisbon on June 28, there was still much debate among their ranks about whether or not to join in Afonso's crusade. Some crusaders opposed halting for the Portuguese campaign, for their ultimate destination was the Holy Land but many were attracted by Afonso's offer, a treaty guaranteeing them a share in the city's plunder and trading privileges throughout Portugal. These privileges would be generational and their sons would inherit them as well. Arriving at the siege camp before Lisbon, the crusaders met with King Afonso personally. The leaders of the crusader fleet were Hervé of Glanville, Christian of Gessel, and Count Arnold of Ershut. The king appealed personally for their help repeating his offer and insisting on the sanctity of his cause. Alfonso even promised to grant lands to any crusaders wishing to settle in his kingdom. Among the crusaders, Alfonso's greatest advocate was Hervé of Glanville, who appealed to his comrade's sense of honor. Hervé voiced his agreement that the king's cause was a holy one and reminded his peers of the wealth waiting within Lisbon for the taking. Hervé's advocacy won out. The Crusader coalition agreed to join with Afonso's army in the campaign to capture Lisbon. The king sent the Bishop of Braga to formally request the surrender of Lisbon's Muslim rulers. You have held our cities and lands already for 358 years, said the bishop. Return to the homeland of the Moors whence you came, leaving to us what is ours. Not surprisingly, Lisbon's Muslim governors saw things differently. They accused the Christians of acting out of greed and declared their intention to resist with all their powers until Allah should determine otherwise. The, fire rages through the, enemy. 
The Portuguese Crusader Coalition formally laid siege to Lisbon on July 1st, 1147. Alfonso and his army blockaded the city from the land approaches, while the Crusader fleet blockaded from the sea. Alfonso's men assembled their siege equipment and began to batter the walls with catapults and trebuchets. Six weeks passed. The Muslims proved courageous in their defense of the city. The Crusaders began to grow frustrated, but then the Christians intercepted letters from Lisbon's rulers. The letters were desperate requests for help to Abu Muhammad, the Emir of Evora, and other Moorish rulers, and described the desperate conditions of hunger and disease that prevailed within Lisbon. Encouraged, the Christians pressed on with the siege. The German and Flemish crusaders continued digging mines beneath the walls, while the Normans and the English constructed an enormous movable tower with which to assault the city walls. Lisbon's defenders became so desperate with hunger that they began collecting refuse thrown from the Christian ships as it was carried in by the waves below the city's walls. Seeing this, the crusaders began laying traps for their opponents, setting food out in front of the city, and then capturing enemy troops when they came out to collect it. Finally, the Christian siege engines and sappers caused the collapse of a very large section of the wall. One Christian chronicler described hearing the defenders cry out in anguish after the wall fell. At last, in October, when the Anglo-Norman siege tower reached the city's walls, the Muslim defenders sent a messenger to King Alfonso to ask for terms. Lisbon surrendered. The Christian army made its triumphal entry into the city on October 24, 1147. Although the king allowed the Muslim defenders to leave with their lives, the city was sacked and many lives were lost in this violence. The crusaders also captured the nearby fortress of Sintra to the west and the castle Palmela south of the Tagus River. Many of the crusaders decided to settle in Lisbon and one of them, an Englishman named Gilbert of Hastings, was elected bishop of the city. However, most of the German, Flemish, and English crusaders would sail on to the Holy Land in February 1148. Alfonso next launched a campaign to capture many of the nearby castles. Soon, all of Portugal north of the Tagus River and south of Coimbra was under the king's control. As a result of the Lisbon Crusade, Portugal's frontier was dramatically expanded. The episode represents a major development in the ongoing Reconquista of the Iberian Peninsula. The conquest of Lisbon was King Alfonso's crowning victory. The 1140s were a time when all of Christian Iberia expanded southward, but Portugal's achievements were the most important for this period of the Reconquista, the most landmark development since the fall of Zaragoza in 1118 or the fall of Toledo in 1085. The fall of Lisbon would be one of the Second Crusade's most enduring legacies. Surely, such a victory is exactly what St. Bernard envisioned for the whole of the international multi-front campaign. While Alfonso of Portugal was engaged in the conquest of Lisbon, Alfonso VII, the King of Leon Castile, was waging his own crusade to capture the great port city of Almeria. Alfonso VII is an important and intriguing figure, and his participation in the Second Crusade merits some examination of his rise to prominence. He was the son of Queen Uraca of Leon and the grandson of King Alfonso VI of Leon Castile, the famed patron of El Cid. Alfonso VII's father, Raymond of Burgundy, was a Frenchman, if that term could be used for this period. Raymond was one of those many knights from the land of the Franks who traveled to Spain during the late 11th and early 12th centuries. 
Such men found willing sponsors in the Iberian kings who employed them in campaigns of conquest in the Muslim south or in the desperate wars against the Almoravids. Thus, Alfonso Raimundes, as he was known, sprang literally from that mingling of the Frankish and Iberian legacies, in part generated by crusading and by the increasing religious unity of Western Christendom under the Latin Church. Alfonso was born in a troubled period for his mother's kingdom, when the rival kingdoms of Portugal and Aragon were on the rise, and the Almoravids of North Africa were at the peak of their power. However, under Alfonso VII, the great territory of Leon Castile would once more be the dominant power on the Iberian Peninsula, and the ancient imperial dreams of Alfonso's forefathers seemed plausible yet again. The king played a key role in reducing the power of the Almoravids on the peninsula as he invested their castles throughout the Tagus Valley, steadily defeating and replacing their garrisons. Indeed, Alfonso styled himself Emperor of all Spain, an ambitious title never fully realized. Nevertheless, we can see in Alfonso VII the clear blending of crusading ideals with the dreams of Spanish reconquest. Alfonso VII quite deliberately asked the Pope to extend the Second Crusade to Leon Castile. He also invited his vassals, Ramon Berenguer IV of Aragon, Barcelona, and William of Montpellier to join in the Crusade, quote, for the redemption of their souls. Alfonso was both a crusader and a reconqueror, a self-conscious member of the greater project of Latin Christendom, spearheaded by the Pope in Rome, as well as an heir to the ancient dream of Alfonso the Great and the other early monarchs of medieval Spain. The House of Leon Castile considered itself the authentic continuation of the throne of the Visigothic King Roderick. Alfonso VII may have been one of Latin Christendom's first rulers to become aware of Pope Eugenius III's plans to launch the Second Crusade. In 1145, one of Alfonso's most important counselors and magnates, Archbishop Raymond of Toledo, was in Rome when news arrived of the fall of Edessa. It wasn't Spanish rulers alone who were interested in extending the Second Crusade to Spain. The Genoese asked the Pope to allow them to fulfill their crusading vows in the conquest of Almeria. The Genoese viewed Almeria as a nest of pirates and saw an opportunity to both destroy an enemy and gain from one of the Mediterranean's wealthiest ports. Alfonso would need a naval ally in the enterprise, and so he welcomed cooperation with Genoa. King Alfonso VII's active participation in the Second Crusade began in 1146. That April, he assembled his army in Toledo. In May, he attacked Cordoba, captured a portion of the city, and obliged the Almoravid governor, Ibn Ganiya, to acknowledge him as overlord. In August, the king returned to Toledo, where he met with his Genoese allies. By September, Alfonso and the Genoese had hammered out a formal pact. Alfonso would supply land forces and contribute 30,000 Maravadis. Genoa would provide a fleet, troops, and siege equipment for the siege of Almeria. The Genoese would receive a third of all conquests and would have the right to establish factories and markets in Almeria. They would also be exempt from all tolls in Alfonso's dominions. Ramon Berenguer IV, ruler of the Kingdom of Aragon and the County of Barcelona, agreed to participate in the crusade as well. The plan was to take Almeria in 1147 and then win Tortosa for Ramon Berenguer in 1148. The Genoese would supply the naval power for both campaigns. In November of 1146, Alfonso VII met with Count Ramon Berenguer and King Garcia Ramirez of Navarre at San Esteban de Gormaz to coordinate plans for the campaign. As in the Holy Land, the Iberian Crusade would be a multinational affair.
But Alfonso did not rest. That winter, he launched an expedition from his southern frontier to capture the Almoravid-held fortress of Calatrava. In January of 1147, the king had full control of that castle, which was crucial for his upcoming campaign. He then returned to Toledo to take up the kingdom's normal business. Meanwhile, the Pope, Eugenius III, reissued his crusade bull, this time specifically mentioning Spain as a front in the Second Crusade. The King of the Spains, wrote the Pope, is strongly arming against the Saracens. Here the Pope affirmed Alfonso's preferred title of overlord of the entire Iberian Peninsula. In the summer of 1147, King Alfonso VII joined with his ally, King Garcia Ramirez of Navarre, for an attack on Baeza, an important Moorish stronghold in Al-Andalus on the Guadalquivir. The two kings captured the fortress in mid-August. Having secured Baeza as a critical supply base, Alfonso and Garcia then led their troops in the grueling, dangerous march over mountains and desert to reach the Mediterranean coast. Arriving at the port city of Almeria, the two kings rendezvoused with the Genoese fleet and the forces of Count Ramon Berenger. The Genoese fleet had already arrived back in July. Their fleet contained 63 galleys and 163 other ships, an impressive force. Alfonso had with him a modest but effective army of 400 knights and around 1,000 foot soldiers. Ramon Berenger's force included a single ship and 53 knights. We must remember that armies weren't particularly large in the mid-12th century. Bishop Arnaldo of Astorga preached before the crusaders, proclaiming, Now, it is necessary that each one confess himself well and fully and know that the gates of paradise are open. In effect, he was saying that those who would fall in this battle would be martyrs. At the time, Almeria was a rich, thriving port. The city's population numbered around 28,000, with walls that contained some 79 hectares of land. The Almerian fleet was considerable, but faced with this imposing crusader coalition, withdrew before the city was fully invested. It looked as though no relief was coming from other Muslim lands. The governors of Almeria offered Alfonso 100,000 Maravadis if he would withdraw. He refused. On October 17, 1147, a week before the fall of Lisbon, Almeria surrendered. Alfonso's crusade had triumphed. It was the crowning achievement of an already impressive career, and not surprisingly, the king would tout this victory widely. The Genoese, too, were proud of their accomplishment, which they considered both economically and spiritually profitable. In 1148, the momentum of the crusade did not slow down. That July, the Genoese rejoined Count Ramon Berenger along with the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller for an assault on the port city of Tortosa at the head of the delta of the Ebro River. To show the broad recruitment for these Iberian campaigns, William of Montpellier and Bertrand of Toulouse both brought forces to this siege, and some veterans from the Lisbon Crusade joined as well. Tortosa surrendered in December. And so, the Count of Aragon Barcelona had his victory from the Second Crusade, as did the kings of Leon Castile and Portugal. Ramon Berenger continued his crusading into 1149. That year, he captured the important cities of Fraga, Lerida, and Mequinenza, thus reversing the gains of the Almoravids after the Battle of Fraga in 1134. The whole of the old lands of the once magnificent Taifa of Zaragoza, where El Cid had once served as a mercenary to the Emir, had now fallen to the Christians. The Second Crusade had been a resounding success throughout the Iberian Peninsula. It had expanded Christian territory from Tortosa in the east to Lisbon in the west. 
These were significant gains, which placed important cities in the hands of the Christians. Although the Almoravids had been in decline throughout the previous decades, the Second Crusade put a stamp on the collapse of the Almoravid Empire. Throughout the Crusade, the Almoravids had failed to bring aid to Iberian castles technically under their rule, and the remaining great cities of the Muslim South began to operate once more as independent Taifa kingdoms. By 1149, the Second Crusade was over in Spain and Portugal. The successes were unquestionably dramatic. Bernard Riley summarizes the territory gained. The Portuguese border had been carried permanently south from Coimbra on the Mondego to Santarém and Lisbon on the Tagus. The entire basin of the Ebro had fallen to Aragon Barcelona in the east. Leon Castile had cleared the whole of the plain of Castilla la Nueva of the Almoravids and had established a strong position in the upper basin of the Guadalquivir and Almeria. All three of the major Iberian campaigns received assistance from the Crusaders from outside of the Iberian Peninsula. Germany, Italy, France, England, and other regions and kingdoms all sent assistance to the Iberian Crusade. But how would the Second Crusade fare in other theaters, the Northeast, and in the Holy Land? We'll continue with our look at the Second Crusade by examining the Saxon campaign in Central Europe, the Wendish Crusade. As part of the Second Crusade, Bernard of Clairvaux secured papal sanction and crusade indulgences for the summer campaign of 1147 against the pagan Slavs, or Wends, who dwelt between the rivers Elbe and Oder. Historian Christopher Tyreman says that this decision set the tone for perhaps the most radical and effective association of crusading and territorial expansion. This was the start of the Northern Crusades, which would last for at least two centuries and impact every region east of the Elbe, along the coast eastwards and northwards to Livonia, Estonia, Finland, and the Gulfs of Finland and Bothnia. These expansionist wars coincided with the territorial interests of Christian, Danish, German, and Polish princes looking to press east or north. Spiritual gains went hand in hand with gains in land, wealth, and power. Ultimately, the Northern Crusades would bring the pagan communities of the Eastern and Northern Baltic littoral into the realm of Latin Christendom. However, in 1147, all this lay in the future. At the time, it was a matter of Saxon Christian knights seeking to sanctify their war against the Eastern Slavs by the big event of the year, the Second Crusade. The idea of crusading in this region wasn't new, though it hadn't yet taken off. Back in 1108, the Archbishop of Magdeburg sought military assistance for the vulnerable Christian lands along the Elbe frontier, urging knights to come and help in the liberation of, quote, our Jerusalem. Including this region under the larger crusade's umbrella was a natural development. If Christians battling Saracens in Spain and the Holy Land received the Pope's endorsement, then why not the Saxons who fought pagan tribes? For the Saxons, the prize wasn't spiritual alone, but the wealth of new conquests. The Magdeburg Appeal demonstrates this quite plainly. Their land is the best, rich in meat, honey, corn, and birds, and if it were well cultivated, none could be compared to it for the wealth of its produce. And so, most renowned Saxons, French, Lorrainers, and Flemings, and conquerors of the world, this is an occasion for you to save your souls and, if you wish it, acquire the best land in which to live. May he who with the strength of his arm led the men of Gaul on their march from the far west in triumph against enemies in the farthest east give you the will and power to conquer those enemies who are nearby and to prosper well in all things. Note the direct reference to the First Crusade. No wonder that the Northern Crusades quickly evolved into one of the most active theaters of crusading. Nevertheless, historian Eric Christensen writes, when the Saxons demanded to be let loose on the Slavs, they did so for good old-fashioned reasons, either to get submission and tribute or to seize more land. 
for the Danes, it was an opportunity for revenge and retaliation against the pirates and slavers, and for the Poles, a chance of intimidating the Prussians. But who were these tribes that were to be battled? Across the eastern frontiers and the pagan lands that stretched along the Baltic shore to the Gulf of Finland, the peoples were divided into numerous principalities, tribes, or extended family groups. The most prominent division was linguistic. Between the Kiel and Vistula dwelt the Western Slavs, or Wends. Among the Wends, tribal and political groups were sustained by a lively polytheistic religion directed by a powerful priestly class. Each region had its particular cult, with its own temples stocked with sacred images. The rural areas were dominated by territorial princes, but markets and trade existed in towns on the coast. Farther east, political life was less recognizable to the Latin Christians, more tribal and primordial. Among the winds, one prince stood out as most capable of resisting the coming crusade, Niklot, prince of the Wendish Abotrites. Niklot presided over the substantial Abotrite confederation, which included various other tribes and amounted to a considerable military power. Niklot was aware of the preparations of the Crusaders. In April 1147, the Pope appointed Bishop Anselm of Havelberg as his legate for the Wendish campaign. June 29, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul was designated for the muster. The Crusaders were to gather on that date at Magdeburg. However, that June, Niklot launched a preemptive campaign. His Wendish army struck at the newly established German settlement of Lübeck. The Wends brutally devastated the Flemish and Frisian villages. In fact, Niklot's initial attack only further bolstered the cause of the Crusade. What better proof that the Wends were an immediate threat to Christendom? Eric Christensen notes that Niklot's attack stiffened the sinews of the assembling armies, for it made it plain that he meant to have his own again. The coalition of the Wendish Crusade was composed of a Danish force under the kings Canute V and Sven III, troops under Archbishop Adalbert of Bremen, and Duke Henry the Lion's Saxons. Warrior bishops would be a common feature over the history of the Northern Crusades. In mid-July, the Archbishop and Duke Henry led their armies into Abotrite territory to besiege Niklot's newly built fortress of Dobbin. Meanwhile, from the north, a Danish army and fleet descended on the stronghold. Niklot and his Slavic forces resisted fiercely. Surrounded by marsh and lake, Dobbin was well defended. The Crusader armies were stretched thin. A Crusader force had to guard the Danish fleet at Wismar Bay. Early on, Niklot set his allies, the Rugians, to attack the Danish fleet by sea. While Niklot's troops launched a sally against the Danish forces outside of Dobbin, the Danish troops were isolated by the lake outside the fortress. And so, the Wends managed to devastate the Danes before the Saxons could bring help. This early mauling of the Danish contingent caused the two kings, Canute V and Sven III, to quickly cut their losses and withdraw from the crusade. Thus, the Christian coalition was greatly reduced. Undeterred, Archbishop Adalbert and Henry the Lion maintained their siege of the Wendish fort. As the Saxon troops ravaged the countryside, some of the nobles objected. One chronicler recorded their dismay. Is not the land we are devastating our land, and the people we are fighting our people? Why are we destroying our own incomes? If they couldn't conquer this region for the time being, the Saxons generally preferred to extract tribute from it rather than destroy it. But didn't this go against Bernard of Clairvaux's maxim? Ultimately, the siege devolved into a costly stalemate. Soon, the Saxons came to terms with Prince Niklot. The garrison of Dobbin accepted baptism and freed their Danish prisoners. 
Niklot restored his alliance with the Count of Holstein and agreed to pay tribute. Historian Christopher Tyreman describes this treaty as, quote, a scanty fig leaf to allow the Danes and Saxons to withdraw. The Saxon chronicler Helmut of Bozau mocked the Wendish conversions as false. Niklot's rule remained strong, as well as his people's pagan religious system with its temples and priesthood, and the Wendish slave markets continued to circulate Danish prisoners. But the Wendish crusade wasn't over. At Magdeburg in early August, the main army assembled under the papal legate Anselm of Havelburg, as well as six other German bishops. Albert the Bear led the Saxon marcher lords, and an imperial contingent under the abbot Wiebald of Corvai was also present. Campaigning far from Dobbin, this essentially papal-led army fought its way some 100 miles deep into Wendish territory. Possibly preparing to assault the strategically significant island of Rügen, the Crusaders attacked Demin on the river Pina. The Crusaders managed to overrun Maishof to the south, where they destroyed the pagan temple. However, at Demin, Wendish resistance was fierce. Once more, a stalemate developed. Once more, the Crusaders ultimately withdrew. Persuaded by some of the frontier margraves, the bulk of the German army now moved on Stettin in Pomerania. However, it soon became apparent that this town had already accepted the Christian religion, for the inhabitants hung crosses from the walls. The town's bishop came out to talk with the leaders of the German army. Chastened, the Crusader coalition duly withdrew. In his famous history, God's War, Christopher Tyreman notes that the Wendish Crusade, begun with such acclaim at Frankfurt and attracting recruits from as far afield as Moravia, Denmark, and the southern Rhineland, petered out in a failed Saxon land grab. While the Wendish Crusade of 1147 produced minimal results in the immediate, it set a precedent that would shape the history of the region. It was only the beginning. The Northern Crusades would continue. The lands of the Wends would be the first to fall. Ultimately, German, Polish, and Scandinavian Crusaders would press farther east and north, deep into the Baltic, absorbing tribe after tribe into the fold of Christendom. Niklot had had his victory, but his descendants would one day be Christians. For the time being, the Wendish Crusade was widely regarded as a disappointment, especially when compared to the sweeping victories of the Second Crusade in Iberia. We did what we were told, but it didn't work, wrote the abbot Vibald of Corvai. Famously, historian Eric Christensen notes, On the other hand, if this campaign had not been undertaken as a crusade, it would have seemed fairly successful. It rounded off the Saxon occupation of Wagria and Palabia and made Prince Niklot a tributary and ally of the Saxons. It produced a certain amount of loot, freed a certain number of slaves, and suffered only one serious defeat when the Danes were driven back at Dobbin. It was only from the point of view of St. Bernard and the clergy of the Slav missions that the campaign appeared a failure. It was they who had decided to make the permanent conversion of the Slavs the main aim of the undertaking, and it's worth asking why they imagined that this could be achieved through a military campaign. Interesting comments from Eric Christensen, which opened the door to further discussion and contemplation. This leaves us with the final theater of the Second Crusade, the Holy Land itself. What would happen when the King of France and the Emperor of Germany led their armies against the Seljuk and Zengid forces of the Eastern Levant? Stay with us for the full story. The Pope's Norman-Italian adversary, King Roger II of Sicily, wanted to capitalize on the energy of the Second Crusade. Roger already maintained a close alliance with King Louis VII of France, 
And so, he offered his own fleet to transport the French army to the Holy Land. Roger proposed that, along the way, the Crusaders could further the cause of Christendom by subduing, once and for all, the Byzantine Empire, which Roger described as treacherous and unreliable. Since the days of Robert Giscard, the Normans of southern Italy had long cherished hopes of one day conquering Byzantium. Over the course of the history of the Crusades, many Latin Christians had developed a mistrust of the Eastern Empire, which seemed to them a nest of double-dealing snakes, at best an unreliable and cowardly ally in the fight against the Saracens. A robust anti-Byzantine party existed at the royal court of France, and many of King Louis's advisors urged the monarch to accept Roger's offer. Louis, however, felt that he would need Byzantine support to prosecute his crusade. He also preferred to travel overland like the heroes of the First Crusade. Politely, Louis declined King Roger's proposal. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, Emperor Manuel Comnenus was not at all happy about the prospect of a new crusade. He'd spent a great deal of energy cultivating an anti-Sicilian coalition composed of Venice, the Pope, and the Holy Roman Empire. He was also loath to see his peace with the Seljuk Turkish Sultan of Rum disrupted. Like all Byzantine emperors, Manuel was concerned that the crusade would ultimately be turned against his own lands. To secure his eastern flank, Manuel reaffirmed his peace with the Seljuk Turks and prepared himself to deal with the western armies that would soon descend upon his empire. The German army, under Conrad III, departed Regensburg in May 1147 and headed east. Accompanying the knights and soldiers were a great many civilian pilgrims hoping to visit the holy places. One veteran lamented this fact and stated that Pope Eugenius should have required civilians to stay home, quote, for the weak and helpless are always a burden to their comrades and a source of prey to their enemies. The Germans marched along the Danube to Vienna, Hungary, and finally reached the Byzantine frontier at Branitz around July 20. The size of the German army is unknown, but it must have been substantial, for it moved quite slowly. A reasonable estimate would be between 7,000 and 13,000 on the lower end, and between 10,000 and 20,000 on the higher end. Small by modern standards, but substantial for the mid-12th century. Hearing of the approaching Germans, Emperor Emmanuel negotiated an agreement with Conrad. The Germans would refrain from causing trouble in imperial lands, while Manuel would provide supplies and markets for the Crusaders. As it marched from the Danube to Thrace, the German army kept good order, but once they reached Thrace, German discipline became lax, and there were violent clashes between locals and Crusaders at Philippopolis. There was another violent incident at Adrianople, but at last Conrad's army reached Constantinople on September 10, here, the Germans found the Byzantine capital on full military alert. Despite the unruly march of the German army, Manuel was eager to maintain good relations with Conrad. The Byzantine emperor was worried that the German ruler intended to attack his capital. Torturous negotiations followed. However, Manuel's wife, Bertha of Solzbach, was a relative of Conrad's, and the two rulers managed to maintain friendly terms. On both sides, there was mistrust. Many in the Byzantine camp believed the Germans harbored hostile intentions, while many of the Crusaders were suspicious of the Byzantines. Nevertheless, after a month camped outside the walls of Constantinople, the German army traveled on ships provided by Manuel across the Bosporus. Manuel provided guides and food to the Crusaders, although some of the army's commanders wanted to remain encamped to await the arrival of the French under Louis VII, Conrad was eager to press on to Syria. As hindsight would prove, Conrad should have waited. The German army divided, one contingent led by Conrad, the other led by Conrad's half-brother, Otto of Freising. 
Otto's contingent took the coastal roads southwards through Byzantine territory, while Conrad's contingent proceeded southeast toward Dorylaeum and Iconium. For ten days, Conrad's contingent made the grueling trek across the treacherous interior of Asia Minor. Food ran short, and discipline began to break down. From the hills, bands of Turkish horse archers stalked the exhausted Germans, picking off the weak or the stragglers. Unlike the army of the First Crusade, Conrad's troops lacked cohesion and proved ideal prey to the harassment tactics of the Seljuk Turks. The Crusaders failed to adapt to Turkish tactics despite the presence of Byzantine guides. The famed historian of the Latin East, William of Tyre, would later accuse these guides of deliberately leading the Christian forces into danger. It was common talk, and probably quite true, wrote William, that these perilous wanderings were devised with the knowledge of the Greek emperor, who has always envied the successful advance of the Christians. It's true that Manuel wasn't happy about the crusade taking place at all, but would he have gone so far as to have deliberately sabotaged its progress? On October 25, near Dorylaeum, the site of a dramatic crusader victory in 1097, Conrad's army was ambushed by a substantial Seljuk Turkish host led by the Sultan of Rum himself, Mesud I. The Turks executed their trap brilliantly. An advanced force of Turks appeared and drew the German heavy cavalry into an early charge. Pursuing the retreating Turks, the German cavalry left their infantry and ran right into an attack by a much larger Turkish force. The German cavalry was devastated and the infantry was subsequently mauled by the triumphant Turks. German casualties were atrocious. Desperate, Conrad, Otto, and the other commanders ordered a retreat back to Byzantine territory. As the Germans struggled to withdraw, they were continuously harassed by Turkish skirmishers. The retreat turned into a total rout. The German rearguard was utterly wiped out. William of Tyre records the devastation. Our army, hemmed in on all sides, was in mortal danger from the constant showers of darts and arrows. They had no chance to retaliate or to engage the foe at close quarters, nor could they lay hold of the enemy. As often as they tried to make a counterattack, the Turks broke ranks, eluded all their attempts, and galloped off in different directions. The Second Battle of Dorylaeum was in marked contrast to the First Battle of Dorylaeum in 1097, when Bohemond and the other leaders of the First Crusade had held their forces together with tight discipline and dealt effectively with the Seljuk Turks. Leadership seems to have been a major factor in the German failure. Conrad proved unable to maintain discipline or to demonstrate the imagination necessary to achieve victory in the most trying of circumstances. Conrad himself was wounded in the head by an arrow during the desperate retreat. A starving, shattered remnant of the German army limped back into Nicaea in early November. Many survivors immediately abandoned the expedition, taking the first ships bound for the west. The German contingent of the Second Crusade, even before it had reached the Holy Land, had effectively ceased to exist. The bankrupt, hungry, and wounded rump of the German army could do nothing but accept the hospitality of the Byzantines and the French who were now encamped around Nicaea. For Louis VII and the French army, the appearance of the defeated, badly depleted German host was an ominous event. Some of the French blamed the Byzantine guides for misleading their German allies. Conrad, however, placed the blame on himself, feeling that his own leadership had failed at the most critical hour. Historian Christopher Tyreman writes, In truth, the German crusade foundered on poor intelligence, fallible logistics, inappropriate tactics, and over-optimistic strategy, as much as by lack of Greek support or the skill of the Turkish archers. 
From the rebellious, despised foot sloggers and pilgrims to the mounted elite, for all their numbers and weaponry, the Germans proved in all respects except courage, singularly ill-equipped for Anatolian warfare or the needs of a contested march. At Nicaea, Louis and Conrad discussed their next move. After the Turkish victory at Dorylaeum, Conrad commanded only a tiny force. Louis was now the main commander of the crusade, for if it were to succeed, it would be up to the French. Both Conrad and Louis agreed not to attempt another crossing of central Anatolia. Instead, they prepared to march along the Aegean and Mediterranean coasts of Asia Minor, thus keeping within Byzantine territory as long as possible. Departing Nicaea, the Crusaders marched to Smyrna and then Ephesus, where Conrad became dangerously ill. At Manuel's suggestion, the German Emperor sailed to Constantinople, where he was personally cared for by the Byzantine Emperor and Empress. A renewed alliance was established between Manuel and Conrad. When he was healthy enough, Conrad sailed directly from the Byzantine capital to the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. Thus, the German effort in the Second Crusade concluded in a dismal and costly failure. Christopher Tyerman points out that the Second Crusade was the first occasion for a Frankish king to lead a foreign conquest since Charlemagne. The Crusade emphasized Louis VII's sovereignty by associating the great magnates of France in a specifically royal policy. The Frankish contingent was the royal army, Louis VII's army. The Crusade was one of the most important projects of the king's career. Louis established relationships with leading men that in later years solidified the royal court as once again central to French politics. His chaplain recalls how at Verdun and Metz, where the king gathered his army in June of 1147, although the king found nothing there which belonged to him by right of lordship, he nevertheless found all subject to him voluntarily. Enthusiasm for the crusade was strong throughout France, especially after the preaching tours of Bernard of Clairvaux. Considered a living saint, Bernard was a striking figure. Years of hard penance had made his body lean and almost frail, but there was a severe strength about him. His vigorous, powerful intellect was matched by a profound charisma and eloquence. He was both the most influential royal advisor of the time and the most effective public orator. The Cistercian Otto of Freising described Bernard as endowed with wisdom and a knowledge of letters, renowned for signs and wonders, and as being like a divine oracle. The great assembly at Vesle on Easter Day in 1146, where Louis presided as king and Bernard spoke as advocate of the crusade, provides an obvious parallel to Pope Urban II's preaching of the First Crusade at Clermont in 1095. Like Urban, Bernard delivered a powerful speech, but more important was the symbolism of the moment. The king made his public pledge to the crusade and appeared as its leader, with Bernard representing the church's full endorsement of the expedition. Here, Latin Christian society stood united. For centuries, commentators have criticized Louis VII for electing to lead his army via the land route across Asia Minor and into the Holy Land. However, at the time this was a reasonable option. The First Crusade had taken this route, and quite successfully. The power offering to transport Louis' army by sea was the Norman Kingdom of Sicily, a bitter enemy of the Byzantines. King Roger of Sicily had already asked Louis to join him in a campaign to conquer the Byzantine Empire. Louis had declined, but he may have been concerned that ultimately Roger wouldn't take no for an answer. If Louis placed the whole of his army in Roger's care, Roger may have used that leverage to compel the King of France to attack Constantinople. In addition, Louis's army of Frankish knights was more suited to an overland journey. Unlike modern commentators, Louis VII didn't know the future. His decision to travel by land made sense at the time. 
In another dramatic ceremony, King Louis VII and his court gathered at the great cathedral of St. Denis on June 11, 1146. Here, surrounded by stained glass windows depicting the great heroes of the First Crusade, King Louis prostrated himself before the altar, kissed a relic of the church's patron saint, and received the oriflamme, the crimson banner mounted on a gold lance from Abbot Suger, and finally the pilgrim script from the Pope. All three symbolized the initiation of the Crusade. Louis's army included many of France's great lords and magnates. Flanders, Soissons, Bar, Pointu, Nevers, Tonnerre, the Auvergne, Champagne, and southern Burgundy all sent contingents. Among the greatest contingents was the force led by Thierry, Count of Flanders, as well as southern French vassals to the king's wife, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, including Geoffrey of Ronson. The king's brother, Count Robert of Drew, headed the king's core party. Eleanor herself was attended by a considerable party of ladies, and later poets would imagine them fantastically dressed as Amazon warrior maidens. The king's personal chaplain, the monk Odo of Doya, accompanied his master and his chronicle is today one of the most important sources for the Second Crusade in the Holy Land. One notable feature of the Second Crusade is the virtual universal approval it elicited from the powerful institutions of Latin Christendom. Only Roger II of Sicily, the Pope's enemy, refused to participate. This is in contrast to the First Crusade, in which Pope Urban had to rely primarily on his own allies, the Northern French, the Provençals, and the Normans. The First Crusade had been called amid a bitter feud between Pope and Holy Roman Emperor. Now, half a century later, the Crusades had become an institution firmly accepted as the business of God. The Pope's prestige and authority had been greatly bolstered by the success of the First Crusade and helped the papacy win the investiture contest with the German emperors. Bernard of Clairvaux emphasized that God would secure victory in the Second Crusade. The First Crusade's triumph had been a miracle, said the saint, and the second would be another miracle of God. However, Bernard also emphasized practical aspects of the campaign. In his letters, he recalled the disasters of the People's Crusade led by Peter the Hermit in 1096. Bernard wanted his crusade to be led by competent military men to ensure a success similar to the First Crusade. The cost involved in mobilizing Louis VII's army is difficult to overstate. Many nobles bankrupted themselves financing their participation. Wealthy church institutions, especially abbeys, made considerable contributions. Meanwhile, in the Holy Land, the Knights Templar prepared for the arrival of the Crusaders and sent representatives to meet the French at Constantinople. After mustering at Metz in June 1147, Louis VII and the French army, numbering tens of thousands, crossed the Rhineland, reached the Danube in early July, and then followed the route of the Germans through Hungary. Historian Jonathan Riley Smith writes that Louis's army was amply supplied by the Hungarians, with whose king Louis was on good terms. Thus far we were engaged in play, recalled Odo because we neither suffered injuries from men's ill will, nor feared dangers arising from the cunning of crafty men. However, from the time when we entered Bulgaria, a land belonging to the Greeks, our valor was put to the test, and our emotions were aroused. Odo notes that an agreement had been formalized between King Louis and Emperor Emmanuel of the Byzantine Empire ahead of time, but he insists that as soon as the Franks entered Byzantine territory, the Greeks, quote, stained themselves with perjury. Odo writes, Here, for the first time, wrongs began to arise and to be noticed, for the other countries, which sold us supplies properly, found us entirely peaceful. The Greeks, however, closed their cities and fortresses and offered their wares by letting them down from the walls on ropes. But food furnished in such measure did not suffice our throng. 
Therefore, the pilgrims, unwilling to endure want in the midst of plenty, procured supplies for themselves by plunder and pillage. However, Odo doesn't entirely blame the Greeks, called the Byzantines today, for this situation. He writes, Some thought that this state of affairs was the fault of the Germans who preceded us, since they had been plundering everything, and that the Greeks therefore fled our peaceful king. Unlike Richard the Lionheart and Frederick Barbarossa during the Third Crusade, both of whom would impose universal codes of conduct on their armies and meticulously keep all their men supplied, Louis proved unable to assert universal discipline over all of his contingents. Greek ambassadors kept Louis and the royal party well supplied throughout this portion of the march, but many divisions of the army were left to forage on their own, resulting in clashes with locals. After this ominous start, the French crusaders finally reached Constantinople between September and October of 1147. Manuel had shown suspicion toward Conrad, but now he showered King Louis with favors. The emperor held a lavish banquet in the French king's honor and personally accompanied King Louis and Queen Eleanor on a tour of Constantinople's churches and holy sites. Manuel provided abundant markets and provisions for the French forces, but Louis' ability to enforce universal discipline remained lacking, and some elements of the crusader host continued their unruly conduct. The emperor even arranged a joint mass celebrated by both Frankish and Greek clergy to honor Louis' patron saint, Saint Denis, on October 9. Clearly, Manuel wanted to maintain positive relations with the French and went out of his way to avoid any rupture with the Franks. Louis, for his part, was entirely in agreement with Manuel's policy. However, within the Frankish encampment outside of Constantinople, not all of the French nobles and bishops agreed with their king. By now, it was common knowledge that Manuel had forged a peace with the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, and this appeared as treachery to many of the crusaders. Many of the French felt certain that Manuel intended to betray them and tried to persuade King Louis VII to launch an attack on Constantinople itself, arguing that the capture of the Byzantine Empire would position the Crusaders to better aid the Holy Land. However, historian Thomas Madden notes that Louis absolutely refused to entertain the idea of turning his army against a Christian empire. Manuel's spies kept him informed of the debate among the French, and so the emperor exerted pressure on the crusaders to cross the Bosporus, squeezing the flow of supplies, spreading false rumors that the Germans were scoring great victories in Asia Minor, and quickly assembling a fleet to provide transport. Louis agreed with the emperor, and between October 16 and 17, the French army was ferried over to Asia, safely away from the Byzantine capital. Now, Manuel sent messengers to Louis about an agreement of homage, which further agitated the French nobles. Ultimately, a pact was signed. Jonathan Riley Smith summarizes the agreement. The Crusaders made homage and promised not to take any place under imperial jurisdiction. In return, they were promised guides and supplies, and the Greeks recognized that they would have to plunder where provisions were not made available. However, Manuel refused to provide a Byzantine contingent to join in the crusade. On October 26, the French reached Nicaea, where they met Conrad III and German survivors fleeing from the disastrous Battle of Dorylaeum. This was a sobering moment for Louis' troops, who had been led to believe by Manuel that Conrad had scored a major victory over the Turks. From that moment on, according to Christopher Tyreman, the French campaign never lost a sense of crisis. Joining with the depleted rump of the German army, the French pressed on the road south. Thomas Madden writes, For obvious reasons, the rulers decided not to venture into central Anatolia again. Instead, they made preparations to march along the Aegean and Mediterranean coasts of Asia Minor, thus remaining in Byzantine territory as long as possible. As they pressed on to Smyrna, the Crusaders found the local Greeks unwilling or unable to provide markets, and so the army was forced to forage for food. 
This provoked more clashes with locals, and indeed, the exhausted, battle-scarred German survivors still trickling in to join Louis's army experienced attacks by some local forces. Thomas Madden notes, Rumors spread quickly that Manuel was attempting to weaken the crusade so that it could be crushed by his friends, the Turks. Lack of supplies was a major concern, especially with winter approaching. The cracks in Louis' discipline only widened as many contingents looked to their regional lords primarily for guidance. Unlike the commanders of the First Crusade, Louis was unable to maintain consistent cohesion during the march. Different units became widely separated from one another. Desertions became increasingly common as soldiers abandoned the march to seek out ships bound for the west. At Ephesus, the Crusaders met Greek ambassadors warning of a large Turkish army preparing to attack the French if they continued their march. The emperor himself, said the ambassadors, advised Louis and his troops to hunker down for the winter within Byzantine castles. This was useful advice, but as Christopher Tyreman notes, such intelligence hardly compensated for what later struck some crusade veterans as Manuel's highly cynical policy. He had failed to provide an adequate flow of provisions or a large enough shadowing fleet to succor or transport the western host. Even if impotent to keep Turkish incursions down the valleys of Western Asia Minor from attacking the French, Manuel failed to encourage local Greek officials or citizens to show hospitality, welcome, or open markets. With the German army destroyed, Manuel's policy appeared less nervous and thus less supportive, his alliance with Louis now redundant. While not wishing the Crusaders ill, Manuel no longer needed to appear to promote their interests, especially if they endangered his own in Anatolia or northern Syria. Tyreman goes on. So, when Conrad fell ill at Ephesus, Manuel saw the chance to reverse his diplomacy, abandon the French to their fate, good or ill, and reconstitute the Byzantine-German alliance against Roger of Sicily. Whisking Conrad off to Constantinople by sea, Manuel personally tended to the invalid amidst generous hospitality that the German king must have contrasted with the dry, forbidding welcome he had received at Constantinople only three months before. Then he commanded one of the largest fighting forces ever sent from Western Europe. Now he returned a sick old man, nursing wounds to body, spirit, and reputation, only too grateful for any comfort offered. And so, the German Emperor, Conrad III, departed via a Byzantine ship for Constantinople to recover from his illness under the care of Manuel Comnenus. Meanwhile, Louis VII led the Crusader army onward, swinging inland from Ephesus, heading east over the Meander Valley. The Christian host was in for a lengthy, grueling slog of over 200 miles across rugged landscapes. Their destination was Adelia, a port on the southern shore of Asia Minor. From there, they could reach Cilicia, ruled by the Armenian Christians. Lacking the support of a Byzantine fleet, this direct overland march seemed like the logical course. However, it would expose the Christian troops to Turkish attack. As it turned out, the march was brutal. Turkish cavalry forces tracked the French column every step of the way and launched an attack on Christmas Eve when the Crusaders were encamped outside of Ephesus. In this minor engagement, the Crusaders successfully repelled the Seljuk forces. However, the Turks continued to track the progress of the Crusaders. David Nicole writes, Louis carefully arranged his line of march with well-armed knights in the front, rear, and flanks, while the vulnerable baggage train and the wounded remained in the center. They reached the treacherous Meander River Valley. Here, the Crusaders would have to ford the river, and here, the Sultan Mesud I of Rum had set his trap.
Mesud divided his host, concealing the first part of the army on one side of the meander, where it could attack the Christian rearguard as it approached the river. Meanwhile, on the opposite bank of the river, the second part of Mesud's army would block the advance of the Christians and attack them as they attempted to ford the waters. The Christians approached the river only to find the Seljuk army arrayed before them on the opposite bank. Thus, on January 1st, 1148, began the first major engagement between Louis' army and the army of the Seljuk Sultan of Rum, the Battle of the Meander River. Initially, everything worked according to Mesud's plan. As the Christian vanguard approached the river, they faced a hail of Turkish arrows, while their rearguard was suddenly attacked by the 1st Division of Mesud's army. However, the Crusaders managed to secure a ford, and Mesud's cavalry wasn't able to retreat in time. William of Tyre recounts the battle. At last they found the fords, and despite the enemy's efforts, forced a passage across the river and rushed upon the Turks. They killed many of them and took numerous prisoners. The rest turned and fled. The victorious Franks at once seized the Turkish camp, which was filled with spoils of the richest kind and supplies of every description, and by vigorous action made themselves masters of the farther bank. Crucially, the Frankish knights were able to engage closely before the Turks could retreat. As David Nicole writes, the attacker's withdrawal was too slow, and they were hit by a counter charge, driving the enemy back with substantial losses. This victory boosted spirits in Louis' army and alleviated some of their supply problems. Although Mesud's army had suffered serious casualties and the loss of their camp, the Turkish forces remained intact and were fully capable of regrouping and attacking again. The Crusaders reached Laodicea on January 3rd, a region where Byzantine control was tenuous, and many believed the local governor was in league with the Seljuk Turks. Now, the Christians faced their most daunting challenge, the enormous mountain of Cadmus. Louis tried to maintain a sound marching order, for this is what had afforded him the victory at the Battle of the Meander River. Most of the cavalry marched with the vanguard, while the baggage was in the center, and King Louis himself commanded the rearguard. On January 8, as the Christian host struggled to surmount the treacherous path over Mount Cadmus, Queen Eleanor's vassal, Joffrey of Ronson, commanded the vanguard. At some point, the vanguard became separated from the rest of the army. Joffrey pressed ahead, searching for a suitable campground, either ignoring or being unaware of orders to halt and wait for the rest of the army on the crest. Meanwhile, the rear guard paused to guard the foot of the pass, intending to march on the next day. This left the vulnerable and cumbersome baggage train almost unguarded as it moved over the mountain. Sultan Mesud seized this opportunity. Occupying the crest of the pass, Mesud dispatched forces to assail the Christian baggage train, which was strung out to almost 10 kilometers on the treacherous mountain path. Louis' chaplain, Odo, was with the baggage train when the Turks initially struck. Panic spread across the center column. Odo galloped to the rear guard under King Louis. When Louis realized what was happening, he at once rushed forward with his royal guard. But the steep terrain made it difficult for his horsemen to operate effectively. Fierce fighting followed. Louis's personal courage in the moment is admirable. Accompanied only by his household knights, the king managed to protect his infantry and non-combatants by charging the enemy. Most of the king's royal guard were killed at his side. Louis himself was nearly captured, and Odo provides a now famous account of the king's narrow escape. During this engagement, the king lost his small but renowned royal guard. Keeping a stout heart, however, he nimbly and bravely scaled a rock by making use of some tree roots. The enemy climbed after in order to capture him, and the most distant rabble showered arrows at him, 
But the king's armor protected him from the arrows, and to keep from being captured, he defended the Craig with his bloody sword, cutting off the heads and hands of many opponents in the process. Since they did not recognize him and felt that he would be difficult to capture, the enemy thereupon turned back to collect the spoils before nightfall. In this case, Louis's unkingly appearance may have saved him. Under cover of night, the king, along with other stragglers, managed to regroup with the vanguard, which had returned to help defend the baggage column toward the end of the battle. The Turks had won a brilliant victory and inflicted enormous casualties on the Crusader army. However, the dogged fighting spirit of the Christians had averted total annihilation. The army remained intact, more than could be said for Conrad III and his forces. The French had suffered a defeat at the Battle of Mount Cadmus, but they had survived. Massoud I had shown himself a very effective general. Despite the setback at the Meander River, he'd picked the perfect location for his next attack and inflicted a serious defeat on his enemy. His victory at Mount Cadmus was as important as his earlier victory against the Germans at Dori Laim. To avoid another disaster, Louis placed command of the army with the Knights Templar, led by their Grand Master, Everard de Bar. Over the course of the march, Louis had come to rely on the advice of the Templars, so now, in this moment of crisis, he naturally turned to them. Everard divided the army into units of 50, each subject to an individual Templar, each of which was subject to a general commander named Brother Gilbert. This new arrangement proved effective, though the army was already badly reduced after the defeat at Mount Cadmus. The Turks adopted a scorched earth policy so that the land was all but devoid of plunder. By the time the Crusader army reached Adelia on January 20, it was hungry and exhausted. At this point, they found a Byzantine fleet too small to transport the whole of the Frankish host. To secure the basic food needed for survival, Louis had to again swear an oath of loyalty to Manuel before the local Byzantine governor. There were only enough ships to transport the king and the knightly elite of the army. Initially, Louis insisted that he would march on with the bulk of the army via the land route. But the upper ranks objected to this, insisting that the king must make all haste to the Holy Land with the army's best fighting units. Shamefully, King Louis allowed himself to be persuaded by these arguments. A general who separates himself from his troops does more damage to his cause than his enemy. Louis did just that. Boarding the Byzantine ships along with the other knights and upper ranks of the French host, the king left the bulk of the infantry and non-combatants to carry on overland. It's not known how many of these people ever made it to Antioch. Some of them didn't even try, electing to remain in Adelia. Some took service with the local Byzantine garrison. Some, according to the chaplain Odo, even took service with the Sultan of Rum, who did not require them to renounce Christianity. Of those that did attempt to march overland, many fell in the hills to the arrows of Turkish horsemen. Only a very few finally made it to Antioch. Years later, Richard the Lionheart would avoid all these problems by carefully contracting and organizing his own fleet for the journey to the Holy Land. Louis here was at the mercy of forces beyond his control. After surviving the brutal march across Asia Minor, his army was ultimately broken up by poor logistics. News of the victories of the Sultan of Rum spread throughout the Muslim world. The Zengid chronicler Ibn al-Athir provides a good sense of how the Muslim world perceived the initial stages of the crusade. This year, the king of the Germans came from his lands with a great host and a large following of Franks aiming to attack Islamic territory and not doubting that he would conquer it with the easiest of fighting because of the great multitude of his following and the abundance of his money and equipment. 
In Damascus, word of the defeat of the French and German armies in Asia Minor bolstered the confidence of the Muslim population. One chronicler from Damascus noted that this news convinced the Damascenes that the invasion of the Franks would fail. Jonathan Riley Smith writes, it must be stressed that although for most of his march, Louis had been leading his army through a region supposedly under Byzantine control, it had received little support from the population, the government, or its officers, and the survivors can only have remembered the frustration and broken promises. A recent historical judgment is that Manuel's fear of the French was so great that he connived at their destruction. The French had been distrustful of the Byzantines before they had left France, their experiences in the Balkans and Asia Minor had borne out the complaints of their predecessors and left them with an abiding bitterness. Meanwhile, in Damascus, spirits were bolstered by news of the victories of Sultan Mesud over the Crusaders in Asia Minor. The Damascus chronicler Ibn al-Kalanisi records, Fresh reports of their losses and the destruction of their numbers were constantly arriving until the end of the year, with the result that men were restored to some degree of tranquility of mind and began to gain some confidence in the failure of their enterprise, and their former distress and fear were alleviated in spite of the repeated reports of the activities of the Franks. After a three-day voyage, Louis, Eleanor, and the other high-ranking French reached the port of St. Simeon in the Principality of Antioch on March 19, 1148. At last, the king had arrived in the Crusader States. For months, the Latin Christians of the Crusader States had waited patiently for the arrival of vast reinforcements under the rulers of France and Germany. Instead, Louis VII and a remnant of his great army showed up at Antioch in the spring of 1148. The bulk of the crusading forces, both French and German, had either deserted or perished in Asia Minor. King Louis and Queen Eleanor were welcomed by the ruler of the Principality of Antioch, Raymond of Poitiers. Raymond was a most gracious host to the king and queen, showing them every hospitality. Raymond was eager to secure the aid of the King of France in extending his own frontier to the east. And so, he was motivated to make the king and his entourage feel particularly welcome. Queen Eleanor was delighted by the lavish social life at Antioch. Raymond was Eleanor's uncle, and his court, abounding in music and color, reminded Eleanor of her beloved Aquitaine. Later, Eleanor's political enemies would claim that she'd broken her marriage vows at Antioch by engaging in illicit affairs, but there's no evidence to support this. What inspired later French chroniclers to heap her with so much slander was the fact that she and Louis would ultimately divorce and Eleanor would marry Henry II of England, thus empowering the great rival of the King of France. In reality, all evidence indicates that Eleanor simply relished the poetry and lively social occasions at Antioch. The idea that Queen Eleanor, constantly surrounded by her ladies, royal guards, and other attendants, would have had occasion to engage in adultery is itself rather fanciful and says more about modern fantasies than medieval realities. Antioch was a splendid and wealthy city. One wonders if Louis felt any guilt at abandoning his men to continue the dangerous march overland while he relaxed amid Antioch's luxuries. Together, Louis and Raymond discussed the next move for the crusade. Edessa had been demolished by Nur ad-Din and was no longer a viable goal. But, Raymond explained, the Zengids were now entrenched in civil conflict. Nur ad-Din, ruler of Aleppo, was quarreling with his brother Saif ad-Din, prince of Mosul. Now was the perfect time for the crusaders to launch a campaign to conquer the strategically crucial city of Aleppo. Raymond and Louis were very different men. Raymond was tall, handsome, and dashing, a natural military man steeped in the chivalric ideals of Aquitaine. Louis was pious, austere, and withdrawn. There is a popular idea that clash of personalities explains why Louis declined to join Raymond in a campaign against Aleppo. 
But Christopher Tyerman points out that strategic realities most likely determined Louis's decision. Louis had a substantial force of knights with him, but he'd abandoned his infantry and support staff in Asia Minor. Such forces would have been essential to reduce a stronghold like Aleppo. Meanwhile, the king knew that fresh crusader forces were currently arriving by sea farther south at the ports of Tyre and Acre in the kingdom of Jerusalem. Essentially, Louis would have to go to where the troops were. He would have to go to the kingdom of Jerusalem, in effect, to rebuild his army. This accorded with Louis's personal preferences. As a pious man, he was deeply interested in visiting the holy city. Thus, it's no surprise that Louis announced he would depart for Jerusalem with his forces. This is where tensions erupted between the king and queen. Raymond made his case to his niece, and Eleanor wanted to support her relative. Eleanor went so far as to proclaim that unless Louis joined her uncle's campaign, she would seek an annulment of their marriage. This was only the first great rupture in what had been a long simmering discontent between Louis and Eleanor. Louis worshipped his beautiful, extravagant wife, but the queen found her monkish, drab husband unappealing. But even this outburst was too much for the mild Louis to tolerate. He placed the queen under house arrest and departed Antioch for Palestine. By the time Louis reached Jerusalem, Conrad, recovered from his illness, was already there as well. With Conrad was a substantial army of fresh mercenaries. Crusaders arriving from Provence, as well as veterans from the conquest of Lisbon, were showing up by ship around this time as well. Combined with the local forces of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Crusade's strength was greatly replenished. Christopher Tyerman argues that Despite the distractions, defeats, desertions, and high casualties, the Western forces that gathered in Outremer in the spring of 1148 constituted easily the largest Christian army to arrive in Outremer since 1097 through 1099, that is, since the First Crusade. However, this may still have been a fairly small army. Historians Emily Babcock and A.C. Cray argue that the army that besieged Damascus was not a very large one, probably no larger than the one which had attempted the same task 20 years before. Here, Babcock and Cray are referencing Baldwin II's army that besieged Damascus in 1129, which contained around 2,000 knights and 10,000 infantry. Interestingly, this is about the size of the army of the First Crusade when it besieged Jerusalem in 1099. It contained about 13,000 men in total. This gives us a good idea of the size of the army that assembled in Jerusalem in the summer of 1148. On June 24, 1148, Louis and Conrad joined the teenage King Baldwin III of Jerusalem and his mother, Queen Melisande, for a council to discuss the Crusades' next move. Most of the magnates of Jerusalem endorsed a campaign against Damascus, the Emir Unar of Damascus had formerly been an ally to the Kingdom of Jerusalem, but recently Unar had opted to forge an alliance with Nur ad-Din of Aleppo instead. In fact, Nur ad-Din had recently married Unar's daughter. It made sense to try and prevent the powerful Zengids from bringing Damascus fully under their control. The conquest of Damascus would solidify Frankish power in southern Syria and northern Palestine. It would provide the Kingdom of Jerusalem with the natural frontier of the Eastern Desert and effectively split the Muslim world in two, cutting off Egypt from Zengid Syria. Louis and Conrad were convinced. Damascus would be the next target of the Second Crusade. In hindsight, many commentators have criticized the decision to besiege Damascus. Some today still mistakenly believe that the Crusaders were attacking an ally. But the alliance between Damascus and Jerusalem had already collapsed, and the Emir Unar of Damascus had struck a new alliance with Nur ad-Din. But opinions were divided within Damascus, and powerful figures within the city remained hostile to the Zengids. The Templars and other leading figures in the Kingdom of Jerusalem may have had contact with treacherous elements within the city, and this may be why they felt that Damascus could be taken quickly. 
it made sense to try and capitalize on the discord within Damascus before the city was brought firmly under the control of the powerful Zengid dynasty. Meanwhile, the Emir Unar of Damascus prepared for war. Rumors had been circulating since the spring that the crusade would likely be directed against Damascus, and so he had considerable time to prepare. He summoned local Arab tribes to join with his own army and alerted the governors of frontier provinces. He also posted scouts on the roads to Damascus and dispatched men to cut off or divert water supplies on the route that would be taken by the crusaders. Most importantly, he secured the help of the Zengid rulers Saif ad-Din and Nur ad-Din who put aside their civil conflict and organized their Askar troops and armies within days of receiving Unar's appeal. Everything about the planning for the attack on Damascus indicates that the Crusaders anticipated a rapid campaign. They believed that the city would either surrender quickly or be overwhelmed by a swift assault. The Christian army, led by Louis VII of France, Conrad III of Germany, and Baldwin III of Jerusalem mustered at Tiberias in mid-July, uniting around the relic of the True Cross, the kingdom's most prized standard. They then struck out for Damascus, arriving before the city on the 24th. The Christians approached the city from the west, where grew immense orchards watered by the Barada River. These orchards were useful both defensively and as a source of provisions for the army. Plus, the river would provide the besieging forces with abundant water. Initially, the local forces of Damascus tried to hold the orchards, but the Crusaders attacked and pushed them out. The city's cavalry forces now made a stand at the Barada River, but the Christians attacked under the leadership of Conrad III. The German knights fought in a tight formation on foot, drove the Muslim forces back, and secured control of the Barada River. The Christians were now well positioned to launch an assault, but after two days of attacks, the city did not fall. News arrived that both Nur ad-Din and his brother Saif ad-Din were approaching with their armies for the relief of Damascus. William of Tyre claims that, at this point, the Crusaders moved their camp to the eastern side of the city, since the defensive walls here were weaker. However, Emily Babcock and A.C. Cray point out that William of Tyre was writing much later and was not a witness to these events. Ibn al Kalanisi, the Damascus chronicler, was present in the city at the time, and his account is the best and most accurate for the siege, and he does not describe the Crusaders shifting the location of their camp. Babcock and Cray explain None of the Arab writers mention such a shift of the Christian camp. Kalanisi, the best authority on the siege, gives a day by day description of the battles from Saturday to Thursday with a statement of the location. According to him, the Christians remained in the same general area until the day they withdrew from the siege entirely. On the fourth day of the siege, the Crusaders found themselves dealing with increasingly stiff resistance. Babcock and Cray note that Muslims summoned by letter were arriving in constantly increasing numbers. The Crusaders had gambled on a quick conquest, but resistance within Damascus had proved more stubborn than expected. Ultimately, the approach of Nur ad-Din and Saif ad-Din with large Zingid armies left the Crusaders with no option but to withdraw. After only a four-day siege, the Christian army retreated in good order at dawn on July 28 back to Jerusalem. Given the circumstance, the Christian leaders had no other option. To remain would have risked annihilation. The siege of Damascus had failed. Although the Crusader forces remained intact, they nevertheless achieved nothing. Once the Christian army returned to Jerusalem, the Crusade at last unraveled. Conrad departed on September 8, sailing for Thessalonica and then arriving again in Constantinople. Once more, the German Emperor was entertained by the Byzantine Emperor. Now fully reconciled, Conrad and Emmanuel discussed plans to once and for all destroy their mutual enemy, Roger II of Sicily.
Louis VII remained in Palestine until Easter of 1149. From France, Abbot Suger kept writing to his king, asking him to return. But Louis was determined to remain in the Holy Land until he could at least do some good for the Crusader kingdom. Eleanor was kept under armed guard, but she was now determined to end her marriage as soon as she was back in Europe. Indeed, this is part of what kept the French party in Palestine, for Louis hoped to convince his wife not to seek an annulment before they sailed home. It's clear from his correspondence that Louis was convinced that the Byzantine emperor, Manuel Comnenus, had played a key role in the failure of the Second Crusade. In fact, when the king was returning home on Sicilian ships, he was detained by a Byzantine fleet. The Byzantines very nearly arrested Louis himself. Eleanor of Aquitaine, traveling on other ships, was also detained for a time by the Byzantine navy. By the time Louis arrived in Italy, his experience over the past two years had brought him around to the view of Roger II of Sicily. The two monarchs began to discuss a new crusade, this time directed against the Byzantines. The failure before Damascus brought an end to the Second Crusade in the Eastern Levant. When the Christian coalition returned to Jerusalem, there was a brief discussion about launching a campaign to take Ascalon. Conrad III waited, but few agreed to participate in another offensive. After a week, the German emperor departed for the west, harboring bitter feelings toward the nobility of the Latin East. Having led the largest army, Conrad had lost the most during the crusade. His nephew, Frederick, the future Frederick Barbarossa, had been with him throughout the long, horrific experience, and as future events would reveal, took many lessons from it. Frederick, one day, as emperor himself, would lead his own crusade, and his march across Anatolia would be impeccable. Indeed, in 1190, during the Third Crusade, Frederick Barbarossa would crush the Seljuk Turks on the battlefield numerous times, and then dictate terms to them after capturing their capital city of Iconium. Frederick wasn't alone in taking valuable lessons from the experience. Second Crusade had very much been Bernard of Clairvaux's project, and he'd emphasized the role of God's providence. Future crusaders like Barbarossa and Richard the Lionheart would tend to the spiritual side of the campaign, but would be particularly meticulous in seeing to the organization of their armies, making arrangements for supplies and maintaining their independence from rulers encountered along the way. Barbarossa was particularly wary of the Byzantines, and during his crusade he would face outright treachery from a collapsing Byzantine regime. But in Barbarossa's case, it wouldn't matter very much, for his well-oiled, powerful army would dominate the Byzantines easily. Conrad's brother, the Bishop Otto of Freising, tried to see a silver lining in the whole miserable experience, recalling, Although it was not good for the enlargement of boundaries or for the advantage of bodies, yet it was good for the salvation of souls. Although a failed crusader, Louis VII returned to the West with his reputation enhanced. In a society in which crusading had become the ideal, the king was admired for having taken up God's work in the Holy Land, suffering along with Christ in Palestine. His authority as king was magnified as well as was his relationship with the princely houses of Champagne and Flanders. In 1150, Louis even discussed launching another crusade to aid the East, but this came to nothing. As an old man, the king was often heard to swear by the saints of Bethlehem. Across Christendom, there was much sorrow over the outcome of the Holy Land campaign. Even in the Iberian Peninsula, where the crusade had been a universal success, many were saddened by the terrible defeats suffered in the East. Some churchmen criticized the enterprise, accusing its leaders of arrogance, immorality, and rapacity. But were men like Louis VII and Conrad III less morally upright than the heroes of the First Crusade? Pope Eugenius III stated that the failure in the East had caused, quote, the most severe injury of the Christian name that God's church has suffered in our time. A later pope, Hadrian IV, probably got to the heart of the matter when he criticized Louis VII for undertaking the crusade, quote, with little caution. If Louis VII and Conrad III were guilty of anything, it was failing to plan exhaustively. They organized large, splendid armies, but failed to take steps toward maintaining discipline and unity, or toward ensuring the steady flow of supplies. Both rulers had to rely on Manuel Comnenus, who proved to be a poor ally. 
Later, Richard the Lionheart and Frederick Barbarossa would both lay out meticulous codes of conduct for their armies and then enforce them strictly. In Richard's case, he organized and controlled his own fleet. Both men exercised such effective leadership over their armies that they were capable of subduing questionable allies in Sicily or in Byzantium, and Richard even conquered his own supply base at Cyprus. It's hard to imagine either Louis or Conrad showing such resourcefulness. Bernard of Clairvaux came under particular criticism, though his reputation for holiness remained intact. The saint issued a defense of he and the Pope's crusade policy, De Consideracione, between 1149 and 1152. Not surprisingly, Bernard pointed to sin as the main cause of the crusade's failure, but he also acknowledged the finality of divine judgment, impenetrable to the minds of men. He compared the whole affair to the disobedient Hebrews of the Old Testament wandering in the wilderness, casting himself and Pope Eugenius as Aaron and Moses, doing God's work however difficult. I would rather that men murmur against us than against God, wrote the abbot. It would be well for me if he deigns to use me for his shield. Otto of Freising points out that the memory of the Eastern Campaign lingered long throughout Christendom and cooled enthusiasm for Holy Land Crusades for at least a generation. He wrote, So great was the disaster of the army and so inexpressible the misery that those who took part bemoan it with tears to this very day. Although there would not be another major crusade launched to the east until Jerusalem itself fell in 1187, the Holy Land continued to concern the West Christian rulers. Popes continued to call for new crusades, though the response from the 1150s through the early 1180s was generally tepid. Louis VII and Henry II of England would raise substantial funds to be sent to the Kingdom of Jerusalem. In truth, however, the Crusader states did not enter a period of decline. Although the county of Edessa had been lost, the Kingdom of Jerusalem grew in strength and wealth, conquering Ashkelon in 1153. New castles were raised on the frontier, in part from funds provided by the monarchs of France and England. The Templars and Hospitallers continued to attract large endowments and deployed increasingly strong military forces in Palestine. By 1170, the Latin East was flourishing and holding its own against the challenge of its powerful neighbors. Crusading continued to evolve and become more prominent on the northern front as well as in the Iberian Peninsula. The rulers of Spain and Portugal established their own military orders, and Crusaders continued to join the Iberian kings in their regular campaigns against the Moors. The Second Crusade produced wildly mixed results, but as a whole, it provides a striking picture of Latin Christendom in the middle of the 12th century. Here was a civilization undeniably on the rise. Now, the increasingly wealthy, well-equipped kings of France and Germany were leading substantial offensives into the seats of empire in the East. The Second Crusade also demonstrates the increasing religious unity of Latin Europe. The religious unity amounted in many ways to a certain political unity, expressing itself in an almost continent-wide joint enterprise. From Portugal to the Slavic Northeast, Italy to England, the Christian world took up the same cause, France and Germany acting in concert. Divisions still existed, and wars within Latin Christendom would remain a regular reality, but the unity of the Second Crusade is remarkable, and in some ways is the product of the triumphant First Crusade. The First Crusade had also brought Latin Christendom together. This would continue through the High Middle Ages, throughout the Age of Crusading. Eleven eighty seven proved to be one of the most critical years in the history of the Crusades. In July, Saladin, ruler of Egypt and Syria, defeated the army of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem at the Battle of Hattin. Saladin next conquered Jerusalem itself, as well as virtually all the other cities and castles in the Christian Kingdom. Back in Europe, this sent shockwaves throughout Latin Christendom. In response, Pope Gregory VIII issued Audita Tremendi, an eloquent document calling on Christendom to take up arms to recover the Kingdom of Jerusalem. The Third Crusade had begun. Pope Gregory's call resonated throughout Christian Europe. For decades, the rulers of Latin Christendom had largely ignored calls for help from their crusading brethren in the East. 
Now, with Jerusalem fallen, the Latin world swung into action. Pope Gregory called for a seven-year truce throughout Christendom so that the rulers could focus on recovering the Holy Land. He also called on all Christians to do penance for their sins, for he insisted that only through sin had Jerusalem been lost. The Pope knew that France was vital to the success of any crusade, and so he at once set to work on securing peace between the King of France, Philip II, and Henry II, King of England and ruler of the vast Angevin Empire, which included Normandy, Anjou, and other portions of modern France. In January 1188, Henry and Philip met at their traditional conference site on the borders of Normandy. Here, the Bishop of Tyre preached powerfully to the two monarchs about the need for a new crusade. The bishop's words deeply moved the crowd, and suddenly, the ancient feuding of the two kings seemed meaningless compared to the plight of the Holy Land. Philip and Henry agreed to a peace. On the 21st, both rulers took the cross, that is, vowed to lead their armies in crusade. However, Henry's son, the courageous Richard the Lionheart, had already vowed to join the crusade back in November at Tours within hours of receiving news of the fall of Jerusalem. Henry later chided his son for taking the cross without his permission, but Richard's example inspired thousands of others. Throughout France and England, men were taking the cross. The first major power to depart for the East was the Holy Roman Empire led by Frederick Barbarossa. The Imperial Army set out for the East in April, 1189. Barbarossa's crusade is one of the most pivotal episodes in the larger Third Crusade. Although he is nearly 70 years old, Frederick still is an energetic ruler. His long and successful reign has gained him great power across Germany, and he is now eager to crown his career with a campaign to recapture the Holy Land However, Frederick is no naive crusader. As a young man, he fought under Conrad III of Germany, who led an army to the east during the Second Crusade. Frederick well remembers the problems experienced by Conrad's army. Above all, Frederick recalls the dangerous journey across Asia Minor, where the Seljuk Turks had brutally defeated Conrad's knights in 1147. Frederick is eager to avoid Conrad's mistakes and intends to meticulously organize his army for the long campaign. He dispatches envoys to secure safe passage in the lands through which his army must pass on its journey. Frederick exchanges envoys with the Byzantine Empire. Envoys from the Byzantine Emperor, Isaac Angelus, assure Frederick that the German army will be permitted to safely move through Byzantine territory. However, in truth, Isaac views Frederick as an enemy. Recently, Frederick had forged an alliance with the Normans of Sicily, an avowed enemy of Byzantium. Furthermore, Isaac is terrified by the notion of a large German army moving through his territory, where it could do immense damage. Ultimately, Isaac believes Frederick's crusade is a fraud, and that the German ruler intends nothing less than the conquest of Constantinople itself. Although he's confirmed a peace with Frederick, Isaac contacts the target of the crusade, Saladin, and the two confirm a treaty. Isaac promises Saladin that he will do all that he can to inhibit the German army as it crosses the Byzantine Empire. In addition, Frederick exchanges envoys with another major power that controls part of his route the Seljuk Turks, who rule much of eastern Anatolia. The Seljuk Sultan also agrees to friendship with Frederick, promising that the German crusaders will be able to pass peacefully through Seljuk territory. Having taken care of diplomatic matters, Frederick Barbarossa departs from Regensburg on May 11, 1189, at the head of the largest crusader army ever to set out for the east. Marching with him is his son, Frederick, the Duke of Swabia, and most of the important German nobility. It's a momentous event, the crowning achievement of a long and triumphant reign. As the great crusader host passes through the towns of Germany, the citizens cheer, 
Many feel certain that such a tremendous force, led by so wise an emperor, will succeed in retaking the Holy Land. Frederick's march proves to be a model of discipline. Historian Christopher Tyerman states, in sharp contrast to Louis VII's ordinances for his crusade army in 1147, Frederick's were enforced. Loudish behavior led to the loss of hands, theft to execution. Such harsh discipline was coupled with a constant emphasis on the pious nature of the operation. The general effect on morale and military effectiveness stood in marked contrast to the shambles into which Conrad III's army had descended in Asia Minor in the autumn of 1147. Frederick and his army passed through Hungary, where King Bela III and his wife Queen Margaret, a daughter of King Louis VII of France, welcomed them. The Hungarians provide lodging, supplies, and markets for the Crusaders. After a comfortable stay in Hungary, the Germans enter into Byzantine territory on July 2nd. Almost immediately, they are harassed by armed bands. At Nish, Frederick encounters Serbian rebels who ask the Germans to join them in an uprising against the Byzantines. Frederick refuses, stating that his mission is to liberate the Holy Land, not to fight with other Christians. However, as the march continues, ambushes from local forces intensify. Increasingly, the journey resembles a fighting march. The Germans capture some of their attackers, who, before being hanged, claim that they are acting on the instructions of the Byzantine Emperor. When they reach Sophia on August 13, the Crusaders find that Isaac's promised markets have been withdrawn. After fighting their way through the mountains, the Crusaders reach Philippopolis, which has been abandoned by its Byzantine defenders, its fortifications dismantled on Isaac's orders. More than a decade before 1204, the Byzantines are already displaying remarkable confusion and impotence under Isaac's rule. As the Crusaders enter the abandoned Philippopolis, Frederick learns that his envoys at the Byzantine court have been thrown into prison. He also receives tactless communications from Isaac, demanding hostages to guarantee good behavior from the Germans and a share of future conquests. Isaac's refusal to afford Frederick his proper title in this correspondence is the icing on the cake. The Holy Roman Emperor is in no mood to negotiate especially since it's becoming increasingly clear that he has the military advantage. He responds angrily to Isaac's message, demanding that his envoys be released and that the Byzantines provide peaceful passage to the Crusader army. Isaac releases the envoys, but shows fickleness in making any agreement of peaceful relations. Meanwhile, Frederick's troops occupy Philippopolis and the surrounding territory, securing food and markets through their own prowess. Frederick settles on a strategy to force the Byzantines to cooperate. Isaac Angelus is an understandably nervous ruler. He came to power in a particularly bloody coup, and he himself remains fearful of insurrection. He worries that the very presence of the German army may spark rebellion among already restive regions. Despite Isaac's paranoia, Historians today find little evidence to justify the idea that Barbarossa had prior designs on the Byzantine Empire. Christopher Tyerman states, Frederick kept his eyes fixed firmly on the goal of the Holy Land and Jerusalem. He saw himself as a knight of Christ, bound to avenge the events of 1187, not an indiscriminate hammer of Islam or anybody else. Indeed, it's Isaac's own hostility toward Frederick that ultimately provokes German conquest of Byzantine territory. Frederick next captures Adrianople, which he establishes as a headquarters. He occupies Thrace and makes contact with rebels in the Balkans. At this point, Frederick appears to be seriously contemplating an attack on Constantinople. Byzantine forces seem powerless to oppose Frederick's garrisons and foragers. Increasingly panicked, Isaac again asks Frederick to negotiate, 
only to again abruptly end negotiations on Christmas Eve, just when a deal seems imminent. Isaac's military feebleness and diplomatic schizophrenia cause his policy to implode. The Byzantine chronicler, Nikitas Konyatis, disdainfully records Isaac's incompetence. Left with no choice, Isaac capitulates. In the end, Frederick proves remarkably lenient. On February 14, 1190, he confirms an agreement with Isaac that guarantees the Germans safe passage through the remainder of the empire, ships to carry them across the Hellespont at Gallipoli, and access to markets at reasonable rates. In return, Frederick promises to avoid Constantinople and withdraw from Byzantine territory. For all his bravado, Isaac Angelus has shown himself an impotent, weak ruler whose own paranoia brought on the very disaster he'd initially feared. Byzantine chronicler Nikitas Konyatis judges the whole affair as Isaac himself bringing ruin upon his own empire. The German army next departs Byzantine territory, and yet their greatest challenge awaits them in the lands of the Seljuk Turks. April 25, 1190, the German Crusaders at last enter into territory under the control of the Seljuk Turkish Sultan of Rum, Kili Arslan II. Previous agreements with the Sultan had produced promises of friendship, safe passage, and markets for the Crusaders in Seljuk territory. However, as in the Byzantine Empire, prior negotiated agreements proved worthless. Unbeknownst to the Crusaders, Kili Arslan's son, Qutb al-Din, the son-in-law of Saladin, has effectively usurped his father and is now preparing his forces to oppose the Germans. On May 7, near Philomelium, the Crusaders encounter a Turkish ambush. The Emperor's son, Frederick of Swabia, leads a counterattack that decisively repulses the Turks, who suffer heavy casualties. The Crusaders press on through the rugged terrain, beating back Turkoman raids and increasingly suffering from hunger. Despite these difficulties, the German forces struggle on and maintain incredible discipline. They fight their way to the city of Iconium, the capital of the Seljuk Turks. Although some of the leading men in the army want to press on, Barbarossa insists that they take the city rather than leave it as an enemy stronghold at their rear. On May 18, outside Iconium, the Crusaders come up against Qutb al-Din's main army. What follows is a pitched battle and the most formidable challenge yet faced by Frederick's crusade. The emperor divides his army in two, with his son, Duke Frederick, attacking the city, while the old emperor himself faces off against the Turkish army. Although the Turks outnumber the Christians, the German knights deliver a cavalry charge that shatters Qutb al-Din's divisions. The Turks are beaten and suffer casualties numbering in the thousands. Iconium falls to the Christian army, and the Germans pillage it at their leisure. It's a moment of incredible triumph. The Turks are utterly defeated, and Iconium yields immense booty to the Crusaders. Broken and humiliated, Qutb al-Din is removed from power and his father again resumes rule of the Sultanate. Kili Arslan II resumes his compliant policy toward Frederick, who agrees to a peace if his army is provided with Turkish hostages and supplies. The Sultan submits to these terms. Triumphant, the German crusaders march unopposed through Seljuk territory. Frederick Barbarossa and his army have just achieved something remarkable. They have completed the longest and most dangerous portions of the treacherous crossing through Asia Minor. Despite opposition from the two greatest powers in the region, the Byzantine Empire and the Seljuk Turks, Frederick's knights have crushed the Sultan's men in battle and sacked the Turkish capital. 
The German Crusaders, far from home, have utterly dominated two formidable enemies. This is no small achievement. The Second Crusade and the Crusade of 1101 were both badly defeated by the Turks of Asia Minor. Not since Bohemond and the First Crusade has a major Crusader army from overseas so triumphed over the Turks of Asia Minor. Frederick has done it. But Barbarossa's crusade is rarely remembered for this remarkable military operation, which is a model of discipline and ranks as one of the outstanding feats of the medieval era. How many armies so far from home could overcome two powerful enemies in succession on their home turf? Instead, it's subsequent and rather random events that have come to define Frederick's crusade in the popular imagination. Some weeks later, the German crusaders march into the friendly territory of Christian Armenia. There, on June 10, as the army is crossing the River Salaf, some unknown event takes place that ends the life of the great Holy Roman Emperor. What exactly happens? How exactly does the Emperor die? The sources disagree, so we aren't certain. Some accounts say that the army is crossing the river and the Emperor's horse trips and Frederick falls in. Other accounts state that some unknown accident takes place, causing the Emperor to fall. Other sources relate that the army has already laid camp and the Emperor goes down to bathe, but then is injured in some accident or episode. Some accounts say that after the Emperor is pulled from the water by his men, he lies ill in bed for 10 days before finally dying. Historians today still puzzle over the mystery and it seems likely that the elderly emperor could have suffered from a heart attack or a stroke. It's not surprising that a man of his age might be suffering from some latent medical condition that could manifest itself in sudden death. Regardless of what happens, Frederick dies, his followers are devastated. But contrary to popular belief, this tragedy does not lead to the disillusion of the crusade. The German army, fresh from its victories in Anatolia, is fully intact. They mourn their emperor, but they continue on under the capable leadership of Barbarossa's son, Frederick of Swabia, who's shown incredible skill during the operations against the Byzantines and the Turks. The crusaders continue on to Antioch. It is here that the German crusade finally breaks down, defeated not by Byzantines or Turks, but by disease. An epidemic breaks out in Antioch, which takes the lives of many members of the German army. At this point, some of the survivors return home, while some continue on to the Holy Land, under the Duke of Swabia. By October 1190, Frederick of Swabia arrives at the Siege of Acre with some 700 knights, from Acre, Frederick writes to his brother, the new Holy Roman Emperor, Henry VI, asking him to request papal recognition for the German hospital at the siege camp of Acre. Interestingly, it's this German hospital that gives birth to the Teutonic Knights, a German crusading order that will have a major role to play in the Northern Crusades. Frederick of Swabia himself dies of illness at Acre in early 1191. A much reduced German coalition continues to serve at Acre under the command of Duke Leopold of Austria. However, at this point, the German army has been so reduced in numbers by disease that it no longer plays a major role in the crusade. Rather, it's primarily the forces of Richard the Lionheart and Philip II of France that will wage the war against Saladin. Frederick's death is untimely and tragic, but we should not forget the remarkable victories of his campaign. The German army demonstrated incredible competence and skill over the course of the grueling war in Asia Minor. Historian G. A. Loud writes, while clearly suffering severely as it marched through Asia Minor, Frederick's army was far from being defeated there. Indeed, in capturing Iconium, and securing the submission of Kili Arslan, the emperor gained a significant military victory. 
And finally, it is not the Emperor's own death that spells doom for the German contingent. Without the epidemic at Antioch, the German army could have continued intact under the Emperor's son, a proven commander who had the loyalty of the German forces. Perhaps the best testament on Frederick's behalf comes from one of his enemies, the Byzantine chronicler Nikitas Konyatis, who despised his own emperor and yet had this to say about Frederick. He was a man who deserved to enjoy a blessed and perpetual memory. His burning passion for Christ was greater than that of any Christian monarch of his time. Following the example of the Apostle Paul, he did not count his life dear to him, but pressed forward even to die for the name of Christ. As it turned out, Henry II of England wouldn't live to crusade. In July 1189, he fell ill and died. His son, Richard, took the throne and at once launched into preparations for an expedition to Palestine. Meanwhile in the east, Guy of Lusignan, the titular king of Jerusalem, was a prisoner to Sultan Saladin. It was Guy who had lost the Battle of Hattin and thus brought on the total collapse of the crusader position in Palestine. But in June of 1188, Saladin agreed to grant the disgraced king his freedom so long as Guy took an oath never again to take up arms against the Sultan. Once he'd regained his freedom, Guy received absolution from his oath. With a small force under his command, Guy marched to Tyre, the last city still held by the Christians in Palestine. Guy expected to be welcomed as king into Tyre, but he was sorely disappointed. Tyre was held by Conrad of Montferrand, a gifted commander from the west who had saved the city from Saladin. Tyre was filled with Christian refugees who looked to Conrad to lead and protect them. Conrad refused to admit Guy or even recognize him as king. From Conrad's perspective, Guy's kingship was nullified by his failure at Hattin. For months, Guy, now a king without a kingdom, had to make camp outside of Tyre. During this period, crusaders began to show up from Europe, eager to join the fight against Saladin. In August, a Pisan fleet arrived before Tyre, ready to follow Guy's lead. Now in command of a moderately sized army, Guy decided to act. Marching south, he laid siege to Acre, the most important port in Palestine, and one of Saladin's key bases. On August 28, Guy established his army on the low hill of Tyrone, a mile and a half east of Acre. Although Guy's force was small, this position allowed him to press the city quite closely and to maintain a view of the surrounding territory. Meanwhile, the Pisan fleet established a beachhead and attempted to blockade the harbor. To counter this bold move by the Christians, Saladin arrived with his vast army and established control of the countryside. The Sultan spread his troops throughout the hills, setting up base on Tel Qaisan, some five miles southeast of Acre. His forces extended all the way to the hill of Tel Ayadia to the right and to the river Na'aman to the left. Saladin had put the besiegers to siege. However, the very daring of Guy's attack made it effective. New crusaders arriving from the west rallied to Guy, now cast as the hero taking the fight to Saladin to recapture a key Christian city. Gradually, Guy's army grew and became more and more of a threat to Acre. Later, one Christian chronicler would write, this was the beginning of the deliverance of Christendom. However, Guy was far from capturing the prize port of Acre. Saladin had greatly strengthened the city's walls, and the garrison was strong and well supplied. Saladin's own army was so large that the Christians had to devote much time and energy to fortifying and guarding their own camp. Nevertheless, the Crusader army continued to grow. James of Avena, a prominent Flemish nobleman, arrived with his knights in September, as did a considerable Frisian and Danish fleet. That same month, Conrad of Montferrat was also obliged to join the besiegers. The growing strength of the Christian forces prompted the Crusades' leaders to plan a general assault for October 4th. 
The Muslim chronicler Ibn al-Athir describes this event, saying that the Christians emerged in a broad and unified formation. Guy himself led the attack, with four clerics marching ahead of him, bearing the Gospels. The battle that followed was long and bloody. The Knights Templar, led by their Grand Master, Gerard of Ridiford, charged Taqi al-Din's contingent on the Muslim right, causing them to retreat. This prompted Saladin to reinforce his right with troops from the center, which consequently weakened the Sultan's center formation. The Christians in the center now delivered a charge, which broke the reduced Muslim center. At this point, Crusader infantry and cavalry managed to penetrate the Muslim camp at Tel Ayadiyya. However, the Christian forces now became overextended. The Muslim garrison of Acre launched a sortie, which placed serious pressure on the Christian camp. Coordination among the various Christian contingents broke down, with some attempting to press the attack, while others fell back in an attempt to repel the Muslim sortie coming from Acre. Saladin now masterfully reorganized his faltering center, and in conjunction with his left and right, launched a counterattack that drove the Christians back toward their camp. The Templars, pressing the fight to the end, endured some of the heaviest casualties, among them their Grand Master, Gerard of Ridiford, who went down trying to protect the Christian rearguard as it retreated back into camp. Thus, the Crusaders endured a serious defeat at the start of the Siege of Acre. But despite Saladin's victory, the strategic situation wasn't much changed. The Christians, though pressed on both sides, still held on strong in their camp, and their army survived to continue the siege. Saladin, meanwhile, was still in a good position to harass the besiegers, though he still was unable to dislodge them. The battle for Acre would slog on, and would be the main focus of the Third Crusade for some time yet. In 1189, while a motley crusader army struggled to besiege Acre in the Holy Land, Richard the Lionheart, son of King Henry II of England, prepared to set out on crusade. A learned, articulate man, gifted in music and in poetry, Richard was also a top-notch warrior and commander. When he took the throne of England at age 32, he was at the height of his prowess, having proven himself an effective conqueror since his teens. Tall, with red-gold hair and fierce blue eyes, Richard led from the front, riding alongside his men into the heart of danger. His soldiers were intensely loyal to him. The Lionheart was a force to be reckoned with. Once crowned, Richard threw himself into preparing his crusade. He was a fervent Christian and felt obligated as a king to rescue the holy places in the East. He was also committed to the poetic ideals of his age, which prized crusading as the paramount expression of valor. In addition to the funds amassed from the Saladin tithe, Richard committed his personal wealth to the crusade. He sold many of his properties to fund his war chest. By this, Richard raised an immense fleet and army. His efficiency and effectiveness demonstrated strong administrative skills. Indeed, Richard's abilities as an organizer and planner, far more than his personal valor, were at the heart of his success. This was a ruler as equally at home at the head of his army as he was tending to the tedious labors of administration. Meanwhile, the King of France, Philip II, was nothing like Richard. At 25, Philip was slight and sickly, blind in one eye, and intensely jealous of Richard, who was, in theory, his vassal. Despite these shortcomings, Philip was a calculating and shrewd man, unscrupulous in seeking his interests, and obsessively committed to the victory of his Capetian line over the Plantagenets. Unlike Richard, Philip felt no higher calling to the crusade, but was pressured into joining the expedition as a result of the mood throughout Europe. His organization was half-hearted, and the force he produced poorly funded. In addition, Philip did not command the loyalty that Richard did, and his control over his vassals was always tenuous. Richard and Philip departed in July 1190, traveling by sea with their forces to the east. Both kings stopped in Sicily en route to the Holy Land. Here, tensions flared up between Richard and Tancred, the island's ruler. Tancred had recently seized the throne after the death of King William II of Sicily, who had been husband to King Richard's sister, Joanna. Currently, Tancred held Joanna prisoner. Richard demanded that she be released, along with the full sum of her dowry. At first, Tancred resisted, but Richard quickly overwhelmed Tancred's forces, and Joanna was rescued. 
From then on, Joanna would be one of Richard's companions during the crusade. Unlike his other siblings, Richard was close to Joanna, and the two seemed to have had similar personalities, sharing a love of music, poetry, and horses. The Lionheart added the wealth of his sister's dowry to his well-funded war chest. At the end of March 1191, Philip sailed on to the Holy Land, but Richard remained to meet his mother, Eleanor, who arrived in Sicily with the daughter of the King of Navarre, Baranguela. This Spanish princess was to be the Lionheart's bride, and Richard greeted her with much fanfare. Richard himself sailed with his fleet for the Holy Land on April 10. However, Richard's passage was hindered by a major storm. Several ships were blown off course and wrecked on the coast of the island of Cyprus. Cyprus, famed for its vineyards and cedars, had long been a possession of the Byzantine Empire. But five years prior, Isaac Ducas Comnenus, a rogue member of the imperial family, had arrived and taken control of the island, declaring himself to be the legitimate emperor of Byzantium. To maintain his rule in defiance of the emperor in Constantinople, Isaac struck an alliance with Saladin. When he learned of the misfortune of some of the Lionheart's ships, Isaac at once dispatched men to loot the wreckage and capture the survivors. However, one ship in particular interested Isaac, the royal ship carrying Richard's sister and his bride-to-be. This vessel had not been wrecked, but had been blown off course like some of the others, and on April 24 dropped anchor off the southern coast of Cyprus near Limassol. Isaac knew that if he could acquire the king's sister and his fiancée, he would have a powerful tool by which to control the Lionheart. At once he dispatched messengers to the anchored ship, asking the ladies to disembark and come ashore as his honored guests. Joanna and Baranguela weren't fooled and flatly refused. On May 5th, Richard arrived, relieved to find Baranguela and Joanna safe. However, when he learned that Isaac had imprisoned some of his men, he was furious. He had once dispatched a messenger to the so-called emperor, demanding the release of his men and the restoration of the plunder. Isaac refused. He bolstered the defenses of Limassol, assembled his army, and prepared for war. Richard now launched an invasion of Cyprus, which is remembered as one of the most remarkable operations of the Middle Ages. Isaac stripped Limassol of everything that could be moved, doors, furniture, benches, chests, stone, anything that could be used to fortify the beach. Isaac then arranged his army in a defensive position behind these makeshift defenses. Richard and his men were undeterred. Rowing ashore in small boats, the Lionheart and his forces leapt onto the beach. Isaac's archers loosed a volley of arrows, while Richard personally led the charge at the enemy troops. Faced with the Lionheart's fury, Isaac's men broke and fled. Richard entered Lemassol, where his men found an abundance of wine, meat, and grain. Isaac retreated, pitching camp about five miles from the city. He declared his intention to give battle the next day, and then settled in for a night's sleep. Meanwhile, Richard unloaded his horses and had them exercised by moonlight while his scouts surveyed Isaac's position. On waking the next morning, Isaac found his camp totally surrounded. Richard launched the attack, and Isaac's forces were crushed, with Isaac himself barely escaping, still dressed in his night clothes. Richard seized his enemy's standard, treasure, and horses. This victory prompted many local aristocrats to offer their submission to the Lionheart. On May 11, his support dwindling, Isaac sued for peace. That same day, Richard received a visit from two prominent commanders of the Siege of Acre, Geoffrey and Guy of Lusignan. As Duke of Aquitaine, Richard was obligated to the Lusignans, who were his vassals. Thus, Richard offered his support when the brothers requested his endorsement of Guy's claim to Jerusalem's crown. The Lusignans remained with Richard's party for an important event the following day. On May 12, in Limassol's Chapel of St. George, Richard married the Princess Baranguela. The Crusaders cheered their valiant young king and his lovely Spanish bride, who at this stage in their marriage appeared to be quite blissful. The Norman bishop, John of Evro, crowned Baranguela Queen of England. It was a fitting moment to crown the triumph of the capture of Limassol. Soon after, Isaac presented himself before Richard to confirm the peace. 
But Richard knew through his spies that this was a ruse. The would-be emperor was only stalling for time and weighing the Lionheart's plans. After lunch, Isaac snuck out of camp. Richard only smiled when he received the news. He now had his excuse to complete the conquest of Cyprus. Richard gave part of his army to Guy of Lusignan and ordered him to pursue Isaac. The king divided the rest of his forces into two naval squadrons, which circled the island, seizing coastal fortresses and enemy ships. Having completed this circuit, Richard returned with his troops to Limassol. Here, he rendezvoused with Guy, who hadn't captured Isaac, but had secured the loyalty of more of the island's landowners. Isaac now retreated with the remainder of his troops to the northern castles high in the mountains, Bufavento, Cantara, and St. Hilarion. Here, Isaac hoped to wait Richard out. Eventually, reasoned Isaac, the Lionheart must continue on to the Holy Land, and when he did, Isaac could sweep back down from the mountains and regain control of all of Cyprus. It was a far-fetched plan at best. However, when news reached Isaac that Richard had taken the coastal castle of Carinia, along with Isaac's own daughter, the pseudo-emperor lost all will to resist. He surrendered completely, requesting only that he not be imprisoned in iron shackles. Richard accepted these terms and had special silver shackles made for his defeated opponent. Isaac's daughter was placed in the custody of Queen Berenguela and the Lady Joanna. By June 1st, the whole of Cyprus belonged to Richard the Lionheart. Richard's conquest of Cyprus is sometimes viewed as a distracting prelude to the main action, but in fact, it was one of the most important achievements of the Third Crusade. Cyprus was a wealthy island and strategically positioned just off the coast of Syria-Palestine. Possession of this island provided a valuable source of provisions as well as the perfect staging ground for future crusades. In the immediate aftermath of his victory, Richard used Cyprus to provide food, supplies, and horses to the crusaders besieging Acre. Cyprus would serve a similar function for the remaining history of the Crusades and would be a possession of Latin Christendom for the next four centuries. The Cyprus campaign is also a remarkable example of Richard's brilliance as a general. The mountainous terrain made Cyprus difficult to fully subdue, but as John Gillingham points out, the operation was finally conceived and methodically carried out. Having secured a critical supply base for the crusade, Richard now set off to join his fellow Christian warriors at the Siege of Acre. By the time the fleet of Richard the Lionheart arrived at Acre on June 8, 1191, a crusader army had been battling Saladin for control of the city for nearly two years. The crusaders were positioned in their fortified camp before Acre's walls, while Saladin sat behind them with his enormous army besieging the besiegers. The situation had devolved into a virtual stalemate with the crusaders unable to overwhelm the city and Saladin unable to dislodge the crusaders. But in the summer of 1191, King Richard Plantagenet greatly improved the situation of the crusaders. First, he conquered the nearby island of Cyprus from one of Saladin's allies. Cyprus now provided the Crusaders before Acre with an abundance of food and supplies. Then, Richard brought his own fleet to the Siege of Acre. Richard's first act was to destroy one of Saladin's supply ships as it attempted to bring provisions to Acre's Muslim garrison. As he disembarked, Richard was greeted by King Philip II of France and the overjoyed Crusader army. Finally. After two years of struggle, the Crusaders felt confident that King Richard and his army would bring them victory. The celebration lasted into the night, with the Christians singing around bonfires. Meanwhile, the Muslims of Saladin's army and inside of Acre looked with dread on the many ships and troops brought by the Lionheart. However, both Richard and King Philip soon fell ill. This dampened the spirits of the Christians somewhat, but as King Richard improved, he had himself carried out before the walls on a litter, so that he might use his crossbow to launch arrows at the defenders, even as he continued to recover. Catapults and trebuchets belonging to Richard, Philip, the Templars, and the Hospitallers continued to bombard Acre. Meanwhile, Richard's fleet so fully blockaded the harbor that Saladin could no longer send supplies to his men within the city. The Muslims within Acre were starving and increasingly desperate. On July 4, Saladin made one final attempt to overwhelm the Christian camp with his army. 
but the Christians held firm behind their ditches, and Saladin's attack failed. At this point, the surrender of Acre seemed all but inevitable. On July 12, the besiegers and the besieged at last agreed to terms of surrender. The garrison handed themselves over to the Christians, with the agreement that they would be freed in exchange for 200,000 dinars, 1,500 Christian prisoners, and the relic of the True Cross. With King Richard and King Philip marching at their head, the Christians entered Acre and raised their standards over the city. The Muslim garrison was placed in the city's dungeons to await their sultan's ransom. The siege of Acre was over. The Christians had regained one of the most important cities in Palestine. This was a huge reverse for Saladin after several years of nearly unbroken victories. Once again, Acre was a Christian city. The Crusaders immediately reconsecrated the churches and Richard and Philip began restoring the city's walls and towers. They also turned to the prickly issue of the succession of the crown of the Kingdom of Jerusalem. Both claimants, Guy of Lusignan and Conrad of Montferrat, formally submitted their arguments to the judgment of King Richard and King Philip. After consulting with the Templars, Hospitallers, and the local barons, the two kings reached a compromise. Guy would remain king until his death, at which point Conrad and Isabella, or their heirs, would gain the crown. Both would share the royal revenues. The decision didn't fully satisfy Guy or Conrad, but it satisfied the Crusaders, who were eager to be done with this distraction and continue on with their efforts to defeat Saladin. But this concord was endangered on July 29, when King Philip announced that he would abandon the Crusade and return to France. Future French chroniclers would criticize Philip for abandoning his solemn duty as a Christian ruler. In truth, Philip had never wanted to crusade. He was far more interested in getting back to the West, where he could plot to seize territory belonging to Richard. Philip was reluctant to deal with Richard face to face, but with the King of England far away on crusade, Philip had the chance to sow discord at home. Richard had no delusions about the ugly reality of Philip's character, and so the Lionheart asked the King of France to swear solemnly on holy relics that he would not attack Plantagenet lands. But why expect Philip to honor that oath when he was already breaking his crusader's vow? When Philip departed, Richard also sent back one of his chief military captains, Mercadier, with instructions to guard against Philip's attacks. Philip's departure was devastating for the French army, most of which remained in the Holy Land. Richard provided funds to maintain them. Leadership of the crusade now fell solely on Richard's shoulders, a task for which he was certainly suited. He dispatched envoys to Saladin, asking that the terms of surrender of Acre be fulfilled. Saladin responded that he certainly would, but asked that he be allowed to deliver the payments and prisoners in installments. Richard agreed to this at once. Both sides agreed to a schedule of payments in which Saladin would deliver the ransom gradually, while both sides would exchange their prisoners. However, as each deadline came and went, a pattern began to emerge. Saladin refused to keep his end of the bargain. At each assigned date, Saladin offered excuses as to why he could not deliver a payment or release prisoners. Richard agreed to extend the deadlines, but it became clear that the Sultan was toying with the Crusader King and trying to undermine his authority. Above all, Saladin wanted to keep Richard bogged down in Acre, endlessly negotiating over these prisoners, while the Christian army disintegrated. Even Saladin's own chroniclers admit this. Whereas Richard, famously, was obsessed with the well-being of his own men, on this occasion Saladin was perfectly content to gamble with the lives of his most valiant soldiers, the men who had defended Acre. These men provided the Sultan with a means of stalling his enemy, and that mattered more to Saladin than obtaining their freedom. Richard quickly recognized Saladin's game. He knew that the Sultan was toying with him and trying to both break the momentum of the Crusade as well as make Richard appear ineffective. After one more broken deadline and litany of excuses from the Sultan's envoys, Richard marched his prisoners out before Saladin's encampment and executed them in full view of the Muslim army. In effect, Richard had called Saladin's bluff and the results would prove disastrous for the Sultan. Many emirs and leading men in the Muslim forces were enraged that Saladin had failed to ransom the brave defenders of Acre, and this would create loyalty problems for the Sultan that would persist throughout the Crusade. 
In addition, Salvin would from then on find it very difficult to convince his men to garrison castles and cities, since they now feared the fate of Acre's garrison. Ultimately, Richard had given Saladin ample opportunity to secure the lives of his men. This was more than could be said for Saladin, who had ruthlessly executed Templars and Hospitallers taken prisoner after the Battle of Hattin, giving them no opportunity to be ransomed. By repeatedly reneging on the terms of the agreement, Saladin intentionally placed Richard in a very difficult situation. Richard had no ability to permanently house these prisoners, nor could he allow the Sultan's flagrant violations of the terms go unanswered. It was a hard and bloody decision made in the midst of a hard and bloody war, and ultimately, Saladin himself should be criticized for abandoning the courageous Acre garrison to such a cruel fate. Compared to Richard, who often risked his own life leading rescue missions when his own men were captured, we can only wonder at Saladin's calloused and ungrateful attitude toward his bravest soldiers. Saladin tried to use the massacre as a propaganda win, executing many Christian prisoners of his own in dramatic public spectacles, but ultimately, considerable numbers of his own followers continued to blame him for the needless deaths of their comrades. Saladin would never overcome this bitterness that now infected his ranks. With the recapture of Acre, the Third Crusade achieved a critical success. Acre had served Saladin as one of his key garrisons and arms depots. With Acre as a base, Richard the Lionheart was determined to further his conquests. After consulting with the Knights Templar and the Knights Hospitaller, the king decided to march his army south along the Palestinian coast, reoccupying the forts and towns along the way. Richard's goal at this point was Jaffa, the port city closest to Jerusalem, and another crucial regional stronghold. As Richard marched out of Acre, Saladin gathered his forces, determined to halt the Lionheart's advance. Richard's route along the coast provided several advantages. Using his fleet, Richard could supply his army throughout the march. Also, the sea itself protected the army's right flank and reduced the advantage of Saladin's numbers, since the Muslims could only attack the Christians from the left. On August 22, the Christians began the grueling march. The weather was hot, the terrain treacherous. Saladin's Turkish horse archers harassed the Christian column with sudden bursts of arrows, wounding or killing horses as well as men. But Richard maintained strict discipline. The army's formation was impeccable and advanced down the coast intact, despite harassment from Saladin's forces. Finally, on the morning of September 7, the Christian army emerged from a wooded region north of Arsuf. Richard knew that Saladin would likely try to force a battle, for the Sultan had been summoning forces from across Egypt and Syria. At dawn, the Christians drew toward Arsuf, arranged in twelve squadrons, with the Templars leading the vanguard and the Hospitallers holding the rearguard. In total, Richard had about 10,000 infantry and around 1,200 heavy cavalry for a total of roughly 11 to 12,000 men. Saladin's army numbered at least twice that amount at around 25,000. As the Crusaders emerged from the woods, Saladin launched part of his army in attack while keeping some forces in reserve. Saladin's chronicler and biographer, Ibn Shaddad, says, The enemy were tightly beset, and the fighting was fierce and blazed into flame on both sides. The enemy quickened their march in the hope of reaching the site where they could camp. Their situation became serious, and the noose about them tightened, while the Sultan was moving between the left wing and the right wing, urging the men on in the holy war. The Gesta Regis Ricardi, an eyewitness account of the Third Crusade from Richard's camp, records how essential those valiant crossbowmen and archers were that day. Those absolutely inflexible men-at-arms who brought up the rear of the army drove back the relentless Turks as best they could with a continuous volley of shots. Richard had arranged his infantry, including his archers, so that they marched alongside the cavalry, protecting the horses from enemy arrows. Nevertheless, the Gesta author says that the Christians were so hemmed in by Saladin's attacks that they could see nothing but the sky and the enemy. Some crossbowmen walked backward as the Christians advanced so that they could maintain the marching order while holding back the Turks. 
The effectiveness of the Crusaders' marching order caused the Muslims to attack at closer and closer range. Now, the Turks weren't just using their bows, but taking out their lances for more direct attacks. In the rearguard, the Hospitallers were particularly hard-pressed by these attacks. The Hospitallers requested permission to give charge, but the king refused. In fact, the increasing boldness of the Saracen attacks played into Richard's plan. The Lionheart hoped to force Saladin to fully commit his army to close quarter fighting so that the Christians could launch a decisive charge that would shatter the Saracen ranks. As Saladin pressed the attack, Richard's column continued to advance. This prompted bolder and bolder attacks from the Muslims. The chronicler Ibn al-Athir says that many Saracen troops had by now taken a position close to the action, and the Gesta says that the Christians noticed that many of the Turkish cavalrymen had now dismounted in an effort to shoot their arrows more accurately. It was at this moment that the Crusaders finally gave charge. Ibn Shaddad describes his experience of this event with riveting detail. Then their cavalry massed together and agreed on a charge. I saw them grouped together in the middle of the foot soldiers. They took their lances and gave a shout as one man. The infantry opened gaps for them and they charged in unison along their whole line. Our men gave way before them. It happened that I was in the center, which took to wholesale flight. My intention was to join the left wing since it was nearer to me. I reached it after it had been broken utterly, so I thought to join the right wing, but then I saw that it had fled more calamitously than all the rest. Ibn Shaddad fled to where Saladin was positioned with his bodyguard. He writes, The Sultan stood among them while men were fleeing on all sides, but he was commanding the drummers to beat their drums without stopping. He ordered the men to rally to him, but they were all fleeing around him. The Muslims were in a complete rout. Ibn Shaddad tells us that the Christians charged in a total of three different waves. These charges were coordinated using signals from Richard's trumpeters. In the initial charge, the Muslims suffered serious casualties, and with each additional charge, Saladin's army was further devastated. The Christian infantry moved up behind the knights, finishing off wounded or fleeing enemy troops. King Richard personally took part in the fighting, charging at the forefront of his cavalry. The Gesta Regis Ricardi dramatically recounts the king's conduct. King Richard pursued the Turks with singular ferocity, fell upon them and scattered them across the ground. No one escaped when his sword made contact with them. Wherever he went, his brandished sword cleared a wide path on all sides. Continuing his advance with untiring sword strokes, he cut down the enemy as if he were reaping the harvest with a sickle, so that the corpses of Saracens he had killed covered the ground everywhere. Saladin's nephew, Taki al-Din, rallied some of the Muslims in an attempt to reverse the situation, but when Richard led his third and final charge, the Crusaders devastated Taki al-Din's cavalry. At this point, the victory was sealed. Richard and his knights had defeated Saladin's army. The Crusaders were triumphant. Saladin himself retreated with his bodyguard into the wooded hills, where the survivors of his army rallied. Meanwhile, the victorious Christians occupied Arsuf. The Battle of Arsuf was a critical moment in the Third Crusade. Saladin endured horrible casualties, with around half of his army being slain. However, his army was not fully destroyed, and he was able to rally the survivors, which numbered around half his original force, at a safe point in the hills. Here, Ibn Shaddad tells us that Saladin was inconsolable after his defeat, refusing to eat or even speak much to anyone. Christian casualties were light, but the army was particularly moved by the loss of James of Avena, a knight well-loved by his comrades who had shown much bravery during the battle. The Templars and the Hospitallers searched the battlefield, and when they found James's body, they carried it carefully to Arsuf. Here, the fallen knight was buried, with Richard himself assisting in the funerary rites. The battle secured Christian control of the coastal plain and allowed the Crusaders to go on to occupy the port city of Jaffa. From here to Acre, Richard now ruled a considerable chunk of Palestine. What did you see? I want to hear it again before... 
Richard the Lionheart's victory at Arsuf was a devastating defeat for Saladin and allowed the Crusaders to occupy the key port city of Jaffa. Saladin retreated farther south to Ashkelon, while the Christian army began restoring Jaffa's fortifications, which had been demolished previously by the Saracens. The Crusader leadership met in council to discuss their next move. The French, led by Duke Hugh of Burgundy, favored a direct attack on Jerusalem. But Richard would not support this option. Jerusalem lay far inland, and the supply route from Jaffa to the Holy City would be stretched thin. Rather, Richard wanted to drive south and attack Ashkelon, the gateway to Saladin's power base in Egypt. If the Crusaders controlled Ashkelon, they could harass the Sultan's supply routes from Cairo and render Jerusalem less defensible. The debate was intense, but the popular mood among the soldiers was oriented toward the immediate capture of Jerusalem. Richard had to relent, but reluctantly. In October of 1191, Richard began leading the Crusaders in moves toward Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the Lionheart engaged in diplomatic talks with Saladin's brother and second-in-command, Al-Adil. Richard knew that the Muslim army was increasingly demoralized, and he hoped to strike a deal with Saladin that would restore the bulk of the old Crusader kingdom. Saladin, for his part, was eager to get rid of Richard and hoped through diplomacy to convince the Christian warrior king to depart for home. During these talks, Al-Adil even suggested a marriage alliance, proposing that he himself marry Richard's sister, Joanna. Richard said he might consider this if Al-Adil would convert to Christianity. Al-Adil would not agree to this, and there's not much indication that either Richard or Saladin really took the whole scenario seriously, but rather it was all part of the diplomatic dance in which both parties probed and tested one another. Nevertheless, over the course of these meetings, there is indication that Richard and the Sultan's brother, Al-Adil, who the Christians called Safadin, gained a certain respect for one another. Meanwhile, Saladin engaged in separate diplomatic talks with Conrad of Montferrat. Conrad feared Richard's overwhelming influence, but when Saladin tried to convince Conrad to openly break with and even attack the Lionheart, Conrad flatly refused, knowing well his own supporters would abandon him should he ever engage in such treachery. Richard's advance toward Jerusalem was extremely slow and cautious. The Lionheart insisted on occupying and rebuilding all the fortresses in the area to secure the supply route between Jaffa and Jerusalem. By January of 1192, the Crusaders occupied Beit Nuba, just 12 miles from the Holy City. It was the height of winter and torrential storms made the roads virtually impassable. Although many in the army wanted to attack Jerusalem, Richard was still skeptical about the logistics of the situation. He called a council, during which the Templars, Hospitallers, and local barons argued that Saladin was too well positioned in Jerusalem, and a siege during such conditions would inevitably fail. Rather, they argued the army should advance instead on Ashkelon and fortify this crucial city. Richard supported this verdict, coming from the men most experienced with warfare in the region. Although the Duke of Burgundy disagreed strongly, Richard's position won out. Burgundy and the French refused to go to Ashkelon and instead returned to Acre. Meanwhile, Richard drove on to Ashkelon, joined by the military orders and his nephew Henry, Count of Champagne. On January 20, the Crusaders began rebuilding Ashkelon's walls, which had also been destroyed by Saladin. By April, Ashkelon was restored, and the King of England was making regular raids against Saladin's supply convoys. Richard's plan had proved quite wise, as Crusader control of Ashkelon turned out to be a major problem for the Sultan, who could no longer safely move caravans from Cairo to Palestine. Meanwhile, Richard ruled an extensive network of cities and castles, stretching all along the Palestinian coast. However, that same month, Richard received word from his own kingdom that his brother John had formed an alliance with King Philip of France and deposed Richard's Lord Chancellor, William Longchamp. This news greatly troubled the Lionheart. He realized that if he continued with the crusade, he could lose his very kingdom to the predations of his cowardly brother John and the treacherous king of France. Indeed, as it turned out, the whole enterprise of the crusade 
was threatened by the greed, impiety, and wickedness of Philip II of France. Reluctantly, King Richard announced that he would return at once to his Angevin lands. However, to promote unity among the Christians in the Holy Land, he endorsed Conrad of Montferrat for the crown of Jerusalem. The magnates of the Crusader kingdom ratified Conrad as king. Montferrat was elated, but his triumph was short-lived. On April 28, 1192, Conrad was stabbed to death in the streets by two members of the assassin cult. The Duke of Burgundy claimed Richard had hired the assassins, but this was false. The assassins, led by the mysterious Old Man of the Mountain, never hired out their work, and they had a personal grudge against Conrad. Recently, Conrad had seized a ship belonging to the Old Man of the Mountain and refused to return it. Meanwhile, Saladin himself had offered the assassins a large sum of money if only they would murder either Conrad or Richard. With Conrad dead, the English, French, and local crusaders at once set about filling the yet again vacant throne of Jerusalem. The local barons wanted someone who would please both Richard and the French. The solution was Henry of Champagne, nephew to both Richard and Philip, and a man who had proven himself as a commander since the early days of the Siege of Acre. Richard the Lionheart and the Duke of Burgundy both offered their endorsement, and the High Court elected Henry. Conrad's widow, Queen Isabella, was married to Henry at once. Henry then took up leadership of the recovering Crusader Kingdom. At last, unity prevailed among the Crusaders. Richard turned Ashkelon over to Henry, and Henry put the forces loyal to Conrad at the disposal of the Lionheart. Richard's hope was that Henry and the remaining Crusaders would defend what had been won so far and wait for Richard while he returned to secure his own Angevin Empire. Then, as Richard planned it, a Grand Crusade would be launched against Egypt to eliminate Saladin's power center forever and thus allow the Christians to once again control Jerusalem. But the other lords in the army resisted this. Once again, led by Hugh of Burgundy, they instead insisted that they would now at last lay siege to Jerusalem, whether Richard joined them or not. This placed Richard in a very difficult situation. For him, an attack on Jerusalem now, with Saladin still in control of Egypt, was suicide. If the Lionheart departed for home, Burgundy and the others would squander all that he'd restored, losing the Christian army in another Hattin before Jerusalem, which would allow Saladin to reconquer everything that Richard had so far won on the coast. Unwilling to allow this to happen, Richard declared that he would remain in the Holy Land until Easter of 1193, the army was elated. They still hoped to press on to Jerusalem, though Richard still wanted to convince them to invade Egypt. When the leaders met in council to discuss their next move, Richard was once again outvoted. Richard insisted that this was folly and in fact refused to lead the campaign, stating that he would not lead the army to its certain destruction. Rather, Richard pledged to march with them as a comrade, not as their commander. The men agreed, and on June 7th, the Crusader army departed Ashkelon for Jerusalem. This time at the height of summer, storms were not a problem. The army arrived in four days at Beit Nuba. At Jerusalem, Saladin's forces were on high alert. The Sultan himself departed the city for his own safety, but before he did, he wept openly in the Al-Aqsa Mosque during Friday prayers, fearing that once again the Christians would overwhelm the city. Meanwhile, at Beit Nuba, Richard learned from his scouts that Saladin had destroyed all water sources in the area and that Jerusalem was well defended by a large Muslim garrison. Once again, Richard argued before the Council of Leaders that an attack on the Holy City was not feasible. And once again, Hugh of Burgundy and the French lords refused to listen. And once again, the Templars, Hospitallers, and local barons argued in Richard's favor. The situation had not changed Saladin still controlled this region, and his forces could surround and cut off a Christian army moving out against Jerusalem. Richard, in particular, noted the problem of obtaining drinkable water. The army would quickly be suffering from extreme thirst, and this would render the men and horses all the more vulnerable to Saladin's forces. Once more, Richard made the case for an attack on Egypt, and the Templars and Hospitallers agreed that this would be the best course. At last, a final vote was taken. 
and the majority agreed that Richard's observations were undeniably correct. The council voted to abandon the assault on Jerusalem. Inside Jerusalem, the Muslims were elated. Saladin himself offered thanks to Allah, having fully expected to face an attack from the Christians. His scouts reported to him the disagreements between Richard and the French, and the Sultan determined to use this division among his enemies to his advantage. Hugh of Burgundy and the other French crusaders were incalcitrant. They withdrew at once to Acre and Tyre, proclaiming that they would never participate in Richard's Egyptian campaign. Meanwhile, Richard focused on securing Ashkelon and Jaffa, and traveled to Acre to plan his next move. Once again, unity had collapsed among the crusaders, with the French refusing to cooperate, and Richard's force reduced to his own vassals, the Templars, the Hospitallers, and some Pisan and Genoese sailors and crossbowmen. The Third Crusade seemed on the verge of collapsing. In the summer of 1192, the Third Crusade reaches an impasse. In July, King Richard declines to attack Jerusalem, which is held by Saladin. At this point, Richard has retaken much of the Palestinian coast, but Richard's refusal to besiege Jerusalem highlights his dependence on his fleet for support and shows that Saladin is in firm control of the hinterland. By now, the war has gone on for years, and both the Christians and the Muslims long for an end to the hostilities. Richard asks for terms. The Sultan sends his brother, Al-Adil, to ask Richard to demolish Ashkelon, a coastal fortress on the doorstep of Egypt. Richard refuses. He wants the Sultan to acknowledge Christian control of the coast, including Ashkelon. Al-Adil returns to his brother with the report that the English king refuses to demolish even a single stone of Ashkelon. Meanwhile, Richard strengthens Ashkelon's defenses. The war must go on. Toward the end of July, Saladin hears that Richard is at Acre, the chief city of the Crusaders. Richard is planning to besiege Beirut. Saladin decides to counter this move by striking at Richard's southern lands. Jaffa has been newly restored and garrisoned by the Lionheart. Located within striking distance of Jerusalem, Jaffa is an important site. If Saladin can capture it, he will cut Richard's lands in two and threaten the Christian position in Palestine. In the final days of July, Saladin gathers his army and moves toward Jaffa. Meanwhile, at Acre, Richard is with his army preparing to besiege Beirut when he receives word that Saladin is advancing on Jaffa. Quickly, Richard assembles his war council. He instructs his nephew, Henry of Champagne, and the Grand Master of the Knights Templar to assemble the Crusader forces and march down the coast from Acre to Jaffa. Meanwhile, Richard himself, with a small detachment, sets off with his fleet for Jaffa. Richard knows that time is of the essence. He doesn't want to wait for the land army. He wants to get to Jaffa as soon as possible. July 28, Saladin arrives in full strength before the walls of Jaffa. He divides his army, placing the right wing under his son, Al-Zahir, and the left wing under his brother, Al-Adil, while he commands from the center. The Sultan fully besieges the Christian stronghold. Muslim sappers begin working to undermine the walls. Jaffa's defenders are in a difficult situation. Their numbers are few, but the city is well defended with newly built walls and towers. Over the coming days, the fighting is fierce. Saladin's troops manage to collapse part of the curtain wall, but the Christians build a huge fire in the breach, preventing the Muslim troops from crossing over. Ibn Shaddad, Saladin's servant and biographer, writes admirably of the courage of the Christian defenders. He says the Christians left open the gates and stood in formation, fighting in front of the gates. By July 31st, Saladin's forces inflict even more damage on Jaffa's walls. The Christians send the knight Abre de Rons and Bishop Randolph of Bethlehem as emissaries to the Sultan. Saladin grants terms. He will allow the Christians to ransom their lives if they'll relinquish Jaffa. The Christian garrison withdraws to the citadel to await the Sultan's agents, while Muslim troops enter the town and put it to sack. 
By morning, Saladin's camp is abuzz with rumor that King Richard is on his way with a fleet. The Sultan is eager to get the Christians out of the citadel. He sends Ibn Shaddad and his son Al-Zahir to collect ransoms from the garrison and remove them from the citadel. Meanwhile, Saladin is confident that his troops on the shore can prevent the Lionheart from making a landing. On the morning of August 1st, Richard's first ships begin to appear off the coast, announcing their arrival with the braying of trumpets. Ibn Shaddad approaches the citadel and demands that the garrison evacuate. The Christians agree. 47 horsemen emerge. Ibn Shaddad collects ransoms from each of them, documents their belongings, and sends them on their way. However, at this point, the defenders realize that Christian ships have appeared on the sea, and they decide to hold out. Ibn Shaddad says that he watched as the garrison troops climbed up onto the walls with their shields. Seeing this, Ibn Shaddad realizes that the situation has changed dramatically. He turns to one of his comrades and says, Take care, the enemy have changed their minds. In the next moment, Frankish horsemen emerge from the citadel and charge through the Muslim troops standing outside. Ibn Shaddad's first-hand account of these events is quite gripping. Meanwhile, Richard the Lionheart's fleet approaches the shore of Jaffa. At first, the king and his companions are distraught, for Saladin's flags are flying over the city. It's a devastating sight. They're too late. Jaffa has already fallen. However, the king and his men are amazed when they catch sight of a man swimming desperately through the waves toward the ships. Richard's knights help bring the man aboard. It's a priest, and he has risked his life to deliver a message to the king. Sire, says the priest, the town has fallen, but the Christians hold out in the citadel. Please, go to their aid now before it's too late. When Richard hears this, he grabs his Danish axe, raises it high, and shouts, By God's calves, Saladin will never take the Christians. With a small force of knights and archers, Richard jumps into the surf and rushes onto the shore. Ibn Shaddad personally witnessed this stunning amphibious assault and describes it in his biography of Saladin. The King of England hastened to gain the shore. The first galley to deliver its men on land was his. He was red-haired, his tunic was red, and his banner was red, as was his device. In only a short time, all the men from the galleys had disembarked in the harbor. All this went on before my eyes. They then charged the Muslims, who withdrew before them and were cleared out of the harbor. I was on horseback, so I galloped as far as the Sultan and gave him the news. The two envoys were with him, and he had just taken his pen in his hand to write their guarantee of safe conduct. I whispered in his ear what had happened, so he stopped writing and kept them busy in conversation. Hardly a moment later, the Muslims came fleeing toward the Sultan, who shouted to those about him, and all mounted their horses. He seized the envoys and ordered the baggage train and the camp to move back to Yazur. This is a truly remarkable moment in military history. Richard the Lionheart, accompanied by a small force, hurls back Saladin's army from the shores of Jaffa. The king himself is at the forefront, wielding his axe against enemy troops. Having secured the shore, the crusaders now enter Jaffa itself. Richard is the first to set foot in the city, charging up a spiral stairway through a Templar house. With his knights, the king storms through the narrow streets, battling hand to hand with enemy troops. Soon, the town is cleared of Muslim forces. Richard's men mount the walls, throwing down Saladin's banners and raising up the standard of the Lionheart. Euphoric, the Christians emerge from the citadel to cheer their king. The Lionheart has triumphed. Jaffa is saved. Richard occupies the position Saladin had held, while the Sultan himself beats a hasty retreat. Saladin had all but reduced Jaffa, only to have Richard arrive and totally reverse the situation. The riveting accounts from the primary sources make these events all the more alive to us. It is fascinating that the most powerful and vivid account of these events comes from Saladin's own chronicler, Ibn Shaddad, 
who personally watched the Lionheart in action. Richard now has his men break up pieces of his ships to create a wooden fortification before Jaffa. Meanwhile, Saladin withdraws to Ramla. Having secured Jaffa, Richard dispatches a messenger to Saladin, asking him to send envoys. Saladin sends his brother Al-Adil's chamberlain, Abu Bakr, and several Mamluks to meet with King Richard. Already, Richard knows Abu Bakr and his companions well from past meetings with Al-Adil. Indeed, Richard is on friendly terms with this group of Muslim warriors. Ibn Shaddad describes their meeting. King Richard had made friends with several of the elite Mamluks and had knighted some of them. He was on very good terms with them as they met with him on numerous occasions. When the group mentioned came before him, he was both serious and lighthearted. He said, This Sultan of yours is a great man. Islam has no mightier prince on earth than him. How is it he departed merely because I had arrived? By God, I had not even put on my hauberk and was not ready for anything. On my feet I wore only sea boots. Why did he withdraw? Here, Ibn Shaddad provides us with a fascinating glimpse into the subtleties of the Lionheart's personality. Richard is a highly capable diplomat. Simultaneously, he compliments Saladin while emphasizing his own capability in battle and the extent of his victory at Jaffa. All this is to encourage the Sultan to come to terms. It's also fascinating that a great crusader king could strike up a certain friendship with Abu Bakr and other emirs and Mamluks. Before Abu Bakr departs, Richard asks him to greet the Sultan for him and to urge the Sultan to come to a peace. Meanwhile, at Ramla, the Sultan learns that Henry of Champagne and the Templars are moving south from Acre to reinforce the Lionheart. Saladin decides that he might still turn defeat into victory. Jaffa is damaged, and Richard holds it with only a small force. If the Muslims attack quickly, they might overwhelm the king before the main Christian army arrives. On August 3rd, Saladin departs with his army for Jaffa. But King Richard is preparing for this. The Lionheart organizes his small force to hold the city. The Gesta Regis Ricardi, written by one of Richard's followers, describes the king's formation. Amid wooden palisades, Richard arranges the infantry in a shield wall. Each man holds a long spear aimed forward with the blunt end planted in the ground. Between each of these spearmen, Richard places a crossbowman. Each crossbowman is assigned two crossbows and an assistant to help him load one bow while he himself shoots the other bow. Meanwhile, the king himself leads a small cavalry force containing so few men that the Gesta names each of them individually. Incredibly, Richard is about to fight this battle with between 10 and 20 mounted knights. This is confirmed by Ibn Shaddad. Saladin approaches Jaffa with a force of around 10,000 men. When he realizes that Richard's force is so small, he's exhilarated. Finally, the moment has come when he will crush the Lionheart. The Sultan has a fully equipped army, and Richard has less than 2,000 men with less than 20 horses. The position of the Christian seems impossible. Immediately, Saladin launches the attack. However, as the Turkish horse archers rush at Richard's formation, the Christians hold firm. The Sultan's initial attacks are repulsed. Again, Ibn Shaddad's description is powerful. The enemy stood firm and did not move from their positions. Like dogs of war, they snarled, willing to fight to the death. Our troops were frightened of them, dumbfounded by their steadfastness. The number of their cavalry was estimated at most as 17, and at the least as 9, and their foot was less than 1,000. Some said 300, and others more than that. The Sultan was greatly annoyed at this, and personally went around the divisions, urging them to attack, and promising them good rewards if they would. As the battle progresses, it becomes clear that Richard has made good use of his limited resources. Repeated attacks from the Turkish cavalry fail, and indeed, the Christian crossbowmen are picking off Saladin's riders with every charge. Soon, Saladin's troops fall back and refuse to obey the Sultan's orders to attack. 
This infuriates Saladin, who is horrified to see his army failing before such a small force. The Sultan rides up and down his ranks, demanding that his men fight, but they refuse. At this point, King Richard decides to attack. Leading his 10 or 20 horsemen, he charges the Sultan's lines. This is one of the Lionheart's finest moments. Despite being terribly outnumbered, Richard and his knights inflict serious damage on Saladin's army. The Gesta Regis Ricardi provides a vivid account of the action. The king and his men realized that the Saracens were not going to do anything else. When they were unable to bear this half-hearted and evasive strategy any longer, the king and those who had horses put spur to horse and with lances couched, charged powerfully into the thick of the enemy, throwing them down to the right and the left, emptying saddles of their riders and transfixing some of them. Richard's decision to charge is no accident. He recognizes the collapsing morale of Saladin's army and understands that the Sultan likely won't be able to counter a cavalry attack from the Christians, however small it may be. The King's charge further demoralizes the Muslim host. When it's all over, Richard does something to further expose Saladin's inability to control his own forces. Ibn Shaddad describes it. The King of England took his lance that day and galloped from the far right wing to the far left and nobody challenged him. The Sultan was enraged, turned his back on the fighting, and withdrew to Yazur. At this point, Saladin realizes the extent of his defeat. He calls for a retreat, and the Muslim army withdraws. Once again, Richard the Lionheart has won a great victory over Saladin. Indeed, one of the most remarkable victories in military history. Fortunately, the battle was carefully recorded by the chroniclers in both camps, who repeatedly confirm one another's details. We are fortunate that such a fascinating episode was so well documented. The Battle of Jaffa destroys Saladin's plan to dislodge King Richard from the coast. Jaffa is saved for the Crusaders. For Richard, this is a crucial victory. Had Saladin succeeded, the very position of the Christian domain in Syria-Palestine would have been threatened. The Crusader victory at Jaffa secured far more than Richard the Lionheart's status as a legendary warrior. It confirmed the strategic reality of the situation in Palestine. Richard could not take Jerusalem, but Saladin could not take Jaffa, nor dislodge the Crusaders from the southern coast. Historian Christopher Tyreman points out that Saladin's failure at Jaffa inflicted deep psychological and military blows on the Saracens. Given the situation, both sides recognize that they must negotiate some sort of truce. After the battle, Richard fell ill again. He also received unsettling news from back home. Philip II, King of France, was now actively attacking Angevin lands. Like Saladin, Richard was also ready to come to terms. He dispatched Balian of Ibelin to act as his chief diplomat in the negotiations with Saladin. On September 2nd, 1192, the two sides concluded a formal three-year truce. Saladin agreed to acknowledge most of Richard's conquests, recognizing that the Crusaders would hold the coast from Tyre to Acre to Jaffa, including towns and castles such as Caesarea and Arsuf. Richard agreed at last to demolish Ashkelon, which would be held by neither side. Saladin also agreed to give Christian pilgrims free access to Jerusalem, protected by his own men. Tripoli and Antioch were included in the truce as well. The truce concluded. Many crusaders took the opportunity to complete their pilgrimage by visiting Jerusalem, where some of them were entertained by Saladin himself. Richard, however, was not among them, refusing to ever enter Jerusalem as anything but its conqueror. On October 9, 1192, Richard, by now recovered from his illness, boarded a ship and set out for home with his fleet. The Third Crusade was over, though the Lionheart swore to return and build upon the success he'd already achieved. He intended to come back with a new crusade to finally take Jerusalem. Discussions of the Third Crusade and our pop culture often seem to conclude that the expedition was a failure because it did not recapture Jerusalem. And yet, Historians frequently disagree with this assessment. Thomas Madden says 
the Third Crusade was, by almost any measure, a highly successful expedition. Jonathan Riley Smith wrote that the Third Crusade's achievements were outstanding. Andrew Ehrenkritz concludes that the Treaty of Ramla, which ended the Third Crusade, must be regarded as a humiliating concession the Christian invaders imposed on Islam. So which is it? Was the Third Crusade a success or a failure? The Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem was much larger than the city of Jerusalem itself. It included hinterland castles like Karak and Montreal, inland cities like Ramla and Tiberias, and a network of coastal cities like Acre, Caesarea, and Jaffa. After the Battle of Hattin in 1187, Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Damascus, conquered virtually all of this. In response to this devastation of the Crusader Kingdom, Pope Gregory VIII called the Third Crusade. When Richard the Lionheart, the primary leader of the Third Crusade, arrived in Palestine with his army in 1191, he found the Kingdom of Jerusalem, as it existed prior to Saladin's conquests, all but lost. Only the port city of Tyre remained in Christian hands. But Richard began to reverse many of Saladin's important gains. Acre, the wealthiest and largest port city, was reconquered by the Christians. Next, Richard defeated Saladin at the Battle of Arsuf, re-establishing crusader control of much of the coast and allowing the Christians to reoccupy Jaffa, the port city nearest to Jerusalem. At this point, Richard made two military demonstrations toward Jerusalem, though he never actually attempted to recapture the city. Richard's navy allowed him to dominate the coast and keep his army well supplied, but Jerusalem lay far inland where Saladin had the advantage. Therefore, Richard determined that Jerusalem was not a viable military target at this time. The holy city of Jerusalem was the spiritual fixation of the crusade. The fact that Richard was unable to capture it was a disappointment to the Christian world. But does this mean that the Third Crusade was a failure? In fact, the Third Crusade succeeded in several important ways. As mentioned earlier, Saladin had essentially captured the whole of the kingdom, but Richard's conquests re-established Crusader control of some of the most important territory in Palestine. Saladin attempted to reverse this situation, besieging Jaffa in 1192. But Richard repulsed this attack, defeating Saladin soundly at the Battle of Jaffa. Prior to the Third Crusade, Saladin had been poised to exterminate the Crusader presence in Palestine. But by the end of the Third Crusade, he was forced to recognize Richard's conquests in the Treaty of Ramla. Saladin's servant and biographer, Baha Din, tells us that Saladin was very unhappy about this treaty. Our enemy will grow strong now that they have retained these lands, the Sultan lamented. We can see then how the Third Crusade was a reverse for Saladin since he lost control of the economically important Palestinian coast. And although the Third Crusade did not regain Jerusalem, it did regain Acre, Jaffa, and other coastal cities. So overall, it was a net positive for the Christians. In addition to the territory he reclaimed from Saladin, Richard also captured the island of Cyprus off the coast of Syria for the Crusaders. Cyprus was both economically and strategically important, and its addition to Crusader territory was one of the most significant achievements of the Third Crusade. We can see then why historians tend to judge the Third Crusade as overall a success for the Christians.